Hey, Rico, you there? Um, one, two, one, two. Uh, I'm up already. Yeah, she made me the host. Morning. Good morning, Rika. I just made you a host, so you should have a whole um, access to a uh, thing. You see okay. it? Your host and I'm co-host right now. Yeah, no, I'm I'm already in. Yeah, I just made you co-host. Are you good to go? Uh, if I'm good to go, Oops. yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm host. Hi, Rika. Where's it?
can confirm or reconnect via WebEx. Thumbs up. Thumbs up. Yeah, thumbs up. Our as recording can start. Okay, thank you. Good morning. I'd like to welcome you all to the 18th Veterans and Community Oversight Engagement Board Federal Advisory Committee meeting. I'm Eugene Skinner, the designated federal officer, and the also designated federal officer, Mr. Chi Hong Tata. Based on the COVID restrictions at the time of the public notification and federal register, the initial approach to conduct this meeting was to employ a hybrid strategy, both virtual and limited in person participation. Since that time, VA GLA 8 death has moved down into the yellow slash medium risk range for COVID which allows for the removal of the physical distancing requirement for meetings. The public members can now access the meeting via WebEx or in-person attendance for the duration. One additional location for public attendees is at the TGRS facility on campus via WebEx. Public comment session will occur today on 19 October from 12.50 p.m. to 1.50 p.m. Pacific. Currently, there are eight individuals selected. In the interest of time, management speakers will be held to a five minute time limit. And if time expires and your name was not selected, or you did not register to provide public comment and would like to do so, you are asked to submit public comment via email at deofaca at dna.gov or include it in the official meeting record. Before I turn the meeting over to the chair, Lieutenant General Hopper, I would like to cover a few local engagements. The package you have consists of agenda and hard copies of tomorrow's briefing. Today's hard copies will be distributed later this morning. To the greatest extent possible, please hold all questions until the presentations are completed. The chair will ask for questions and or comments throughout the meeting. Please turn your name card on your hand to signify to the chair your desire to provide comment or ask a question. Allow the DFO or BCOD chair to yield the floor to you prior to speaking. Please tell our minute takers and identify yourself prior to speaking. Allow the DFO support team to provide a microphone to you prior to speaking as well. The chair will ask for questions and or comments throughout the meeting. One final note, this meeting is being recorded. Now I'd like to turn the meeting over to the BCOD chair, Ten Channel Retired John D. Hopper, to follow me for order. In the pledge of allegiance, sir. Thank you very much, Eugene. And good morning, everyone. Let's go ahead and start with the uh, pledge of allegiance as we normally do. Pledge of allegiance to the law of the United States and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty. Thank you very much and good morning. It's a pleasure to see all here and a special welcome to my trusted colleagues, members of the board. We're glad to be back together again. Uh, I'd also like to welcome the senior DA leadership that's here. You can hear from them uh, later on. We have some special guests as well. I'd also like to welcome members of the public. Uh, that will be here with us uh, today. It's the first time that we've all been together with the public in you know, some time, which leads me to say special thanks to Dr. Bregman and the folks at GLA. Most of us don't realize that uh, although GLA is a, is a nominal host, this is not something that occurs without a great deal of effort, great deal of uh, heavy lifting. Well, a special thanks to GLA. In fact, we have looked for other venues at times. Um, we could not find, frankly, find the venue. We have to turn back to GLA, and that bless them. They've always accommodated us. And here we are again uh, in almost uh, completely open form. And so, uh, GLA, thank you, Dr. Redman. We appreciate that. Our view today ends well. Excellent. 
I look forward to it. Some have described it as a little bit heavy on the services side, which is okay because we're about to turn over that first tranche of buildings and get about the business of getting veterans into those homes and providing them with needed services and support. And so that will be a good part of our trust uh, throughout this meeting. You know, we took our timing a little bit today. Uh, we didn't expect the chief to be here so early. He was going to be out trumping through uh, through the uh, tiny homes, but I think she's going to trump through the tiny homes uh, tomorrow. Uh, we also have some new members, you know, which will be uh, introduced uh, a little bit later when we get to the new member introductions. But that also doesn't uh, give us time or give me just a minute to say a special thank you to uh, Ms. Serrano and to uh, Dan Rosenfeld, two members of the board that are turning out. Uh, by great support, great expertise, uh, Ms. Serrano and her background, and uh, Mr. Rosenfeld, you know, with his background as an urban planner and uh, really uh, one of the experts in developing uh, projects like this. So we will uh, miss them both. Uh, but we have two new members that uh, replaced them as voting members, and we'll introduce them, as I said, just a bit, uh, a bit later. Uh, with an insight on services, uh, we'll get some uh, an excellent briefing. I think uh, on a new dashboard that has been in the works for some time. Uh, some of our committee members have, in fact, uh, been helpful. I think in figuring out what that dashboard should look like. So we look forward to that, and also with uh, a, a sort of detailed uh, review understanding of how service does its magic in. Uh, Placing veterans in the right place at the right time, as far as housing is concerned. Um, I think the last thing that I would add is you know, just uh, along the lines again of recognizing where we work, where we are. And my wife reported to me this morning that the temperature in Alexander, Virginia, where we live, was uh, in the 30s. <laughs> So uh, I, for one, am pleased to be in California, where it's going to be 90 today, if that's, uh, if that's correct. So I'll enjoy that uh, at least for uh, a little bit of time. Uh, now, without further ado, let me, uh, let me introduce you to the Chief of Staff to the Department of Veterans Affairs, Ms. Tanya Brasher, for some opening comments. <laughs> It's great to be here. Um, obviously, um, this is my second life here, so it is just wonderful to see everyone once again and to welcome our new team members. Um, it has definitely been a busy time at VA, um, and part of that is that the Secretary has uh, set a goal across all of VA to have the 38,000 uh, permanent housing of veterans. And so that has actually been really exciting to see because right now we're on track, at least percentage wise. Um, and the surprising piece is that we are seeing business who hadn't necessarily been in the game step up and go beyond um, where we thought they would be. And so next week, I think it's the 20th, but no, it's not the 21st, that's a little bit early. Um, next week, we're bringing in all of the HCO uh, coordinators to come in. And it's the first time since COVID that we're going to have the opportunity to bring everyone up to VA, uh, meet with the secretary. Uh, I get to finally meet everybody and to really look at homeless across. However, you guys set the tone in LA. LA is really because of pure numbers so vital. And so that's kind of the big picture. The other piece that we're very focused on that isn't directly linked to our mission here, but it does, is the PACT Act and Toxic Exposure Bill. So on August 10th, President Biden signed the uh, called the PACT Act. But the bottom line with that means that there are now 23 additional presumptives for those service members who deployed uh, predominantly 9-11, however, it does apply to Gulf four, as well as hypertension for Vietnam veterans. And the reason that's important for this population is that can make the difference 
of them qualifying for benefits and being able um, to up the disability that they receive so that they're able to either be uh, eligible for health care, which of course is one of these other components that's really challenging for a lot of our veterans. But we're also hoping to bring more veterans into the VA pipeline through this um, because we do have veterans out there who we don't touch at all. They may get their GI Bill, they may get a home loan, but they haven't necessarily filed for all of their benefits. So we're we're excited for that. We've had 100,000 claims so far. Um, that's the sweet number from DBA, but we still know we have a lot more to reach because really the impact the catchment area for this is in the millions. The other piece of this is throughput and making sure that if we bring them in, that we can take care of them. So we did get a couple of very important hiring initiatives through the PACT Act. We were able to do um, dual compensation, which means if you have a retiree, we can bring them back and still let them have their full retirement and have them work. We were able to do direct hire for military spouses and disabled veterans, which is a program that we had under COVID, but once the pandemic ends, we lose those hiring authorities. Now we're going to be able to keep them. And the other piece is every two weeks, I'm meeting with Jessica Bonjourney from the uh, VHA with uh, Dr. Andrew Bates from, from VBA and um, from MPA as well, just on what are we doing with NBA to enable our ability to hire faster, to take some of the very cumbersome, I'll say, archaic practices, um, eliminate those so that we're able to bring in folks faster. And so um, it has been a really busy time, but an exciting time. The secretary is so focused on hiring, hiring, hiring. It's, it's really, um, you know, I think for our HR professionals, it's a lot. Because the challenge we have is for a government agency, we actually have three hiring authorities, which is very different. We have Title 38, we have hybrids, and we have Title 5. And that's what makes us so different than like a DOD, per se, or Treasury or Commerce or any of those others. So we're working really hard. Um, but as we've all known, and all of us that have been here, just even getting the, the two buildings open, right, it's full of progress. It, it takes time. Um, but I really think in the next month that we're going to start to see movement in the right direction. But um, those are the current focuses that we are looking at from perspective of all the pay but bottom line is, I am thrilled to be here. I'm thrilled not to be in 30 degree weather. And I look forward to today's meeting and tomorrow's meeting. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much, Chief. Uh, now we'll ask for a few comments from uh, uh, the sponsor, Mr. Berkeley. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the new members. We're really excited to get to know y'all and, and make sure you have uh, everything you need to be successful on uh, this UAE. And it, over the next year, uh, we're going to have a lot of opportunities for to bring on even more new members because of terms and everything. So um, that's our official call to action for everyone to help us recruit, um, you know, passionate uh, leaders, subject matter experts to help us continue to drive on the momentum that General Hopper um, referred to and uh, make sure that we can continue to, to move forward in the same direction together. Uh, as, as Chief Bradshaw mentioned, the PACT Act and the implementation of New benefits and care available to veterans that have been exposed to toxins it has been such a priority. We're going to have some flyers pass out to everybody uh, here in a bit, so you can take them uh, back to your respective communities and share via social media um, and, and, and make sure that we get the word out uh, to make sure that so many more veterans and survivors are available for these benefits and, and for this uh, incredible care. Uh, I, I uh, for example, just talking about the veteran experience, I re just recently received my claim for chronic sinusitis and rhinitis back at a 0% rating. And uh, so that means I can see my uh, allergist for the rest of my life uh, due to my exposure to the toxins in, in uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom and uh, East Africa where I served. So 
it, it, it's a it's a fantastic process. I went on the VA.gov. I filed my claim. It's more like TurboTax than it ever has been before. It's kind of where we're going to. Um, so I encourage you all to, to do the same or use an accredited veteran service organization to help file your claims. I'm really excited to, to, uh, to talk more about the progress being made here uh, at GLA to see the tiny homes uh, and, and PTRS ADM and to hear most importantly from our community stakeholders and the voices of the veterans uh, that, that we represent and that we serve. Uh, so uh, with that, sir, just wanted to turn it back over and say thank you and welcome to all the new members. Thank you very much, Mr. Bristol. Let me ask for a couple of comments from our vice chair, Mr. Mondano. Thanks so much, General. Greetings to all. Appreciate your being here and certainly a warm greeting to our new members. Just picking up on what the general said earlier, the services focus, primary services focus of this meeting, I think it's entirely appropriate and really corresponds to the theme of the DCOEP from its inception. And that is we intend to be customer focused. Our concern is for the customer, the well-being of the veteran who has served the well-being of those veterans who have fallen into homelessness. And of course, much of our deliberation is focused for that population with the intentionality of restoring to them the nexus point of the receipt of those services, namely the housing. And I think some of the questions that we're raising about services are appropriate. And resonate not only here in Los Angeles, but resonate around the country in terms of what's the appropriate set of protocols for veterans who are homeless to ensure their stability in their housing and the trajectory to further social capital in their lives. So I'm particularly happy about the focus today on services, and I look forward to hearing what that constellation of services is evolving. So thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Margano. Uh, Dr. Harris, any comments? Good morning, everyone. Um, I want to touch on a couple of things. I was thinking back to the last meeting, and the piece I spoke to at the beginning was my optimism for, for how things were in so I've retained that. It's tempered a bit by uh, some fairly long-standing challenges, but I do retain that on the, on the housing side. I'm sure we'll hear a lot about this, especially tomorrow. We're closer and closer to the opening of the three new buildings. Every time we tour those buildings, you, you see them come more to light. You see the quality of those buildings and the, and the beauty, frankly, of them. And, it, it is a, it's an exciting thing to picture our veterans finally getting to move in and, and to live there. Uh, there's really important work to be done on the ramp up pieces of that, which I know we'll hear more about tomorrow. Um, like usual, I have more to say about the services side also, so that's fitting with uh, this, this meeting. Um, the theme since last meeting has been identifying gaps, service gaps and challenges and coming up with new solutions to address those. We we brought in DEMPS, which is the um, disaster response deployment. Uh, there were three different deployments of social workers to serve and provide, um, fill the gap around uh, housing navigation and housing support services, which has been a really important missing piece of things here. Um, there was some really positive impact there. We saw that in some of the early data in Hagash as well. Um, We've also, uh, the Medical Center was able to award a housing navigation contract. I assume we'll hear more about that um, in this meeting. Again, filling an important need there. Uh, and then third, SSPF, which I assume when John Kim speaks, will talk about uh, new dollars to assist even further with housing navigation. So something that was essentially a, a missing piece of the services continuum here has now been filled in many different important ways, some of which were first were done uh, in the VA system nationally. So that's a pretty exciting. Think more work to be done there, but um, an exciting bit of movement. We also recognize the need for additional support in CTRS. So, uh, the Medical Center put forth a staffing request of ACO that has been awarded and funded. The Medical Center is now in the process of moving towards recruitment and filling those both on the case management and services side and also on a, kind of a management monitoring side. That's going to be an important piece of, of um, burgeoning the, the supports at CTRS. Um, 
one of the recommendations from this board last time focused on attrition and lost of housing. We will we'll hear about that in the dashboard review. This remains an incredibly important concern. I can't remember if I shared this before, but when you look at HUD-BASH housing numbers, almost as many veterans move out of HUD-BASH as move in. It's what makes that utilization number so difficult to uh, see increases in. The more we can do to prevent the unwanted, undesirable losses of housing, in other words, where someone didn't choose to vote because they have so much better to move, the more we can do with that, uh, the better. Two other things real quick. Um, one, I, I think we'll hear more about this from John Kuhn also, uh, the, the renewed focus on rapid access to transitional housing and emergency beds here, something we've been talking about for much of the past year. It's good to see real movement in that direction now. Um, and then one last thing I want to mention, it was recently mentioned in the media, the idea of the Veteran Action Board here. And I wanted to, to say that that remains in development. We want to create a structured spot for local veterans to provide input on both current state and future state. Um, and certainly, in fact, we'd be interested in hearing during public comment about people's impressions of how that should work. Um, with that, I think I'll turn it back over. We've got a lot to cover in the next few days. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Harris. And uh, Dr. Hurley. Your turn. Perhaps you'll tell us who this John Kuhn is that Dr. Harris <laughs> is there. Yes. Highlight it. Yes, so, so that's the first order of business is to introduce two members of our team. Um, the first is Mr. John Kuhn, who is our acting um, deputy director and you know, executive director of overseeing the master plan. Sir, do you want to just say who you are? Sure. So uh, great to be able to join us. I, I feel a lot better to be. Uh, Staff, and we have some incredibly talented people on the Allen here. And one of the big reasons why we see what elders are coming on so well. Uh, I also wanted to thank Fiona. I don't know if she's here, but she's behind a lot of work. Huh? She's done a ton of work pulling this together. So thank you, Fiona. Well, thank you, Sarah Carter, who's our new acting head of the So we have a, a a lot of talent here. Uh, there's a lot of energy, and I think you know, some, some real prospects for change. We're going to be glad we're on the board. So, in the introduction of Deborah, who is a social worker, um, Matt McGarren has, uh, is moving on to the Homes Program Office uh, to do a, a temporary assignment working on special projects over there for the next 120 days. And Deborah has agreed to. Come on board and be our um, acting chief of service. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I'd like to do in my comments is to help put all this in perspective uh, in conjunction with the overall healthcare system. Um, you know, this is one of the things that we do, uh, but of course, the VA Grand San Jose Healthcare System's mission is to take care of all of our veterans in uh, the greater Los Angeles area, our five county locations. We just finished the fiscal year, so I can detail some things that uh, have occurred over that fiscal year real quick. Um, the first is uh, to notice that we took care of 88,000 uh, unique veterans. Uh, that number is still counting as they figure out some of the September numbers into the system. Um, overall, we spent $1.25 billion uh, when we include all of our you know, medical um, costs associated in addition to the master plan costs, which you've heard about over time. Um, 700, almost 775 million of that is personnel, uh, whether that's funded directly to us or whether that's through special purpose funds like the Homeless Program Office or Rural Health or other initiatives. Another 58 million is uh, non recurrent maintenance projects, the largest by far. Uh, in the visit and possibly over the country here. I don't, I don't know that for sure. Of that 58 million, about 34 was specifically for master plan projects and the, the infrastructure and the, the uh, UL preparation for the parcels and the utilities and all of that. Um, 27 million for equipment uh, and then community care about $200 million. So that's also relatively low compared to other organizations you know, in community care, which you'd expect because we have a pretty large, robust healthcare system. Um, one of the highlights was right at the end of the fiscal year, September 27th, we started seeing patients in our new Ventura CBOC. 
um, that's a really great application clinic in Ventura that, that we run and manage uh, that replaces the previous Oxnard clinic um, in Ventura County a little bit further to the east, I guess, of where Ventura clinic is right near the Santa Barbara border. Uh, that was a, a, a contract for the clinic. So veterans are happy. They'll be happier when we can meet all the access requirements. Right now we're a little behind on access because of all the people that want to rush in to get an appointment on the first day. Uh, but we're going to continue to work through that. Our focus initially is primary care. We opened as soon as we got that squared away and more specialty care will be developing over the next couple months. On November 9th, um, we have a dedication ceremony for that CBOC and uh, Dr. Alma Haller and the Secretary of Health and Congresswoman Brownlee uh, will be joining us for that uh, event. Um, so I also want to then turn back over to this uh, kind of topic and uh, many or most of you, if not all of you, are aware of the, the fire that we had at CTRS a month ago uh, because of a lithium battery that was charging and exploded um, and then set uh, you know, essentially the loss of 22 shelters um, there. Those are in the process of getting replaced over the next few weeks. Uh, most of them are on order and, and we should anticipate getting those soon. Um, uh, John is going to talk about some safety changes and uh, procedure and process changes put in place in order to you know, try to prevent that kind of thing from happening again. Uh, and that's a focus of what we want to do uh, there as well. The other thing that I want to mention um, is I need your help for some of you, especially those of you who are engaged in uh, the you know, government agency legislative work of the city and county that impact the rules associated with um, the income levels for veterans. And um, it has it has become evident that some of our 90 and 100 percent disabled veterans um, may not qualify for housing units on the EULs that are coming on to campus because they exceed the 50 and 60 percent amounts of the area median income. Now, it's, um, it is important and necessary to follow the rules and laws that were uh, put in place in order to designate these uh, units as low income housing, if you will, uh, part of the bonds and other things that uh, supply funding for our ability to, uh, through the developers, to renovate and build these buildings. But uh, we have a challenge when some of our most uh, disabled veterans can't qualify because of the VA compensation that they receive. Uh, so, one of the things that um, we want to take a look at is how do we get around that? In every other part of our VA system, those who are the most disabled actually qualify for more services, not less. And what makes these particular units unique here at GLA is that they're on the VA property and they're proximate to services that some of these folks need. Now, I personally am not in favor of a waiver for all disabled veterans. Um, there are many of us who have disability ratings, may be retired, may have other jobs whose income limits um, well exceed uh, the required amounts in order to qualify for low income housing. What I personally favor is the notion to exclude disability, VA disability pay from the um, income calculation. And uh, that still allows us to cover down on low income uh, veterans. It, it also means that those veterans who have other income probably wouldn't qualify, but they probably don't have the same physical, psychological, and medical needs 
as the people whose primary and only income really is VA disability. So what I'm asking for help here and what is still a little undefined for us is who are the rule makers um, that may determine what income is you know, allowable in that calculation for income levels so that we could potentially try to waive that disability income. Is it a legislative fix in the local and county government? Is it an agency issue? Is it an executive decision? Is it a HUD issue? Is it a national issue? Um, need to get that answer so we can know where to try to address the issue. So for those of you who are engaged with these groups, um, if you can help us find that answer, uh, then we can continue to strategize how to make that happen. It may mean that the simplest answer is a waiver for all veterans on VA project, you know, um, EULs. Uh, I, I don't know if that's the right answer or not, but I, I think for me, when I think through the process and the goals of low income housing and all of that, and also taking into account that uh, some of these veteran disabilities um, do not set the stage for success far away from our campus. For others, it absolutely is not an issue. Um, and, and we need to make sure that we're addressing those because that's inconsistent with our overall practice of providing additional services for people with higher disability needs. So I just wanted to put that out on the table. We have had internal discussions about that um, at, you know, all the way through the VA. Uh, but if, if this is an issue that I believe you know, this group can help us with, if it's possible, please do. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Graberman. And let me just a couple of follow-up questions. Is, is your staff doing, uh, I'll say research, for lack of a better descriptor, of how many people can be captured by the, by the uh, exclusion, the pay exclusion? Or is that still to be determined? And it, maybe it's not even a hard number. It's, uh, I'm not asking the question very well, but that's sort of the gist of my concern. So I think there's a couple of answers to that. We, we could um, we could potentially identify the folks on our binding list who are 90% disabled. Um, not all of those, I would think, are going to you know, still qualify, if you will, if those income limits were decreased. Or if, if, if the disability income was withheld from the population, they may not need it. So um, it's a floating number for that reason, but we can find some of that information. He has his, uh, I assume if your, if your, if your name like being uh, vertical means you have a question. And it's, it's bigger. So, uh, and so everybody can yeah. see it on the tower instead of lights or anything. Giant. Uh, yeah, I actually just wanted to concur with what you said, and, and I'm part of doing that, that very research on the binding list. We have a really good partnership with the local VBA regional office. VBA has direct access, of course, not only to VA benefits and income dollars, but actually direct access to Social Security as well. The problem is the latter, they have to do manual lookups on, so they're not done. But they've actually taken the binding list of about 2,000 people and identified all the veterans on that. Who, who show up in their system with service connection and what that percentage is. So we're, we're getting close to having a pretty complete picture of what you're asking for. Yeah, yeah and the reason why I say 90 and 100 percent is there's a there's a big jump in disability pay between 90 and 100 percent. So it basically goes from $1,900 a month to you know, almost $3,300. So it's a it's a fifteen hundred dollar fifteen hundred dollar a month job, which comes out to eighteen thousand dollars. So that's what tips people over the edge. You know, with a with an eight point seven percent cost of living increase coming in January, if there's not a recalculation of the AMI, that's going to you know raise that gap even more. So uh, it becomes important to start taking. It. I think you have another question from Mr. Masters. Yeah. Um, Disability income was non-taxable. In which case, you could 
it's not a taxable issue. But if it's, if it's not taxable, then you're only looking, looking at a tax. I don't know if that's the case. So I don't think that's the case. Sounds to me. Yeah, I don't think that's really what is the case, but that might be another alternative is, you know, instead of waiting or being and designing that. Are you? Yeah, thank you, Arkson. Um, I was just going to add, we did a lot of this work um, when I was at LASA and happy to help. It's a, largely an issue with the state and how that and the way that the tax credits are structured. So I think it's a broader conversation because most veteran income is too high for these units. So happy to connect and figure out a strategy to. Um, I think the idea is a good one around the, the veteran income and acceptance of that. Mr. Beth Iron. So I know that so I know that there are uh, state issues with this as well, but I know federally how they decided to publish rule of the federal register that would take care of that uh piece around income. Right now, uh income disability payment uh is considered for the uh voucher or we know that we heard from Congressman Lodden's office that um I'd expect to publish in the federal register in the next several months. And so the question by firefighters is before January first, right? Because they only take effect on the other first of that. So Sean, is that just for this area? No, no, that would be oh, yeah. natural. Okay. It, it would be essentially you know, wiping away that income from the town of Okay. And one more. Oh, sorry. Dr. Bamberger, excuse me. Hi, Josh Bamberger. Um, I think to answer your question, Dr. Bamberger, the part of the government that we need to engage is the tax or the IRS. They're the ones who make the decision as to where the tax credits can be. Um, allocated to the construction people and people who qualify. That's where the uh, research that I've sent, I shared with Dr. Harris, that's where the decision is made as to whether or not the developers continue to use the tax credit um, to build their building. And if you can get the IRS to give a waiver that doesn't include their income to disabled veterans, then the tax credits to the developers can continue to flow. But I think the part of the government that you need to talk to. Is that right, Keith? So we've heard, uh, we've heard IRS, we've heard the state, so that's why I'm asking. Yeah. I'll, I'll put you on the spot one more time, uh, Dr. Redelman. I don't know if the president has uh, visited. I don't know if he specifically, I don't believe this is here. Did you have a chance to interact with anything past on the screen? No, the president's visit was. Um, not in conjunction with VA. VA. We, we supplied um, parking and security assistance. It was held on the uh, metro easement construction uh, location, and uh, we didn't have any engagement with the private minister. Too pressure. These, these are generals. Um, yes, IRS code. So, I did meet with, we have um, also the advisory committee on homeless veterans, which is that meets with our HPO, large VA. Um, and I actually raised this because I too, like Dr. Braverman, I am petrified that not being able to house, we talked about this the last time I was here, my biggest nightmare is not being able to help 100% disabled veterans. So they do raise the tax code and uh, one of the do outs for, for them that I've asked for is, okay, what in the tax code do we need to address? Where is it? Um, so I'm hoping to get something from them to assist us. I do like the idea of the exclusion of the capability pay. And so I vow to take this back and to continue to ask questions and push and figure out ways for us to work through this. Because in the few months we're going to have these buildings open and we're going to have veterans who absolutely need to be in there. And because the way the structure currently is, they're not going to be housed and it's a train that's coming and we just need to figure out how to navigate it to the best of our ability. Dr. Harris, so then, uh, Mr. Ong. Sorry, Evan. Uh, the one, just, I don't want to leave it feeling like nobody really knows where some of these 
decisions are held. The three entities we know of are the California Tax Credit Allocation Committee, DHHP, and then LA Housing Department. Those are three funders of the buildings that are going to open. They hold some of this decision making. We were just a bunch of us just on a call this week that LA uh, Housing Department attended. They, they said they are open to reconsidering their part of the cap. So then the next step, of course, is figuring out how many units might that apply to then. Is that based on the amount of funding they put into that building? Uh, they're going to need VA and partners, the developers, to craft a letter seeking that. But that, for instance, is one very concrete way we may be able to get some flexibility. Mm -hmm. Mr. Alton. Uh, thanks. I just I wanted to bring it back to the PAC Act real quick. You know, I, I've had conversations with veterans that I know that are experiencing some health issues, brain inflammation, respiratory issues. They're not enrolled in the VA system. Where do we direct them to? Do they set up a screening appointment first? Do they have to enroll in VA healthcare first? Um, you know, what's what's the funnel looking like? So yes, for screening. They, get, they should be able to get a screening if they've deployed, get a screening appointment. Um, at the same time, they need to file for their benefits. So it's um, va.gov backslash patch PACT. Um, it's really, I did the same thing John did. I just submitted my stuff. Um, and so I highly recommend that they do that so that once they get in the system, but there are additional, and Anthony, I'll look it up while I'm here, um, parameters that I'm not as familiar with of what they qualify for now being able to come back into VA health. Um, and so there were extensions that were granted for them to have access to health care. So I will get that information for you and, and circle back. As far as the screening process, would the screener then, uh, I assume, be able to tell them, okay, you know, there's been an extension in health care enrollment. This is what you can do. I guess what I'm concerned about is I just I don't want to go out there and and yes. just sell the PAC Act so, as a way to just increase your disability. I think right, a yeah. lot of veterans I know. The goal is for them to hopefully for those that aren't able to do all of their health care right. through VA that they're going to be able to do more. For those that aren't currently having their health care at VA to be able to apply so that they can start being seen by us because we're convinced that we're the best place to take care of veterans. Right. And so it's a, it's a dual track. Sure. And, and so is, 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 does the veteran contact the local medical center? Is there a national PAC Act hotline? Um, what, where do we go? So they can call 1-800, uh, not something, yeah. <laughs> they can call 1-800-MY-VA-411 and address any of the PAC specific concerns or questions or recommendations or compliments. Um, you can also go to va.gov slash PAC, like Chief mentioned, but the local uh, N2VA uh, offices should be prepared uh, as well as the screening coordinators and Dr. Braverman, we may, it'd be great to connect with the local screening coordinator here. But the the gist is we're trying to get as much guidance out to the those screening coordinators yeah. as possible so that there's no wrong to our approach. So they, you know, if, you, if you're not enrolled in VHA yet, um, then you know, make sure you, 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 you go through that process to the enrollment folks here at GLA or at Long Beach or Loma Linda, and then make sure you go into VA.gov or use an accredited veteran service organization to file a claim so that you can continue to receive your care from the VA. Um, so in many cases, it may not increase disability, but you have that 0%, which will get you care for life, which is fantastic. Yes, sir. So just to jump on to what... Uh... John was saying, so folks may contact our business office, our enrollment office, to get the information on whether they already qualify based on their veterans tax to at least enroll. Um, there's a the, the screening site online that's been mentioned allows folks to fill out an initial screening information as to whether they were in the area, etc. Uh, if that comes out as a positive screen, then that automatically goes into a portal, which goes to our environmental and occupational health service, and we'll contact those individuals for an exam, which is different from the screen. Um, that exam can then be used to assist in any compensation claim through BBA. 
the, the compensation claim through VBA then identifies the service connectedness and which conditions might eventually be service connected. The thing is, you need a diagnosis. Sure. Right? It's not just you know, my brain is swollen. So, um, and I mean that pejoratively. Yeah. Yeah, I, I understand. You have know, symptoms, but to, to get the claim in the service connectedness, you need a diagnosis. So, that's that's kind of our process um, for folks that are already enrolled with us. Uh, then the primary care providers are assisting in that screen, and then eventually that is in the VBA. So, so, so just to clarify on the on the verbiage, when we're talking screening, we're talking eligibility for tax act benefits, and we talk about exam, we're talking about an actual medical examination to determine if there is something adverse or yes. if that you were impacted by some sort of exposure. Yeah, screening is more about correlating with the symptoms that you have. And then the, you know, to doc, what Dr. Berry was saying, the actual appointment with the clinician is to evaluate those symptoms. Sure. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's super helpful. I just, you know, I, I I wanted to be clear, so I'm relaying, you know, accurate information. And I think maybe, you know, we can talk about. That's the same. They should also apply in for the benefits as well with the screening, right? They should also get online put in their information, start the claim process simultaneously. So it's so everything all at the same time. I don't mm -hmm. want them just to do the screening and not think that, that they don't have to do the claim. They also need to file the claim. Right. That makes sense. Thanks. Okay. Thanks very much, Dr. Bergman. And thanks for your question. That was an important discussion. Uh, the last thing we'll do in this uh, block is introduce our new members. We have two new members. Uh, Ms. Stephanie Fuller, who is here with us in person today, and Ms. Annie Bravo, who is with us virtually online. I will ask uh, Amy first, both are, are well grounded in her quality of life today, as well as in true associated with homelessness, and housing, and et cetera. So we're excited to have them on board. I'll ask uh, Ms. Bravo to go first because, frankly, we need to take the WebEx down for a few minutes to get ready for the next uh, uh, the demonstration. So, Ms. Bravo, you're up. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much. Oh, hold on just a second. We've lost the audio. Test your, test your audio. Go ahead, Ms. You're, you're on mute, Ms. Bravo. Can you hear me now? There you go. Great. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, Amy Bravo, I run the Los Angeles Veterans Collaborative, which is the network of organizations that are really working together to remove barriers for veterans and their families in Los Angeles County. So I'm really happy to be part of this team. I'm sorry I can't be there in person. I do have my military obligation this week. But I am very much looking forward to listening, participating as best I can during this time, and then uh, being able to bring back the community input to look for real time solutions for the work that we're doing. So thank you. That's the right military branch uniform you have on there. Well, thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Cole. I'm going to take my mask out because it's Monday. <laughs> um, thank you for having me. Stephanie Cohen, I, uh, in my life, have worked in government for the last almost decade. I've worked very closely with the VA for different elected officials that covered the West LA region. I've uh, been engaged through several directors now, uh, and I just recently switched positions to work for USC. But one of the things that I said is that uh, VA can't get rid of me. So here I am sitting on the board. I'm really excited to be here, uh, get started on, on some of the work that, that this board is engaged in. I think I have a lot of experience and a lot of things to contribute from my time in government, county government specifically, um, and hopefully we'll be able to get some things done together. So thank you so much for welcoming me. Very good. Welcome aboard. Okay, we will take a short break. Uh, in order to get set up for the uh, demonstration, as I remember. 
probably should have been fine at that point. That's to make a stand <laughs> So is your my name list a match with the lots of my name list on the entire veteran? So that is one of the things we're working on with, with lots of things that look like this match. So that's why I'm reporting that this is still a work in progress because we are still uh, working through to make sure both of those that we have the same match. There are 2,000 people, so relative to 65,000. Homeless in Finale County, thousands of uncommon. Where are we in reconciling the two lists? Please take that off. There's 65,000. That's I know. That's why I didn't list the past 3,500. One of the challenges we face is that we have two different deaths. Yes, used by most non profit providers. So, reconciling with that base right now, see how we can add a base. One of the things we will talk about in the that. I understand that. The uh, game has your data. Lanza has their data. So they can How long is it going to take for the two groups to sit down together and go through these documents? That's what I need to understand. I've been engaged. He and I have been working on for eight months now to even get served at the city. Why is the list not recognized? There should be one veteran list in the city. How many veterans are experiencing this? This one. So, my concern right now is accurate. Okay. Thank you. A quick question on the permanent housing numbers. Um, what are you counting as permanent housing? Is it is it just a batch? Is it including like veterans who are housed in Section Eight or on their own? Like, what's the scope of what counts as a permanent housing placement? So those permanent housing placements are veterans, a batch, um, veterans who. I don't. Want to, so I will. I'll get you there. I don't. Want to. Uh, I want to go back to the 
I just I want to start you're saying are, are you saying that right now there's no bad mentality? And I think that's what my colleague said. There's one list, but I acknowledge that the problem is that and that's what we're working on. Right? And what's the problem? Making sure that that the old name both the sound and the updated regular base. And all formats updated for both brands. Input, both, both of these. Those are all at the same time. But it, it's got to be good at finding the first of the other stands. I think what we're trying to get at is what is the what is the challenge? Like the, the people process the technology, like have people not agree on what to share yet, or, or how to share it. Um, so uh, the current state is better than what it sounds. So there there is a um, veteran coordinator from LASA, there's a coordinator Andrew special and self certified. The two of them were just daily reconciled. So the trouble when you talk about the challenges and, and sorry, data sharing is not fun. Right? The share encrypted this back and forth. The problem is it's, it's too many. It hasn't been automized. If there are pieces of what I'm calling service management, more sophisticated version of dealing, I mean you said two thousand small, two thousand big, right? Compared to any other binding list in the country. And it's too much for two people to go line by line and say, okay, I've got this one in my system, the other in your system. That's what's been done. It's been months of manual labor. So there's a there's a there's one list, they've gone through it, they've told us we think this list is solid, but every day there are new veterans contacting the company. There isn't a really efficient process for how to quickly add people to that list. I, I, as I heard there's a few. But it's better than it's than it sounded. Right now, it's not the same. I, I, I think I understand that. I, 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 I guess I'm just more frustrated than 2022. Right? You don't need to go to the state, local, 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 Perhaps let Mr. Joseph take a phone with the rest of his presentation. It seems to me it's fact why to have the list that will be perfect on one day. Then the next day it's going to be everything bad. So challenge except this folks that we heard. I'm down to the that is today or tomorrow and tomorrow. So, uh, let's, uh, let's perhaps try to get to a little bit. Yeah. Um, uh, so, when you sign it, can you wait or do you stay? I was just going to add to what you were saying that as somebody who sat on the LASA side and the third side, it's a 50 50 challenge. A lot of it is on the LASA side who's running the county. So, I just want to acknowledge that the VA is sharing the data. We're trying to build the technology to make the system pass, but what's in the VA's control is limited compared to the scope and the HMIS system that is not within the VA. Go ahead. I'm going to tell my bad figures out. Thank you. Scroll down to just a little bit further. 
So this uh, information here, uh, it was requested to um, identify the total number of HUD batch vouchers that are allocated to GLA. Uh, and then within that allocation, uh, the total number of project-based vouchers and utilization of that. So on the pie chart here on the left-hand side is our total number of uh, white blue is the total number of the current number of veterans housed is 51,198. Uh, in the orangish color is the number available for use, and those are 2,780. And in the navy blue is number of vouchers that are issued but not yet in use of which are 220. On the right hand side, I should denote that this 1,229 number is inclusive of the 8,000 number. So of that, 100, 1,229 project-based vouchers are allocated and number of units occupied 1073, uh, which is about 87 percent. Also, uh, uh, one of the things actually we're going to add to this pie chart because I think it's important is a field of the, veteran, the number of veterans that we have that are in process. Uh, so, there are a number of veterans that we do have in process and we're working to get and actively get into project data. Dr. Bender, so first of all, I want to just make really important all of the number available from Second thing to the question said, sir, how many of these allocated vouchers are expensive? It would be nice if the math was sent to draft the brain about the specifics of job subsidies and other resources available. The challenge is, is that it also meant a choice that the house that becomes part of the challenge. Also, we're working with big men to get out on the street, out of the current locations, and maybe not there to live. Uh, but it's a big start. Okay. Then just a little bit further, uh, that area here is. Uh, our progress in the homeless funded, homeless off program office funded positions within HUD Dash. So, this uh, is a quarterly basis target is 90%. So, for uh, currently in quarter four of FY22, we are just under 75% funded homeless in the HUD Dash program office. That is at 74.8%. So that is uh, just mentioned here.
a strong one. Uh, when we were asked for feedback regarding the dashboard, I I sent a memo, I think, to someone at the VA. I'm not sure if it got through, but on this particular chart, my concern here is just the percentage I don't think is uh, really informal, right? Because you could have, for example, you know, if there's 100 positions available and 50 are filled, that's 50%. Same is true if there are four positions available and two of them. So it doesn't really give me a really good understanding of what are we really talking about. Because you know, staffing two people and staffing 50 people is a totally different ballgame. So that, that would be my only feedback here. I think having having the numbers would be a little bit more helpful than just the percentage. We can absolutely do that. Uh, the number we are talking about is in uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 350 uh, for specifically for the dash. Uh, uh, so, yeah, we can thank you for that feedback and we can absolutely incorporate that. Uh, broken down just a little bit here is so this is a, uh, a table of available, uh, available options on. Available housing options on our West LA campus. Uh, so before we dive into these, I should just make note quickly that uh, you will see in here coming soon will be buildings 205, 208, 207. Uh, so we will; those are expected to be on uh, available by the end of the year, if it's after the end of the year. Uh, so those will be added to this. Uh, those capacity. And um, of course, we will update them. But we, we broke this down here uh, a number of different ways. Um, so, in the first one, you'll see uh, medical beds, which denote uh, both of our domiciliary. Uh, and then just under that, you'll see our safe sheltering or, or safe parking, uh, which includes our safe parking area as well as our CTRS uh, program. Then under that, you'll see uh, transitional housing beds uh, and emergency shelter beds. And at the very bottom, the permanent supportive housing units, and that is the dashboard. Break it out, the link that we have. Right here. This request is our um, number of veterans and homeless veterans that are placed in residential care facilities. Um, and so what we have broken out here is, um, so we work with our community living, our community living center staff um, as they track and compile this data. Um, and so what they, they were able to break out for us, the number of veterans Total number of veterans is that they actually delineate which veterans are homeless, veterans are not homeless, as there's some different flexibility to available programs available in this in this area. Um, as I understand, we're digging a little more into that, um, and so I hope these numbers increase as a result of those efforts. I think you go first this time. Make sure you identify yourself. Any hard says for this one, um, what's the what's the goal? Is it uh, like X percentage of veterans who are coming from homelessness into CRP? Is it just being filled? Like what is what does it look like? Uh, I mean, that's a, well, one of the reasons I wanted this to be a top five. Is the VA doesn't the VA doesn't pay doesn't have any mechanism for but the federal government has not By having 
point of this. Yeah, so most veterans who are injured who come from homelessness are funding their How are they getting a fee? Right, that's what I was going to ask. Oh. Do you know where? I, I don't know that. Jim Holden and Jessica Shepard. any information on it. More than just because get some data on that and get some feedback from owners, we might be able to, to do something to uh, that percentage. Uh, I didn't have to check with my dad. I believe that it's something our dad does track and then but I have to figure out my would be the thing that. Yeah, uh, Ms. Hurley, that's an important point. And one of the things we have been hearing from the landlords is understanding, listen, they're running a business. They are taking risks, and we have to compensate them for this. So the way we're compensating them for it is because many of the vets we serve have challenging credit history and eviction is by offering an incentive. So there are two sources for this incentive now. We can provide incentive either to a very well sample. Also incentive that are asking to get a grant each year. Two months of rent. And this helps them compensate right up front. No, again, not saving these rents. They're here. Oh, I, as an owner, I, I can ask about you. In our experience, it was negative. Uh, for, I think for a couple of reasons. The first reason is we did not know the level of scrutiny. The second reason is that it doesn't seem to be enough for If we can offer the unit, the psychology and, and the social services, way, Way above our ability to determine. So, I, I can trouble in the past when uh, the answer came on some of these other things with non profits and a lot of service. First thing they do is they resident evaluation, whatever you call it, but that is not shared with the owner. So, the owner doesn't know what he's getting into. And, um, that was a problem for us. We ended up losing a lot of money. It was a negative experience. John, good again. So some will we can't share because it's kind of safe. But we can use funds. So when somebody's and we can also understand your so at the landlords. 
same schools that was here. So it's important for us to have a relationship with the landlord, understand their tolerance, and and when there is a problem, there's a phone number a person you can call. So you tell us, hey, so and so is. Whatever the issue is, so we respond. What lies amateur uh, diagnosis with the not not service providers and the high turnover service and the mix between money service providers and bad vouchers should be shifted. There should be more money for social services and you've got 30 or 35 percent or percent of unutilized bad boundaries. Um and if we had, had, had better service or more service and I really think that's a difficult job I think um, social service providers can get burned out and and my guess is that I turn up the thought my amateur opinion is that that more than and not get the point to the uh, adding more bash vouchers without the support system. Well, for an amateur opinion, it's not quite professional because you're right. You need both things so you have to provide housing. Of course, you don't get to pay housing, all services no longer going to help. Uh, but once they're in housing, you still have to provide support. It's not housing only, it's services. So we've done this in combination of things. Yes, that 75% for proofing is a challenge. Part of it is uh, the expense of it is to have our veterans expensive staff. So that's part of the challenge. Maybe it's your own bonus, your pension bonus for staff that just helps. Uh, we contract out as well. So we just keep the bills on the ground. Staff by So we are looking for every place in the country to bolster our service and strength. But there are challenges. Just one comment. Jim, hello, Van Hanna. Jim, I'm wondering the service providers that you're alluding to, are they non profit service providers? They would be like this is an effort in here. My sense is that yeah, I did a lot of work actually in San Bernardino County, so I am familiar raising. But I do think that gets the question that we got uh, in our last meeting, which is the recidivism issue. Comparison between recidivism or race with DA case stands versus the of those who are placed with organizations. And I think that is a question. I think we're still waiting for question, right? But I do think that kind of research could be helpful. So if we find out, for example, that VA does an extraordinary job. The DOE retention rate is 87% in the community based organizations, 40% maybe in one. This simple business. But I, I fear it's the reverse. And certainly what we hear across the country is that it is the reverse. That in fact, and I've sat in meetings literally all over the country where the VA would say, we're going to provide the case management. Business people. Like you would say, what does that mean? They say, and the VA people would say, we're going to provide case management nine to five on weekdays. That was their sense what case management was. And of course, the community. Organizations, broader sense, one has case and they have a greater build social connectivity. Is it 
covenant in the place where we would be. Is there any that comparison from just communication? Success. I, I can only provide partial data, SSCF data. Um, and this is pre COVID, so lots of changes in COVID. Versus individuals, we saw a range about 10 to 15 percent increase in access or services to VA, any home. That sounds like a bad number to me, but if you look at the number of recovered veterans, it's not that bad. So we know people, of course, already at higher risk. So that's a low return. So so the first part of the answer is yes, those streaming providers do very well and I think just for the reason you described web of relationships, and it's not beyond standard that web of relationships. And you can do more and more choices in the utilizing contracts and subscribing some of that skill set, but also blending more and more. So you don't have a whole bunch of skills. You can have a dash program, an FSDF program. And those services blended more and more. So if you're a veteran, you don't really see so much of a difference. A dash makes it work in a much more flattering way than that's right now here, very specific way, try to ensure exactly what you're describing. System work in progress, better and better. Registration is something that's important. I do think, though, in the event that you don't have to be cut down, and I assume that you're working on this, that that's the evolution. We'll know better. As you continue in your position, I know Pete's been uh, interested in this. I just think it would be so helpful to understand if I know that the center, Center Philadelphia, had done some work years ago, making comparison between PA case management and community based case management. They had conclusions on that. So now those are. It so would be great to have here so we could better understand we have less traded land and we just use a business model which works better so we're going to have more and more work about it so but do we have any sense of when right now yes so uh, i don't to keep, keep here no, don't i don't have a formal but as we've talked about, it is something we But is it the important or interested in working on it? But how dash is it going Right. No, I, I, not right this second. There have been, as you noted, but it's more kind of targeted specific pieces. The last data I saw show less difference than you. Uh, but I've been in touch with that dash. dash. Again, the, the piece I actually wanted to add to this, um, but I'm not sure people are aware of this. Scale by age, I, I hope this number is accurate, and Gerald, you know, I think close to a quarter of the Dash vouchers are under contracted case And that is wildly higher than any other medical center in America. GLA is way ahead of the rest of the country in contracting this out. I just I don't want that piece to get lost. I think we've done much bigger group of jobs. That's, that's great, isn't it? Because then you could make a comparison. Yeah. Outsource. Then you could take that comparison, find out which of those are. And again, go around the country. But what would be interesting and helpful to understand 
haven't, again, I know it's a volume problem, but I just want to make that it, 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 to know that there's a dash of all, a dash center, and they don't have that data, it's beyond. looking at here are exits from our public housing authorities. Uh, this one here is from Black uh, Hackla, excuse me, uh, is the housing authority of the city of Los Angeles. Uh, and so this one it breaks down uh, the reasons that are better exiting from uh, permanent housing. Uh, this data is provided to us from Hackla. Uh, if you scroll down one more, this one is from Black Um and so we review this information. Some of these you'll see they're trying to, uh, there's some in here uh, like non compliance uh, and or, you know, yeah, non compliance of DAC management. So those are obviously coming from here. Uh, there's one I, is um, for failure to provide documentation. So those sorts of things we're trying to work through uh, for obvious reasons. Those are really low hanging fruit that we feel like uh, those with the veterans can make sure they're exiting. Um, so we'll scroll through this one. Uh, this one actually wasn't a formal request of the BPOE, but we felt like it was uh, good information uh, for for uh, anyone interested in how to be uh, Form of. And so these are um, processing time, dash processing time, uh, and it's broken down through uh, all of the housing, excuse me, all of the housing authorities in our entire catchment area. And it toggles you through uh, the total number we have out, uh, date of admission to a dash, uh, the date of issuance of voucher, the date of voucher completion. Uh, so Again, while this wasn't a formal request, this was something we felt like better um, and knowing uh, this was the situation. I, I think that is a helpful. I, I think so. Look, man, uh, I appreciate what you put. Just going back though to the hack list, what, what is the level of exit? I can't read it. Sorry, I, I, I'm not. So for the month of September, for instance, it's 30. Do you know cumulatively any data they over a year percentage of place that comes from the product? Is that or, uh, do we have any data there? I'm sure we do. I don't have it right here, but I, I, yeah. yeah. I think we'd be deeper that data. And I believe let me say generally that's So it would be interesting to know what percent of this information from the housing authority. Maybe that could give us a picture. Maybe they have some additional data that would be helpful. So this issue of recidivism in general is very interesting to us. Yeah, I know it's a Certainly, recidivism in the community. Or, 
experience with WASA is that something that they have enough visibility to see. I mean, we, when we were at LASA and then at CERN, we, we calculated returns to homelessness based on people losing their voucher for reasons other than I can pay for it myself or I'm moving to another permanent option or to see. So that's what this is. So see, this is the best indicator of how many people are falling out of housing, which is what we want to know, and how much of it is because of program violations versus, you know, something we want to see. It's very It can tell you if somebody, um, and we should be able, at the VA, if the VA can do this too, they should be able to say um, who had a housing voucher and then came back through the system again with a job voucher um, or through another voucher. So the housing is pretty good. Hey, the more important piece is the, is the folks who are falling out for program violation and other reasons. Case management or could be available. Hey, this seems that double season. Two slides, Amber. I think that was the last one. Okay, very good. Thanks for bringing it. So, so, evidently, what I said before was not absolutely clear about solving the problem. And again, I understand a lot of that. I just want to say, Mr. Coach, thank you so much. You know, I'm so grateful for all the hard work that you've done, with giving you some recommendations and you've taken it and run with it. And then I just can't thank you enough. It gives the opportunity for Mr. Peter, who's now clearly a national expert, but now the associate director of the entire health center, deputy director. We have a we have such a great opportunity to deliver. Um, I've seen these numbers change over time. Some of the data is really great, but all some of it's evolving because we can now have stuff in better way. But this portion with gratitude for all the work that you have done to give us an opportunity to serve progress that delay. Thank you. Councilor, I just have for the record, like they not the answer now, but to the Good question come back with. Yeah. Um two things on the interim housing and transitional housing. I think it's good to have the occupancy. Could we look at whether it's possible to also see length of stay in transitional housing and then exit destination? So how long are they staying and when people do exit, where are they going to? Is it permanent housing or also Okay, there was time now for briefing for the public. Okay, so the Ms. Marmon, are you on? Yes, hi, good hi, good afternoon. Can you ever, can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, yeah, sorry. Um my, my sound is a little bit choppy on this end, so I I wasn't able to hear you all very well um when we first entered the call. So okay. Uh Sharon, do you want to do a sound check too? Sure. Thank you. Um 
I am going to start off with our presentation today. Thank you so much for inviting uh, the Washington DC VA Medical Center's Homeless Program, a uh, Healthcare for Homeless Veterans Program uh, to present to you all today. Uh, we're honored um, and we just wanted to share with you all um, a little bit about our keys to success, uh, a successful coordinated entry, um, collaboration, as well as housing placement. Uh, just um, share with kind of with you all what has kind of worked for us um, and also some of our challenges as well. So I will get started. Um, my name is Sharon Haddock. Um, I am the uh, Healthcare for Homeless Veterans Coordinator at the Washington DC VA Medical Center. I also have with me Alana Marman, who is the um, Coordinated Entry Specialist, as well as our lead um, outreach um, specialist. And then we also have Christopher Lewis, who is our lead for our housing um, housing team, HUD Bash uh, DC housing team. Uh, so we're each going to take a little bit of part of the presentation, and then we'll leave questions for the end, if that's okay. So on our agenda today is just to kind of give you a snapshot of the resources uh, in um, and the makeup of our veteran pop homeless population in uh, DC, um, as well as uh, District of Columbia, as well as the key elements of our coordinated entry system and our key elements of our VASH housing placement, and then kind of lessons learned in our challenges. Next slide, please. So our snapshot of our um, DC uh, veteran housing, um, housing resources for the VA housing resources that we have, we have 100, uh, 1,200, oops, sorry, 1, <laughs> 1,228 um, HUD VASH vouchers um, available. Um, we have two project-based facilities. Um, one is a 60 uh, unit and the other one is 29 units. We also have a one DC uh, contract uh, program that serves us 75 of our vouchers, um, an ACT team. Um, then we also have three SSVF grantee um, providers. We have two uh, grant and per diem programs uh, totaling 115 beds. And then we have two uh, SERS programs as well as the safe haven program that total 53 um, beds. Next slide. Thank you. Um, our District of Columbia veteran resources um, or community resources that we have, um, our DC Department of Human Services um, local veterans program, um, permanent supportive housing program, they have 150 units. Uh, we have a project-based uh, Perm, uh, permanent supportive housing program at the old Walter Reed. Uh, that's a local uh, rent subsidy and they have 75 units. We have, uh, we utilize our uh, PEP V, which is our pandemic emergency program, which is run by the city, um, the district. And then we have um, a 20 bed, a single room occupancy uh, unit through um, one of our providers access housing. Next slide. Um, our Washington DC by name list, um, which is our actively homeless population in July of 2017, we had 441 veterans on the by name list. Um, in July um, of 2022, we had 262 veterans on our list. Um, and we'll talk about our current challenges, but one of the challenges is that we need our outflow um, to out outpace the inflow. Um, and we are going to turn it over to Alana Marmon for the coordinated entry piece. Okay, thank you, Sharon. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to talk a little bit about our coordinated entry process in DC. Um, in uh, the uh, district, it's referred to as CAP, which is an acronym for Coordinated Assessment and Housing Placement. And I'm going to go through some of the key elements that we feel are successful, make our process successful to result in that to help it result in successful housing placements uh, in DC. Uh, so uh, the first element um, we're going to go into is our governance structure, also um, our outreach coordination in DC, as well as the CAP uh, coordinated assessment housing placement process, where we make referrals and match veterans to re housing resources, 
And then we're just going to go a little bit into our post match process with our warm handoff to our HUD bash housing team and how we operate here with that. Uh, next slide, please. So the governance structure in Washington, D.C. Um, is, is we have a, a committee called the Vets Now Committee, which is uh, made up of our local, uh, the, dis well, the local government district of Columbia, D.C. Interagency Council on Homelessness, as well as uh, VA representatives, the D.C. Uh, Continuum of Care a representative from Community Solutions and SSVF are part of the leadership structure of that committee. Uh, that committee basically um, is charged with establishing policies and procedures as it pertains to our uh, CAP process, our matching housing matching process. Um, the committee also is tasked with deciding on system level goals, aims, reviews our progress towards our housing placement goals. Uh, the committee also communicates about new initiatives, monitors goals. Uh, we problem solve system level challenges. We give updates on resources and capacity uh, for um, for HUD bash and for other uh, local PSH and SSVF resources. Um, uh, they disseminate. We disseminate updates on the non veteran system review aggregate data, and we also review and discuss trends reflected in the data. So that's a monthly meeting um, that uh, that is the. Um, takes place the vets now committee that includes all the really um, important stakeholders in the veterans uh, homeless provider community in DC. Next slide please. So, the other uh, key element we are going to dive into a little more is our outreach work group and assignments. We really believe that any successful housing uh, placement begins with quality outreach. Um, for veterans who are particularly those who are unsheltered or staying in the low barrier shelters um, in DC uh, who are disconnected from services. Um, we, we really have been working to uh, uh, put together a strong and coordinated outreach uh, process and program in DC so that it's not just operating in a silo, that we have the different outreach providers connecting, meeting, identifying veterans, ensuring that those veterans are placed on the by name list and then eventually matched to housing. So we work um, the first um, task of our outreach, uh, our outreach team is to ensure that any veteran who, who identifies as a veteran who experiences homeless in DC is immediately, um, we receive, the, the VA receives their information and we complete eligibility checks to determine which resource uh, with either within the VA continuum or outside they might be eligible for as a veteran. So we ensure that every single veteran on the by name list has their eligibility determined prior to meeting to uh, review matches to resources. That way it eliminates barriers and the back and forth that can ensue when you're trying to figure out, well, this veteran has an OTH, what's the court martial, what's this veteran eligible for? We have that, we try to have that all figured out um, in advance of, of meeting to make these matches to housing. Um, the other goal of outreach, um, like we said, is um, to identify veterans, um, move them from the identification phase of the process to connection to housing. Um, and we, um, our outreach, um, our outreach program is assigned uh, veterans directly from the by name list. That way, we can avoid duplication of services with our fellow outreach providers in the community. Um, and uh, we meet monthly to track our progress. We keep a shared spreadsheet to ensure that we're communicating, and it really helps to avoid delays in matching um, veterans to resources because we know ahead of time what the veterans preferences and needs are. Um, and we don't have to um, always, you know, say, well, let's, let's first meet with the veteran and then get back uh, to figure out the match. So that's, um, that's our outreach program. Next slide. Thank you. Um, so then our other uh, key element we feel is our uh, coordinated assessment, the actual cap process. Um, and we, uh, through our cap process, we, we um, pretty much um, we work to uh, cover all the essential um, elements for a, a coordinated entry system that are recommended. Um, we have a shared assessment tool that we use. Our VA uh, participates um, in HMIS. We have a read and entry um, credentials uh, for HMIS access. 
Um, we have an active registry in DC, a by name list that is um, primarily managed by the COC. However, the VA works closely with the COC on the management of the by name list. And uh, that list includes all veterans that have been experiencing homelessness over the past uh, week in the district. Next slide, please. Okay. And so, in terms of our CAT meetings, uh, the CAT meetings take place on um, a biweekly basis. Um, they, uh, during those meetings, we match veterans to housing resources, including VASH, SSVF, Community Permanent Support Housing. The VA takes a very active role in the meeting. Um, we provide information about VHA eligibility, like we, um, like I mentioned, any kind of collateral information that might be helpful to the success of, of the referral. If, um, if we have complex veterans that need to um, a lengthier discussion for strategies for engagement, we, um, we create a space offline to discuss those veterans. Um, then also as part of our CAP process, we um, have a prioritization that is agreed upon by the community and that is um, reviewed annually in terms of how we prioritize the veterans for uh, BASH resources. Uh, the district, uh, the VA, the Washington DC VAMC also, we uh, dedicate 100% of our um, VASH resources to the coordinated entry process. Um, so we, we, those, those VASH referrals are made through the CAP process. Um, and we also have a case conferencing process in place. So if, if there's a situation, there are many situations that don't fall neatly into um, the, 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 the process, uh, this, the, our case conferencing process ensures that those veterans can still be reviewed. For example, a veteran that may not use mainstream homeless services, but um, engages with the VA exclusively, um, we have a process to ensure or veterans who are interested in porting in from other areas or re-experiencing homelessness from other areas of the country, uh, we do have a process to ensure that those veterans also are reviewed. The next slide, please. So our post match process, um, this is a process that involves our, um, our um, outreach and coordinated entry team, ensuring that the HUD bash housing team is provided with all of the necessary information that they need in order to successfully engage and house the veteran that is referred to them. So we ensure um, through that process, um, our outreach team works closely with our HUD bash housing team to ensure that all the information that they need with points of contacts, the whereabouts of the veteran, um, any other pertinent information um, are provided to them and that um, our outreach team remains available to assist with any type of warm handoff or support linkage to ensure that um, that referral that goes from the coordinated entry process to the HUD bash team is a smooth process and that the HUD bash team um, doesn't to eliminate any issues that they might have in locating or engaging the veterans that are referred. Next slide, please. Okay, now I'm gonna actually pass it off to my colleague, Christopher Lewis. He's the team lead for the HUD bash housing team and he's gonna talk a little bit about his program. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for um, allowing us to present on our um, housing team model for the DC um, Washington VA, VAMC um, homeless programs. So um, in the spring of 2022, we implemented a new housing team um, to really focus on the first phase of housing navigation for all veterans who've been matched to, um, to bash permanent supportive housing. Um, so the team is comprised, um, the core team is um, comprised of four social workers, HUD bash, um, LICSW social workers, uh, the team lead myself, Christopher Lewis. Um, we also have a housing specialist who helps with um, completing um, housing applications, unit searching, landlord engagement, and some other duties as well that um, are under his purview. Um, we also have ancillary team members. Um, so we have Alana, um, who you've already met, who's our coordinated entry specialist. Um, and she also has a dual role as a liaison to our um, District of Columbia Housing Authority. We also have two other team members, um, ancillary team members who function as DCHA uh, Housing Authority liaisons as well. So um, our goal primarily is really to transition unhoused veterans to, to permanent supportive housing as quick as possible. So once we receive the matches um, from the CAP um, process, 
we quickly engage and, and provide um, the clinical intensive case management services and supports for the veterans in regards to any of their medical or behavioral health needs. And then we're also providing housing navigation um, services and supports um, from the beginning of the application phase all the way through successful lease up and move in. At that point in time, when they do um, lease up and move into their apartment, they are then transitioned through a warm handoff um, process to one of our longer term case management teams. So we have three teams that provide medium to long term case management for um, all of the house veterans that we um, had previously worked with on our team to get them housed. Um, so one of the things we're doing that's that's unique is we're providing tools and resources to help prepare the veterans to maintain their housing after moving. Um, so we do this by, we have a very comprehensive orientation um, process where we go over sort of all the HUD bash rules and requirements right up front. Um, we also provide housing readiness skills and groups, uh, skill groups, I'm sorry, um, and education. So those groups have topics such as finances, debt management, credit recovery. We have um, representatives from VA benefits come um, to help veterans um, kind of navigate the benefits process as well. Um, next slide, please. And so another key element is our community collaboration strategy. So part of that is um, really um, as soon as possible sharing the case management assignments with the community stakeholders that are already involved in working with the veteran um, to facilitate team collaboration. That also helps, um, that partnership helps with getting documents collected in a timely manner so that we can get their applications completed as soon as possible and forwarded over to the housing authority. Um, and we're also coordinating with local social service providers. Um, that might be the Department, DC Department of Human Services and any other community-based programs, shelters, outreach teams, and other stakeholders involved with the veteran. Next slide, please. So um, we also have um, a pretty close collaboration with our public housing authority, the DC um, Housing Authority. So we, we track all of the referrals from the time of the HCVP um, application submission all the way through lease up move-in. So we have our own um, sort of data internal, I'm sorry, internal data management system. So we're tracking progress as, as the veterans basically move through the PH process. So we're, we're meeting with them on a biweekly meeting. Uh, we have a case review meeting with the public housing authority. So in that forum, we look at um, the status of RFTA, uh, request for tenancy approval packets that have been submitted to the housing authority um, and just sort of seeing where they're at in the um, process in terms of are they still pending review? Have they been moved over to determining rent? Are we scheduling inspections? Um, and then processing and expediting the lease ups. And in that meeting, we're also identifying barriers that might be um, delaying the process. So it's a really good opportunity for us to meet with our um, PHA partner bi-weekly to sort of troubleshoot the cases that are in the pipeline um, of the housing process. Um, as I mentioned, we troubleshoot complex cases. We also have a, um, an FAQ document that provides guidance to our internal bash team, as well as um, landlords, um, prospective landlords, and the PHA on the lease up process. Next slide, please. Another key strategy, um, strategies that we've been utilizing to, to more effectively house veterans um, in Washington, DC is uh, we have a housing specialist on our team um, and he's been really diligent about uh, compiling and maintaining a resource list of existing and new landlords. Um, so he's out pretty much on a weekly basis trying to engage um, new property owners to see if they're interested in renting um, units to veterans. Um, so that's part of his outreach um, uh, tasks as, as a housing specialist. We also provide a lot of landlord education and technical assistance support um, to the landlords. Um, and so that's not just solely done by the housing specialist. The rest of the team is pretty knowledgeable on the housing process. So we're working, you know, pretty closely with, with all of the landlords um, to provide them with, with technical assistance on just helping with the lease up process. Another um, good thing to note in DC, the, 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 the FMR, I'm sorry, the, the HCVP um, is set at 175% of fair market rent. Um, with a proposal to increase it to 189%. That's a really um, significant enticement for a lot of landlords um, 
to want to rent to veterans who have vouchers. So typically we're getting calls week to week from various property owners who are inquiring about, you know, do we have veterans who, who need one bedroom units, two bedroom units and so forth. So um, the fact that um, the voucher pays at 175% of FMR is, is a really huge um, incentive. And we do have some additional plans um, this fall to get some additional housing navigators through an SSVF um, grant that was awarded um, to three of our um, SSVF providers. So we're hoping for our DC team that we get two to three housing navigators to provide additional landlord engagement support as well as housing navigation support. Next slide. I believe um, Sharon Haddock's gonna present this slide. Yes, I am. Thank you, Chris. So um, as far as um, serving our um, special populations um, that we have, um, Specifically, uh, we have pathways to housing. They manage 75% of, excuse me, 75 of our uh, DC vouchers. Um, we, this is, we contract with pathways to housing and they provide services and, and support and case management to veterans with severe and persistent mental illness. Um, and they uh, act as a, basically an ACT team. Um, we also have our project-based units uh, for our elderly and med uh, medically vulnerable veterans, is, uh, 60 units um, that we have, and that's John, um, uh, John and Jill Kerr uh, Conway residents. And then we have the district um, housing resources, as we mentioned before, uh, Walter Reed has a project-based unit for non-VASH eligible and high acuity veterans. Uh, we have Abrams Hall, which is assisted living for chronically homeless uh, veterans. Um, they have veterans as well as non-veterans there are singles. And then we have Findle Heights, uh, which is a project-based unit for veterans and families. Next slide. So we come to our lessons learned. Um, as far as lessons learned, um, for the coordinated entry and outreach is is definitely dedicating our bash resources to the coordinated entry process. Um, and as Alana said, we dedicate 100%. Uh, we found it very effective to um, put our resources on the table. Also, that uh, helps to bring the community partners um, to put, bring their resources to the table so all of us can uh, together work to help veterans. Um, that has served us very well when we have not had vouchers available. Uh, for whatever reason, um, the, the community has um, used resources to help um, house, continue to house veterans. Um, so that has been very effective for us. Uh, definitely being transparent um, about um, the process, the, our processes at the VA um, with our partners and stakeholders. Um, shared use of the HMIS system has been, been very helpful with locating veterans or uh, keeping a um, communicating between um, agencies on, on who's doing what with the veteran and how we can both help and collaborate. Um, use of outreach to help with successfully identifying and engaging veterans, that has been very, very helpful for us because we can't do it alone. Um, so as Alana indicated that we, you know, we team up every, um, every week or every other week and decide where, um, each team and agency is going to go to do outreach. Um, need for team-based approach for the high acuity veterans. Um, more and more, we are see, definitely seeing a very uh, veterans, our veteran populations getting older and um, we're definitely seeing more high acuity veterans. So to have a team that focuses um, directly on that has been very helpful with us, uh, for us. Um, the use of the GPD and our SIRS um, programs, um, and our local um, hotel programs um, to get veterans off the street quicker um, so that we can concentrate on working with them, um, alleviating the, the problem of not being able to find the homeless veteran um, to continue to engage them. So those programs have been very helpful. Um, as far as hud -Bash lessons learned, implementation of a dedicated housing team has been very, uh, very, very successful for us. Um, um, having a team that's just dedicated to the veterans who are unhoused and working with them to get them housed. Um, regular PHA meetings and reviews of the lease up um, process. 
Um, that has been very helpful, especially with our DC Housing Authority, which is our biggest um, housing authority that we deal with um, because of the ever changing leadership there. And um, it helps us review the process um, that we have in place. Um, and it helps for um, development process improvement, helps with communication. Um, if there's backup in certain places, um, inspections or, or eligibility, you know, those meetings serve um, as a catalyst for us to be able to talk about that and decide how we move, for, uh, um, how we move uh, forward, as well as getting buy-in from, um, from the PHAs um, for this program. Dedicated PHA points of contact, um, as uh, Chris indicated, we have dedicated uh, liaisons that directly deal with portions of the Housing Authority eligibility inspections. Um, and that has been very helpful um, to our program to have those point of contacts. You don't have 10, you know, 20, 30 people contacting one person. They know that person's name um, and, and are familiar with that. So if they see an email come through, you know, they know that is from this person at the VA and they answer it. So it builds um, definitely rapport and camaraderie between the two agencies. Um, and our continued collaboration with all the programs and the community service providers has been very helpful. Um, having a variety of housing types, uh, one size doesn't fit all. Um, so definitely having the project based in those other um, housing resources that we listed before has been very helpful um, in, in housing our veterans. Um, ensuring that there's, um, um, the housing navigation uh, process uh, within the BASH team has also been very helpful. That's uh, where um, a lot of times veterans get stuck after receiving their voucher or waiting for their voucher is where do I go? Who do I go to? And so having those housing navigate, navigation services and support has been very helpful. Uh, next slide. And our challenges. Uh, some of our challenges that we continue to deal with is staffing and hire, hiring delays. Um, you know, we have definitely enlisted the assistance of our SSVF programs um, to assist us when we've had um, hiring issues, um, getting people on board. Uh, they have assisted us with housing navigation uh, and some light case management when we've needed that. So that's been very uh, helpful to get through that challenge. Um, Managing the um, homeless inflow volume uh, that has been um, it's been in creeping back up, um, you know, lately the inflow um, and for different reasons. But uh, so trying to manage the inflow and figure out how to how to uh, move forward with that. Um, the complex of needs of the veterans as well, um, like I indicated before, the high acuity of the veterans, we continue to see that and insu insufficient uh, specialized housing for veterans. Um, as I indicated, the veterans are getting older, so their needs are more complex. Um, some veterans just are homeless, but just can't live alone. Uh, and some of the services that we could provide in the home, uh, such as the waiver program where they could get AIDS, uh, you know, to help them, those programs take a long time for veterans to get uh, up approved for, so that slows the process down. So definitely looking at other uh, specialized housing options for veterans who may not be able to live alone uh, or, or getting um, older uh, and it's just not feasible to live by themselves. Um, and PHA related issues, um, as we indicated before, um, sometimes there's delays for whatever reason with the the housing authorities and, and those are things that sometimes we can't, we have to just wait for those um, for those processes to go through. But as we indicated before, meeting with them on a regular basis to so we are aware of that and keeping those communication, uh, th those lines of communication open has been um, uh, helpful for, for us, but sometimes uh, there are delays that uh, it's just no way around, uh, especially with inspections or eligibility or just the application itself. Uh, and inconsistent communication at times, as I indicated, sometimes there's a change, it, there's a shift in management or leadership or, or people leave and, and the inconsistent communication uh, has been a challenge at times. Um, and then also the lack of um, clarity of 
the housing policies and procedures uh, at the uh, PHA. And as I indicated, we uh, have tried to resolve that by continuing to keep an open line of communication, our liaisons, um, meeting with them biweekly um, to kind of navigate some of those challenges. Next slide. And that concludes our presentation. Um, if we are open for questions, if there are any. Hi, Mr. Josh. Thank you again for agreeing to present to us. Really wonderful, and uh, congratulations on reducing the number of people in the and over a relatively short period of time. See that. A um, couple of questions about your system. Um, this is kind of a nebulous question, but maybe you can answer. How much do you think the community solution as a partner in this process has been influential in creating? I'm sorry, it's very hard to hear what the question is. I don't know if it's just me, but I can't, I did not hear the question. It's a little bit muffled for me as well. Yes. Can you hear this now? Yes. That's that better. is better. Yeah. The question was how much do you think community solutions being a partner in this process has helped to move things forward? That was one question. And the second question is, how do you decide who goes to the app level care? What are the clinical criteria that gets you to refer someone out of the usual strategy to uh, pathways to housing? Um, I think, um, I mean, commu yeah, community solutions has been um, a really helpful process uh, partner um, throughout this. They've been really helpful especially to the um the local coc they provide a lot of uh, technical assistance and guidance with our district coc um, and we also have a representative on our leadership committee um uh, through the vets now committee um with community solutions uh, so we have a consistent uh, person who who's involved. So I think it they have been a very a very helpful helpful partner and you know a person at the entity at the table, um, just in kind of keeping especially the COC helping keep the COC um, engaged and focused in the data and and um, and the process where they're at. You know, Sharon, what are, were your thoughts as well? No, I was going to say the same thing. I think also um, helping us. Um, that's now um, setting those goals and those procedures and things um, to, to help us be successful um, has been very helpful. Yeah, and as far as um, for pathways, um, the process of identifying veterans is also, is we have a few different ways of identifying veterans for the higher level services. One way we identify veterans for pathways is to look at veterans who have previously been housed with HUD-VASH but are re-experiencing homelessness and might need a more intensive level of case management support um, in order to be successful and maintain housing um, when we try again with them. So we target that population. Um, pathways has their own criteria also where the veteran has to have a severe um, and persistent mental illness in order to be eligible. So they also have their own specific criteria that, you know, in their contract that they have to follow. But in terms of the subpopulation, that's one segment of the population we look at. And then Chris's team will also look at the veterans who are currently working with the housing team um, to uh, give feedback on if any of those veterans might need a step up in, in care um, since they have already um, gotten to know some of the veterans and are working with them. So they give feedback on, on that population. And then sometimes we'll identify veterans just directly from the by name list um, through our CAP process based on the criteria that Pathways, um, Pathways has for veterans with uh, severe mental illness. And it's some, um, you know, and their need for more intensive level, a uh, team level support. That's great. Thank you very much. Sure. Nancy Allman for the record. Can you hear me okay? 
No, it's muffled. How about now? Is that better? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, so I have a question with uh, with respect to a couple of the things that you had mentioned in the presentation. Um, could you talk a little bit more about the 175% FMR, the fair market uh, rent versus, for example, what, what the cap might be? Uh, for your locality, because there's a distinction, right, between fair market rent and the maximum allowable rent payment under Section 8. So you're asking, I, I, I heard part of it about the 175%, but I didn't, I didn't hear the rest. I'm sorry. Could you explain, for example, when you say that you are offering 175% of fair market rent, what that's, um, what that means? Oh, Chris, do you want to take that one? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's just basically, um, I think because DC, the cost of living is very high and um, they're trying to have, um, to make efforts to have, you know, DC residents be able to still live in affordable housing within the District of Columbia boundaries. So they set the, the rate, the voucher limit rate um, <clears throat> at a higher percentage of FMR, just so that we could compete with market rate tenants for units in DC. Um, so typically what we're finding is a lot of people it's 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 in, are incentivized to want to rent to voucher holders, whether they're through the housing choice voucher program or through the local rental subsidy program, which is um, that subsidized rent is funded by DC government from local dollars. So um, the 175 percent is, I think, strategically is, is set higher so that you know it's attractive for property owners to rent to um, to people with Section 8 vouchers. Does that make sense? That something that you've done working in conjunction with the District of Columbia. No, I think this was. Yeah. I think this was through HUD. I believe oh. that for specifically right. for the special purpose voucher. I think for HUD Bash. My. I think this was a HUD HUD um, that PHAs could apply through HUD for this option of um, receiving additional funding to be able to pay that that rental amount. That's why I understand. Because like, like DC, Los Angeles is expensive. And, you know, my understanding, and, and you know, I'm not a services expert, um, is that out here in LA, we're not able to exceed uh, fair market rent. I, I could be wrong. Okay. Thanks for the verification. I, I, I don't know these things. And why I'm asking. So are the vouchers there set? What percentage of fair market rent are they set at in Los Angeles? Is it 100%? So, to be clear, two years ago, FMR, I'm sorry, we can't hear you guys. Yeah, we can't hear you. I'm sorry. We're not at 175. I'm sorry, we're still having some audio problems, I think, on our end. Yes. So, our, can you hear me now? Yes, that's better. That's better. So, a few years ago, Secretary of the VA. We're still not able to hear. Yeah, clearly. we're not here, able to hear yeah. you now. Yeah. Okay. Well, we can we can have an internal conversation about that. So, whoever's speaking now, we can hear you fine. <laughs> uh, yeah. 
at the very least, it sounds like LA can maybe catch up to DC in that regard. The second question I wanted to ask is with the landlord engagement. Can you hear that? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Could you explain a little bit more about how your medical center works with landlords in terms of, again, I think we're both in, you know, an area where rents are at a premium. And so maybe you can share some um, lessons learned in terms of dealing with, with landlords to make sure that, you know, there's more landlords participating in, in the program. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll let Chris um, speak to that, but I know in the past, I mean, since I've been here, we really have not had a lot of issues with um, landlords. Con we are, we're always getting calls from landlords wanting to rent to veterans. Um, we are, PHA has been very good about having landlord days um, where, you know, the landlords who have signed up uh, to be landlords for housing choice or take housing choice vouchers can um, pair up with um, veterans. Uh, they usually have the uh, the um, landlord. They usually will pre inspect the, the uh, landlord's property. So if veterans are um, are interested, they can um, go view the the um, the property, come back, and they can lease up that day. So we've had multiple of those types of events. Um, you know, to um, to engage landlords in the community, but that really has not been an issue. I know once we have uh, uh, established a a, um, a landlord who are who are, who have been very good at taking veterans, or you know, they may have a multi unit um, complex and they're willing to take veterans. And if we find out that they, you know, a very good partner, we definitely try to make you know go the extra mile if there's any. Uh, issues we try to jump on it right away they know they can call the case managers um the supervisors and we you know try to address those situations right then and there um because we definitely want to make sure that we you know um keep the landlord happy and uh, keep the veteran placed where they are um, um so that, those are some of the things that we've we've you know been doing here in dc um i don't know if um um, I think our um, housing specialist has been really good, um, you know, about, um, you know, seeking out other landlords. And I think that that's a good um, a position to have as someone who can directly kind of focus on those type things of, of bringing landlords into the fold uh, who are who are interested and willing to um, rent to veterans. Uh, Chris, do you have any other? Um, not necessarily in addition to what you um spoke about but i mean he is really just um very aggressively going out and sort of marketing the hud bash program to um to some of these landlords there's a lot of um real estate development taking place in dc right now so there's new buildings going up seemingly all the time um and so they generally um are are interested in um having veterans as um tenants particularly um least up there. So um, that's been working really well. So once we find out about new properties that are that are coming online, we will have um, our housing specialists go out there and try and meet with their their leasing team, our other individual landlords, um, just letting them know about our program um, and encouraging them if they have available units to to reach out to us so that we can refer veterans um, potentially to their properties. Okay, thanks so much. Um, Can you hear me now there in Washington, D.C.? Faintly, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> I have a few questions for you. What, what is the assessment tool that you use? You mentioned that you have a joint assessment tool with the VA. Which assessment tool is that? SPDAT. The yes. Yeah. Although I will say that we don't really need to use it. We when we, when we first started coordinated entry, we we really used it as a definitive, you know, 
method of identifying veterans. You know, you score over a certain amount and you go to HUD VASH, you score under a certain amount, you go to rapid rehousing. But over time, um, you know, we found that it's we really it's that's really changed. Um, and we really don't use the assessment as as the be all end all of of making those decisions. We we try um, we really break we our prioritization process um, breaks it down more by um, length of time homeless um, versus the VI spadat and the uh, more chronic veterans are prioritized over non-chronic um, and then our case conferencing process also gets folded into that as well for veterans who are submitted to be case conferenced. So we really, we do use the VI SPDAT, but we don't rely on it as we used to. We, we, we generally only use it now as, as, as a tiebreaker. If we have a certain number of resources we could refer to that week and we have two veterans maybe competing for that one, and we will we we could use it for somewhat of a tiebreaker for that of who's the vulnerability, but we generally don't use it as much as as we used to. And our I think our goal is to eventually move away from that particular tool. I applaud you for the evolution of what you're doing in that regard. Because as you probably know, the VI Spadat has all manner of difficulties with it. Mm -hmm. Both women. Geography, racial. So I have yeah. moving away from it. So I have a few more questions. Um, when you say that you move the FASH resources and they're into the coordinated assessment, what, what resources are those? Are they, are they the service doctors that come? Um, I'm sorry, we lost yeah, your question. We lost Can you. you repeat it again? So sorry. Maybe this will be better. In in your document and in your presentation, you mentioned that moved Bash resources. You had control over Bash resources, and they were moved to the coordinated assessment system. Is that right? That we dedicate those resources, 100%. yeah, to that that process. Yeah, so we're not we're not making referrals outside of that of that process. It's a shared process. So the VASH resources that you're alluding to, are they the service dollars that are available to support VASH tendencies? Or is it broader than that? No, it's actually just the HUD VASH vouchers. So we're, and, and correct me, um, Alana. So what we're saying is that we um, we don't make any matches to HUD VASH outside of the coordinated entry system. So that's what we mean when we mean when we're saying 100% of the of our VASH resources. We're just talking about um, the actual voucher um, matching system is what we're we're talking about matching veterans to vouchers. So we'll say this week we uh, are able to match 10 veterans um, to a VASH voucher, and so we go down the list and talk about and cap which veterans have come up on the by name list for that week, and we can match those to, to VASH. So we don't make a uh, prior, we used to make, um, we would say if we had, if we were able to make 10 VASH uh, matches, we would maybe take five to cap and then the other five offline or whatever. Um, but now we take everything, we do everything within the coordinated entry system. If that makes in the Makes sense and answers your question. Who does the case management? Oh, there's still it's still HUD VASH. They're not just it's not just the voucher. It's the VA. It's it's the VA provides the case management and the voucher. It's comes through HUD. So it's 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 still a HUD VASH. It's through the HUD VASH program. Those 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 resources. Right. So we're just saying that we take. Um, we, we give 100% of our vouchers um, to the coordinated entry system. So veterans are matched off the by name list. And then once we've matched them in CAP, then they go to the housing team for them to um, work with them. So they'll get a case manager, they'll house them from there. Right. Thank you. Do you, do you have any idea of what your recidivism rate is at VASH housing? 
I mean, we could probably get, we could get that data to you. Yeah, I don't I know don't if we have it. I don't know if you know, Chris, I don't. No, I don't know off the top of my head, unfortunately. Presented in terms of the general decrease that you uh, comprehend by is it is that all based on pit tabs? So in the pit, so in terms of looking at at how many veterans are on the the by name list, we we have well we use the pit data, but we also use the by name list data, and our by name list data and our pit count data are pretty much in line with with one another typically there's there's some variance but for the most part you know are they're pretty much in in sync um so we we do rely on both for for the for our data though referring to the general decrease that uh is indicated the 47 percent decrease i think is that based on pit count data Oh, no, that that's through our, our by name list, but we have also seen um, a decrease in our pit count data as well. Um, I, I can't tell you exactly the percentage, but um, cumulative, but yeah, there has also, I think the decrease in our pit count data has pretty closely mirrored the decrease in our by name list data. But we typically go through by our by name list. Yeah, we, we find it to be more more reliable um, for the most part than our pit data because the pit is count is only one day That's where right. our by name list is continuous. So one final question. I know that your data indicates that from 2017 to 2022, you went from 441 to 262, but then you have an asterisk and you say that uh, inflow is trending upward. So is 262 your current number? No, we're about at 280 right now, I, uh, roughly about, about 280 um, currently, but it, it, it fluctuates month, month to month. Sure. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, Josh Bamberger for the record. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Um, Chris, quick question for you. If a veteran is living in a shelter, say down by Capitol Hill, and states that he wants to live in an apartment in Adams Morgan, what do you do? How do you make that work? So that the veteran's choice can end up with a person living where they want. I so mean, the veteran, have, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Kurt, no, Chris, you're you're the best person to answer this. Sorry, go ahead. Well, you're outreach, so <laughs> maybe <laughs> you're living in the camp. I mean, that's that's your that's your um, territory. Uh, yeah, but I think I think the question is more like if there's a veteran who wants to live in a more like a, a high uh, cost com neighborhood. How yeah, do we yeah. handle that? Not so much that. Not yeah, so much I mean, cost as it is, just how do you respond to choice? One of the things that, that we've heard oh. a lot here in LA is that because veterans choose their neighborhoods or apartments that aren't easily available, then it's hard to house them. And I'm wondering if you could just talk about your successes in listening to veterans and providing them with the housing that they desire. I mean, I think as an outreach person, if you, you wouldn't want to dismiss them you know, their choice if if I think that that's giving you some pretty valuable information if they know right off the bat where they want to be. Um, I think that it it just you want to that helps you engage the veteran and hear more about their pref you know, his or her, you know, preferences. Um, so that whether that's going to end up being a realistic goal of it remains to be seen. But I think it, it just in terms of speaking to the initial engagement for the veteran, you you wouldn't want to um, dismiss that as an option. And to be honest, we 
we it it, it could very well be an option um, here in DC. Um, you know, uh, you know, veterans. We, I mean, Chris could speak to this more. Veterans frequently will let his team know uh, where specifically they want to live, and um, they do their best to honor that choice. Yeah, we, we definitely have veterans who um, vocalize to us that, you know, they're interested in living in a particular neighborhood within the district or, you know, a, a section of the of the city, such as like Northwest DC or Northeast um, that have um, very desirable neighborhoods and apartments to live in. So we do try and, um, you know, honor that if, if, if it's feasible, um, obviously, you know, they're going to have a credit check take place. And, you know, if they have an eviction history, those are going to be potential challenges or barriers. Um, so we might have more flexibility with some landlords and, and other parts of the city that that um, may be in neighborhoods that they're not as interested in living in for one reason or another. But we definitely um, have at least several veterans up in um, very nice uh, neighborhoods within D.C. And very and nice that, properties. Go ahead. I'm sorry. And and. And we have had successes, as they're saying, but I would not strike that as not being a um, a barrier. Um, you know, we have had veterans who we've had to, you know, continue to just work with and and, you know, do, you know. We've had veterans who wanted to had bad credit um, and, you know, we would search out, do our best to try to work with um, landlords that we knew in the area or try to search out new landlords or talk to, you know, um, look at incentives um, for the landlord, um, you know, hey, there's case, you know, um, they, they have a voucher, it's going to be paid mostly by, um, you know, um, a HUD, as well as they'll have a case manager to make sure that they are, you know, um, to, to try to ensure that past issues will not be, um, you know, that they'll be able to pay the rent on time and things like that. But, you know, we've had veterans who have, you know, continue to apply at, you know, the application fee can get in the hundreds if you're, if you're not careful, um, you know, applying uh, to these different places and then know that, that, that they're going to be uh, declined. So then, they, then sometimes we have to have a talk with the veteran after we've exhausted issues and, and try to give them some other options, maybe nearby or saying, you know, let's work on your, let's, you know, let's look at some other options and then maybe we can get you in that um, after, you know, um, living in um, an area adjacent or closer um, after a year um, of, you know, paying your rent uh, on time, then we can get you in, um, you know, the area that you want to be in. So, um, we, we, yes, we've had a lot of successes in getting veterans in places, and we do definitely 100% um, listen to the veteran and try to get them where they want to be. But that can be an obstacle sometimes um, because of the competitive market here. Landlords do have a choice. Um, so we try our best to give them other incentives, um, you know, um, with the new um, SSVF NOVA that came out, that's some of the things that we're, we'll be able to do uh, with that navigation. Um, uh, housing navigation is, is to put up incentives for landlords. So that'll even be a little bit uh, more uh, resource that we'll have, but it, it, can, it has been a challenge and a barrier at times for us as well. Yeah, particularly with the credit checks and background checks. Mm -hmm. Or veterans who may have, um, you know, be on the sexual, sexual abuse um, registry or things like that. Those are some of the challenges that we do, you know, encounter. Um, but the team has worked really hard on trying to build uh, relationships with landlords who will probably, you know, will try to give a veteran a chance if they, you know, if we can. But sometimes we just can't find that. This is Deborah Carter. Um, wait, what? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? We're trying. Yes. <laughs> okay. This is Deborah Carter. Um, question about your access points for veteran coordinated injury in DC. How many access points do you have? And is one of them your CRRC? So, yeah, our, our CRC is, is definitely an access point. Um, uh, for coordinated entry, um, 
I couldn't tell you exactly how many we have because we have our shelter system in DC. Um, we, we have, I don't know, I'd say maybe about eight uh, that are under DHS. So I'd say like basically all of the low barrier shelters are access points. All of the day centers are access points. Um, so the outreach community in DC are access points, not, you know, the non veteran outreach community as well that we rely on a lot for referrals as well. They're access points. So I think um, pretty much any, because there's a very, in DC, there's a very large non veterans coordinated entry process. So, you know, the homeless uh, service providers in DC are very accustomed to utilizing the coordinated entry system. And when it's a veteran, they just go by the same process that they do for the singles, for the non veterans, but they just make sure to identify an HMIS that is that, you know, the person experiencing homelessness is a veteran. So I couldn't tell you an exact number of access points, but it would pretty much be, you know, I'd say who it, the, the, the or there's maybe two providers that are not access points and they are because they just have not opted into participating. Um, but other than that, I would say every other homeless service provider in DC is and as well as our CRRC. I mean, I could say almost that we probably have no wrong door. I mean, um, even if a veteran goes to the uh, VA Medical Center, we're located at the CRC, the homeless program. That's what we're based out of. And we answer all the homeless. So if a provider does, uh, they either will, if they have a homeless veteran, they will call the CRC. They will put it or put in a homeless consult and our homeless program, which is located at CRC, we answer those consults. So, and then process. Yeah. So um, I would really say. Um, there's really kind of no wrong door um, in, in which to access our uh, coordinated entry system. Ms. Marvin, Ms. Ada, thanks so much for, uh, for for this briefing. As you can tell by the questions, it was uh, very important for us and, and very useful for us as well. So we, we very much appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, so it's, it's lunch time. Uh, we started 1250 with the public comment. Do not be late for the public comment. That's Thank you. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. We'll start the afternoon session uh, with public comments. And uh, first on the agenda is Mr. Francisco Borges. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Mr. Warren is a fundamental piece of free. And uh, next is Mr. Tom. Yeah, yeah, this is Ryan. Can you guys hear me? Hello, hello. Okay. This is Ryan. Can you hear me? Hello, hello, hello. This is Ryan Thompson. Can you hear me? Okay, Mr. Tom. Okay, next is uh, Mr. Rob Brown. Hello? You don't hear Hello? Me Can you hear me? Hello? This is Ryan Thompson. Can you hear me? Ready? Hello? Just first, I could say uh, thankful to hear that there's some work no, being no. done on the income oh, limits. Fuck. I know that's been a big concern of mine and many others. We have veterans that have 100% disability and then also social security on top of that. And they definitely need, we need them to be able to get in. Um, I know some of them personally that don't even have access to their money. They have fiduciaries. Uh, so those are the ones that I think will benefit the most from being at the housing on the VA. 
And also, um, you know, I think this board needs to take into consideration with how the housing placement is going to go that we have a lot of veterans that have been waiting for this housing and been watching everything that's been happening since they were on San Vicente. They're still at CTRS. Um, they're constantly asking me about the housing. And I know a few of them personally that have already got HUD badge vouchers in the community. It didn't work out and now they're back at CTRS. And I think a lot of that has to do with going somewhere and not having a support network, you no know, vehicle being far away from where they get their services. Those are things that I would like to see the VA do to prioritize, look at people that have already had HUD badge vouchers in the community that didn't work, that do better in the community setting. Um, and I also, uh, I think it was good. Andrew Strain and Alan Train put together a meeting to get um, the veterans from CTRS to go through a tour of the, uh, of the buildings on the property. And I think there needs to be more of that, just informing all the different programs, new directions, the domiciliary, the staff there about what's going on, how the process is going to work, when the housing opens. Because I think that's been a big thing. There just hasn't been a lot of communication and everybody hasn't been on the same page of how things are going to work. Um, that said, I really want to make sure that we continue to keep the 24 hour emergency shelter access open. I know after the fire, there was a gap in that service for a little while, but that is very important when we have veterans show up, they need to get access as soon as they, as soon as they're asking for it. Um, I know just the other night I ran into an issue where a veteran showed up after, after hours and the drop in shelters were full and we had to stay in another veteran's vehicle. So I think these are things that we should be thinking about. Um, I know at one time they put some cots in the day room when the drop in shelters get full to accommodate any overflow. So I think that would be that would be good as well. I just don't want to see getting into a position where people are being turned away. Uh, that's the big thing when they show up and they need help, just try to make it happen right then and there. Also, um, it would help if, you know, we had an idea maybe on a weekly basis of how many beds are open in different programs, how many tiny homes are open, because a lot of times that I get contacted and I'll bring people down here and then, you know, program will be full or there's a wait list. So better communication on knowing what's available on any given day and what's available during the week would definitely help um, just sort of not bringing someone that's that going to get turned away. And, you know, I think just the big thing through all of this has been communication. There needs to be good communication between the VA advocates also with with the veterans on the property they really need to feel like they're heard i know a lot of times they don't feel like they're heard they don't feel like their concerns are addressed so anything that the va can do as a whole to get down there and spend time speaking with them see what it is that they're going to need what they're going to want and what's going to work best for them i think that that will really help um will help the veterans a lot and it's really important uh, their voices matter and i you know for a long time i feel like the homeless veterans voices have been drowned out and that can't happen you need to start listening and, and take into consideration what it is that's going to set them up best for success, however we can make things work for them. And well, we go, when we go forward right before we get to housing, um, I really want to make sure that some of the, the veterans over at CTRS get an opportunity for that. I know several of them, that even if you took them and put them into a voucher somewhere else, they will just come back. And it's they've been homeless for a long time. They've gone through this. so. It's really important that they get the opportunity to get into those housing units when they open and, and uh, we set them up for success. A lot of them have been together now for years and they have a strong bond with one another. And I know I truly really believe that if they have the opportunity to move together into a situation like that, that it would be in the best, uh, it would be best for them. It would work out well for them. And these are the types of things I want to see happen. I know that you guys are going through on this, this by name list. Um, but if we have veterans here on the property that want housing, let's just let's just give them the housing through our community. I think that makes uh, most sense to a lot of us. Um, they're already here. They need it. They want it. Let's get them in and make sure that they get get what they need. And we also need to uh, get this. Um, sorry, I'm going over time here. We need to see what we can do to expedite the housing construction timeline. Um, I know I've said that before, but anything we can do to get the housing done and get it done faster. And also the VA work on their messaging to assure everyone and all the veterans that you're here and you're committed to get the house built, that you're here and you're committed to return this property to the way it's intended to be a sold or sold. Thank you. Hello, this is Ryan Thompson. You you skipped me? Yeah, okay. Uh, can you hear? 
you guys just muted me. Why can't I speak? Okay, Mr. Why do you guys can, uh, hear us? We're ready for you. Uh, we'll start the timing when you start. Okay, great. <sighs> so, I'm starting now. I, I want to talk about Mr. Thompson, some are money. You there? Yes, I am. I am here. Can you hear me? I am here. I am here. I am here. Can you hear me? Hello. 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 Can you hear me? Why do you guys keep muting me? Hello. Hello. Why am I being censored? Can you hear us? I can hear you now. Are you still there? Hello? Ryan, I, can't, I can hear you on the uh, online version, but I think they're having connectivity issues in person. Okay. Was that with everybody or just with me? I Well, the other people have been in person, so I think they just aren't able to hear you talking to them. But I just sent a text to Chi and hopefully they'll be able to get it worked out. I just came to take the meeting uh, virtually the second half. So I just wanted you to know I can hear you, but I don't think they can hear you. Okay, well, well, there, 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 you. What was that? Okay. So we can hear you. Oh, you can hear me. Well, so yeah. Ryan's talking. He called into the meeting, but you guys can't hear him, I guess. And he was on before Rob went, but he keeps saying hello, hello. And I guess you guys, you can't hear him. We do not hear him. Yeah. So Ryan, they can't hear you for some reason, but it looks like he's a call in user. So maybe on your WebEx, there's like a block on the call in people. Because I'm using a computer, I logged in through the WebEx app, but it looks like Ryan, Ryan, you called in, right? And I just got muted again. I had to take there myself back off mute. Are, are, you can hear me now? Ryan, try again. It looks like uh, there's been a change. You're off mute. Perhaps. Okay, are Ryan, we all good now? can you hear Ryan? No. Hello, hello, Still testing one, two, three. Ryan. Okay, so can you use your speaker phones so because they can hear you? So can you just put on speakers so they can hear me talk to your speaker phone? Is that possible? Or well, I I'm at I'm also online at home. I had to I'm taking the second half of the meeting not from the VA. So let me try yeah. to figure out how I can make this work. Let me see if maybe I can call someone who's there who can. Um, yeah, I mean, this, this, it, I got to find a way to do this because the WebEx didn't yeah. work for me last time. You know, the I get arrested if I show up there and sit in a seat. Yeah, uh, Ryan. I try to dial on the phone now. They can't hear me. Ryan, hold yep. on one second. Let me let me try to figure yeah. it out. He's going to call me, okay? Yep. Okay, we will. Uh, um, no, you got me on mute. I'll have to do, I'm going to put it on speaker in my phone. Just, just a second. Ryan, try to say something and see if they can hear you through my cell phone that I'm holding to the computer. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. We have you now. Thanks. Testing. Did you say you heard me? Yes. 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 Okay, does that mean I can proceed? Uh, yes, let's give it a try. Okay, so you acknowledge that you can hear me then? The, the audio is fine? Yes. Okay, I'm going to start talking now. Uh, all right, so the annual, the annual budget for the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs is $338 billion, $730 million. The West LAVA Soldiers Home's annual budget is well over $1.1 billion. Since 2010 or 11, Congress has appropriated over $500 million for the West LAVA Soldiers Home construction, including housing for veterans. Uh, so now let's look at all this money and then let's think, okay, so we got at the most, right, $400 million of that $1.1 billion a year going to the hospital, the medical center. What's left? 
you know, wh yeah. what exactly are the expenses that remain? And then amid all of this money, we're supposed to believe that the few million bucks that UCLA and Brentwood School pays is desperately needed. And of course, and of course pursuant to HR 711, I guess that's desperately needed for them to maintain their own buildings. And they're taking up all that land in the nation's capital of veteran homelessness, while homeless veterans are sitting in flammable plastic sheds and God forbid one of them tries to charge up a, a scooter in an outlet and a fire starts, he gets evicted into homelessness. It's blamed on him. It's not blamed on the fact that it's a suppressed fact that Village for Vets and Brentwood School have control of that land through their revocable licenses, right? And that they never thought about putting fire hydrants there or thinking about the materials, they never thought, hmm, maybe it's a bad idea to take oil-based paint and paint all these sheds, even though no one asked us to. This is utter insanity. So now let's talk about the housing, right? So in 2015, after a two-year construction period, VA renovated Building 209 for under $30 million, and they filled it with homeless veterans, they didn't have to wait to get vouchers and disability and income, become patients, become pharma lab rats. It, you know, they, they didn't have to feel like they're losing their minds paying at least $1,600 a month to rent a studio apartment that VA renovated in a building VA built on land that is deed restricted for only the federal government to permanently maintain as a home for disabled and unemployed veterans. And that's without laundry, that building 209, to Shangri-La, Step Up, Vivian Ming Lee, and a bunch of other crooks who make a monthly lease payment on that building, the VA, $1,650, about the price of a studio unit. And not only does that cartel sit there and collect all those rents and get their tenants provided for them for nothing, receive tens of millions of dollars for case management that, I mean, the only case management I've seen is them filing lawsuits and trying to evict people that talk to the press about the slum that they're running over there. And as if that's not enough, they then subversively and fraudulently filed in December of 2021 with the state of California under their new company that's the, all the same people basically except for Vivian Ming Lung, uh, Friendship for Affordable Housing. They said they, they're filing for $20 million from state taxpayers saying that they want to renovate a quote-unquote empty office building, Building 209. That's a criminal fraud. They are criminals. And then not only that, I, I mean, they sit there, they do practically nothing. I mean, does Rebecca Ritchie cost $35 million every five years? Because that's about how much Step Up's received in grants to do case management. But, you know, and then what happens, right? So, so what happens for, for all this work that they don't do? They get rewarded with buildings 205 and 208. And then you get another cartel, the West LA Veterans Collective, with Thomas Saffron and a bunch of uh, uh, Century Housing and uh, Housing Corporation of America and U.S. Vet. And then they start taking 207. And even though VA spent $30 million and did a two-year construction job on 209, that was fantastic, as, just, as, the, as the federal government has done a fantastic job building stuff there for 157 years, these people have not renovated a single solitary studio unit of housing for veterans ever in the soldiers' homes' 157-year history. Yet they took between buildings 207, 205, and 208, what, about $200 million in homeless okay, housing subsidies out. from the state, the city, and the county? This is incredible. And, and let's, now, let's now go back to veterans, right? You got all this money flowing around. They built nothing. Where's all the money the VA has in their budget? And then you've got two or three food preparation facilities, industrial strength food preparation facilities at the West Los Angeles VA Soldiers Home. Suddenly they stop making hot meals for veterans there. They start making hundreds to thousands of meals for veterans at the Long Beach VA and start shipping them over there. And then behind our backs, behind the hospital that they're gonna to try to tear down soon, they're building a hundred or hundred to three hundred million dollar dietetic center 
which it turns out it's a building for a new UCLA program to do clinical research about food. And you know what? Food research seems to be pretty popular these days because even though the Westlake VA Soldier Zone doesn't spend one penny, one penny on food for veterans in those flammable sheds that Brentwood School and Village for Vets have a revocable license on and also have liability insurance that I don't see them filing a claim for that fire. Not one penny. And then the Congress says, hey, guys, we're concerned about food insecurity with veterans. Let's throw a ton of taxpayer money in studying food insecurity of veterans for a couple of years and see what we think about it. Right? And Congress is... Did you say my time's up? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you very much. Have a great day. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Okay. Uh, next up is uh, Mr. Bradshaw. Hello, can you hear me? This is Abe yeah. Bradshaw. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, okay. thank you. Uh, hello, thank you for giving me the opportunity to make another public comment to the Veterans and Community Oversight and Engagement Board. Once again, my name is Abe Bradshaw and I served as an officer in the United States Navy. And although I'm greatly concerned about the massive responsibilities that you have to deal with in regards to such tremendously important issues that you have in front of you regarding housing, et cetera, in my public comment on the 22nd of June, I raised my concerns about the current and future plans for two of the many beautiful structures on the West LA campus, quite possibly the two most beautiful buildings on campus the Brentwood and Wadsworth theaters, and I would like to use my time to give you a quick update. For the past several years, I've been more than a little concerned at the beginning of every fire season, like we are currently in the midst of here in Los Angeles, that all of my wildest dreams of saving these theaters could all be for naught if a random fire should happen to occur in the vicinity of either the Brentwood or the Wadsworth theaters. So I pitched the idea of to the 501c3 not-for-profit Veterans and Media and Entertainment, where I volunteer as the Director of Community Engagement, that we should submit an application to the VA so that some volunteers could help out at one of our community service days to all meet up on the West LA campus to clean the areas around each theater on some Saturday before the 2023 fire season begins. Through some friends, I was able to get in touch with Assistant Fire Chief Brian Martin of the Aaron Winland Division in Pacoima, who has offered to join us in our efforts to clean these two areas of debris, dead grass, branches, and trees, and other tender that could quickly take these two legendary theaters up in smoke in the blink of an eye. Chief Martin sent a representative to meet with me on the campus to inspect the areas surrounding the buildings firsthand. Captain Randy Zimmerman, the prescribed fire and fuels manager in Flint Ridge, drove over to meet me at the Brentwood Theater. He very clearly saw the need for my proposed cleanup day, and he very enthusiastically volunteered the assistance of the Los Angeles Fire Department to help do the bulk of heavy lifting for us on whatever day we schedule for the event. All we need to do is figure out the logistics of getting some large waste containers to the two locations and then on to their disposal. They said that a Saturday in February or March would probably work best for the Fire Department, but Chief Martin also reiterated the fact that they are willing to help us even if we happen to get approval earlier than that. I am asking the board to please continue to think about the future for these historically significant theaters. And please let me know if there's any way I can help. Once again, I will be happy as long as they are given a thoughtful and caring plan, even if I'm not involved. In the meantime, I will work with the VA and the Los Angeles Fire Department to help clean up and preserve these structures so that we can still have two safe buildings to discuss and make plans for. And I look forward to having the privilege of speaking with you again at your next meeting. Thank you for your time and for all you're doing to help veterans in the Los Angeles area. Thank you, Mr. Bradshaw. Thank you. Next up, we have Mr. Laughlin. I have a first name. 
Mr. Larry Long. My name is Lawrence Laughlin. When in Chicago, my hometown, I joined the Army on December 7th, 1954. No one told me if I became homeless, the U.S. government would provide shelter for me. For the fact that my government is doing that here, I am proud and grateful. But now I learn that in 1888, land at later became the West LA VA Medical Center, was deeded to the US government with land use restrictions to be used as a national home for disabled veteran soldiers. And now I am a member of the NHDVS coalition. And our goal is to enforce the deeds restrictions as a whole, not as a Brentwood school, or two UCLA baseball stadiums, or for an oil well energy company. And the deeded land included beachfront property, which has been claimed by the city of Santa Monica. In my last five minute speech before you, I urged the VA leadership to protect the, the beachfront property for veterans. Did they? No. Just like they give away our homeland in 99 year leases to developers in lieu of payment to build or rehab the VA buildings. The US government gives the West LA VA millions of dollars every year, as you just heard from Ryan Thompson. What has happened to all this money sent for building or maintenance of the buildings. I call upon the VA Office of Inspector General to do an audit and investigation of where that money has gone, if not used as, it, as intended by Washington. And the VA leadership has no business of granting leases to anyone. If they want to hold or if they want to build or rehab a building, all they need to do is hire a construction manager who will hire the contractors and oversee them. The way the VA leadership has been doing things is a disgrace and indefensible. This has resulted in housing veterans in eight by eight feet tiny shacks without a sink, a toilet, or shower. And the VA doesn't even feed these unhoused veterans. And my, and my friend Ryan Thompson has reported on the poor condition, on the poor veterans in building 209 who pay market rate rent for a building that would be red tagged if not on federal land. I urge putting veterans like myself in charge of land use issues. They will align the land to conform to the deeds. It was a travesty of justice to have had Ryan Thompson arrested for sitting down after his five minute speech in, in what is supposed to be an open forum. And maybe he was feeling, and maybe he wasn't feeling well and needed to sit. Lastly, I want to commend the medical center for the best medical care avail available anywhere. I know, as I am a patient here, I just wish the land use services were half as good as the medical services. End of my speech. Thank you, sir. Next up is Mr. Jerry Orlman, and he'll be virtual.
Mr. Brolin, can you hear us? I cannot, I can barely hear you guys when, when you guys speak from around the table, it's very muffled. Like it's hard to make out on anything, anything you're saying. Mr. Holman, can you hear us now? It doesn't look like he's on online at least. Okay, thank you, Stephanie. Hold on, you want? Okay, we'll circle back to Mr. Rowland and Zeph. Next up is Ms. Jessica Miles. Can you hear you? Hello. Hmm. So this is my second time up here. The first time I was completely ignorant to the master plan, to the bullying of veterans, to everything. So last night I just tossed and turned because you all exacerbated my disabilities the way you try to take advantage of veterans. So your little tour that they gave us on Monday gave me clarity that they truly do not care about the veterans. So I realized I have questions, multiple, multiple questions that no one is giving veterans answers to. Dr. Braverman definitely does not care. Dr. Simon, the whole sixth floor. No one on this campus ground listen and effectively communicate with the veteran. Who are you people? You don't even interact with veterans or soldiers because they're the same people to even know what their needs are. What I see here is blatant discrimination against disabled veterans, ongoing, and veterans have no support. So I really hope this makes it to you too, and I encourage everyone to support your veterans and go to aftpfoundation.com slash help hyphen veterans. Again, that's aftpfoundation.com forward slash help hyphen veterans. Please sign our petition. More veterans, please get involved. Soldiers need to know that Los Angeles, California has 900 acres just for the black sheep of the family. Because I know for certain that when the army puts you out, there's no guidance, there's no direction, there's no support. So again, that's aftpfoundation.com forward slash help hyphen veterans. We need people sitting at this table who will actually communicate with the people that it affects. And I will also like to know that 1200 units 
when a three to five year revision plan is not conducive, nor does it compensate for the 4,000 veterans that you manipulated off of this land from an earthquake that affected Sokolta. You're literally preying on the ignorant. One more time, aftpfoundation.com forward slash help hyphen veterans. Please sign the petition. Okay, we have Mr. Orwell on the phone now. Jerry, can you hear us? Yes, we can. Your five minutes. Okay, your five minutes starts now.
Thanks, sir. Thank you, Mr. Oliver. Next uh, up is Ms. Highway Quality. And now for something completely different. My name is Kyle Orleman, and I am the local liaison for Associates of Vietnam Veterans of America. I am also up oh, there, better. Okay. Um, I am also the wife of a totally disabled veteran and have been a full time caregiver since uh, actually September of 2001, since the day of the 9 11 attacks. Many of you know my husband, you just heard him, and many of you have seen us around the campus with his service dog and my service dog. And I want to talk to you about the dog issue today, because that's one of the things that you're going to have coming on the campus. With people coming in to live on the campus, you are going to have service dogs that are going to be here. You are also going to have emotional support animals that will be able to better, uh, that will be able to live in the supported housing. Also, you have an opportunity here that I think is unique and that I really think needs to be taken care of as promptly as possible. There is currently a dog park on the campus, and it's on the far side of the Arroyo, so it's not part of the campus that you can actually walk to here. One of the things that's important with service dogs and with emotional support dogs that will be coming onto the campus is that sometimes they end up having a health problem. They may break a leg. They may end up with some kind of a uh, medical uh, treatment that is needed that the veteran will not have the money to pay for. There is a problem with the way that those services are given, and I believe I have an answer to that problem. Congress put something in place a number of years ago so that an animal that is a service dog that is trained by a member of certain organizations is eligible, eligible to get what is called a true panion card, and I'm going to hold one up right now. It looks like this. My husband's service dog had this card issued to him in 2015. At that point, it was policy number 814. So this policy or this program is not very well known and it needs to be. The reason is because if a service dog gets ill and the veteran doesn't have the money to pay for the medical care and that service dog passes away, you can't just go to Walmart and get a security and, and, and come home with another service dog. Um, it can be three to five to eight years in order to get a dog from a properly trained program, and it can be anywhere between 20 and 35 or 40 thousand dollars to train that dog. The other part of it, and this is why this is so important to us and why I'm giving our own personal story. My husband's service dog that this card was issued to came down with a very rare autoimmune disorder. If we had not had this card which covers wall to wall that uh, veterinary care anywhere, anytime for any condition. And that dog had died because we couldn't afford the payment for him. My husband would have been a suicide and there would have been nothing I could do to stop him. So first of all, people need to be aware of this companion program. It's very important. The rules pertaining to this uh, can be found on the federal register 
that was published on September 5th, 2012 and effective on October 5th, 2012. And one of the things that Congress did and with this final rule that was well intended but had unintended consequences. There were many people at that point who were saying, I can get you a service dog and I can train it and I can give it to you and that'll all be fine. And those people were backyard breeders and they weren't competent to train the dogs. So the reason that this final rule was put into place was to assure that the dogs were properly trained. And the way that they did that in that final rule is that in order to get this true panion policy and have the recognition that the dog is accepted by the VA, and I need to be very clear here, I am not talking about public access. Your dog does not have to have this card to have public access to come in here. But in order to get this insurance policy under the final rule, your dog has to be trained by a trainer who is a member of Assistance Dogs International. At this time, there are only 82 Assistance Dogs International programs in all of North America. So if you have a dog that needs multiple training, say for example, it needs to do diabetes alert, it might be trained in San Francisco, and then it might need to go to Canada for mobility assistance training. It might need to go to somewhere in Mexico for a different kind of training, and the veteran has to go and be housed while that training is being done. So where does the VA here come into play with all of that? Here's your answer. You have that land that the dog park is on right now. One of the members uh, of Assistance Dogs International, so they are qualified and would be able to train trainers so that the veterans involved would be able to get this assistance card is um, local here. It's the Sam Simon Foundation. My suggestion would be that you contact the Sam Simon Foundation, which is right up here in Malibu, and you get their certified trainers to train veterans on this campus who perhaps have been service dog handlers or military working dog handlers or trainers. Use the facility that you have over there uh, for the dog park to turn it into a training facility. Also, the veterans who are here on the campus would be able to take their dogs there and get training for them. Also, there could be the ability for the veterans living here to that 30 seconds. That's out. Okay, um, veterans who are living on the campus here could be trained as dog walkers or groomers. Um, that could give them a career opportunity and it could also bring in income for people who would come in here to use those services, uh, the dog walkers or the groomers or whatever. So you have an opportunity to here to use the facility that you already have to grow it into an organization that would be certified by Assistance Dogs International. So the dogs trained here would have access to this veterinary care policy and it's a win-win all the way around. If you need more information, I can provide it. And also one last quick uh, comment. Uh, there's an organization called American Humane and they are a national organization and they also supply mobile veterinary services. Perhaps they could be contacted to make arrangements to bring their veterinary care vans onto the campus to take care of the animals who will be living here. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Next up is Mr. David Echeverry. Good afternoon. Uh, second time I've been here. Oh, uh, I do much better without this stuff. Um, wow. You know, as I look around and I see, I realize this really isn't a veteran's location because everything gets addressed except veterans. We get left behind, we get left out, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, yeah, that's who we're supposed to serve. On the other hand, there are, I think, it's some new generation of leaders coming along. Andrew Strain is one of them. He's helping us a lot. He's, he's more transparent, doesn't always have the answers you want to hear, but he tells us the truth. And that's appreciative because at least we're more informed about what's going on. But I'm beginning to realize that, that we really don't matter here as veterans. The whole purpose for this whole facility to be here is for us, actually. Um, you know, and, and 
I often think about this time when, when it came time when I separated from the service and I was going to go for my evaluation. I almost didn't go because I was so tired from all of everything, red tape, paperwork, you know, how it is in the military. Uh, we just started or actually kind of finishing around in Iraq, the first Iraq, right? And I was just done with it. On the other hand, I'm glad I went because the things it does for my, my physical well being, my mental well being, you know, um, those are good. One of the things I'm grateful for, though, is I'm not an inpatient here. You've got homeless veterans. We house them now at CTRS who last year, a year ago, this time were on the street just on San Vicente because the VA didn't want them. So the sheriff had to come and clear the sidewalk because the people of Redwood were having a marathon like on the 7th of November. So they had to have, house, had to have us out for a week because the turnaround point was right down here on Redwood, not far from the VA. So, I mean, that's that's homeless vets twice on camera at the turnaround point. Can't have that, right? Bad optics, especially for CDFLA. But it's a half step in the right direction because the sheriff got us onto our home property where we should be. He left us in tents at first, and then all of a sudden, some day we got an idea of these tiny little shelters, metal shelters that are very flammable, very dangerous. In fact, they were dangerous before they got here. Nobody really did any work. But not only with that, did they put them up and stuff, and some veterans felt, oh, we got something, you know, of course, it was cold and stuff, so not bad. But then again, what happened? We had a fire a couple months ago. People realized that they didn't put in the proper systems or the proper supports to kind of cover that stuff. Nobody thought about those things, right? Or did they? Because we were moving in, they had to make sure they had fire extinguishers, no smoking in the area, because those tents that we were in the first night on could go up really quick. Not that we've had any burn out in the street before, because we had fire watch, we took care of that stuff. But once we became patients, the level of care kind of went down. Security went down. Mayhem broke out. I mean, we can get into those details later, but that's not what we're here for. But yet, the care of veterans, and it wasn't until we had a fire that they realized that there was no fire suppression, no fire extinguishers, uh, fire hydrants and stuff. So I guess now they're digging the trench after the fact, right? Thank God, not, no veterans lost their life. My God. But then again, it wouldn't have mattered, huh? Because we could have swept on the carpet like everything else that we do around here. But why is it that veterans get the end? You know, um, last week, uh, POTUS was here. You know POTUS, the panhandler of the United States? And I got the, the message to prove it. He's always asking for money now. He doesn't want votes. He wants your money. In fact, last month I got $20 will win the election in, in the midterms. I don't figure that out. You know, unless you're buying votes. But um, as veterans, we weren't invited. Number one, we weren't invited to attend. And when we did try to attend, we were refused. And these are non-entities, people who have nothing to do with the VA or don't want anything with the VA. Ted Lou is here, who's a representative in Congress. He had no big news, no try, try to avoid us, in fact. And in fact, he told us in February, things don't change in February. Well, come January, this is no longer his responsibility because we're out of his district. So that makes sense for him to say something about February. Derek Bass, who's currently running for the mayor of LA, wants to come out with a line similar to uh, Maxine Waters, not in my district. Not my district, not my vets, actually, is kind of what they're saying. And yet she wants to be mayor of LA. And what happens if when this problem becomes hers and her, her uh, contender is no better? Talking about he, he's a builder, but he only builds retail. Could spot the trend and realize that affordable housing is what we really need in Los Angeles, Los Angeles County. Now, again, for veterans, there's a solution. We're sitting here. We have everything we need except the will to build the houses. We had a good tour on Monday, but you know what? By the time those things open up, when, when and if they open up, it's not going to be enough. It's like everything else that engineers do around here. And I'm talking about all over. You widen the roads, but as soon as you open them up, there's more cars than road. When we do, if we ever have housing here for veterans, more veterans, and, and I'm talking about just being a veteran qualifies you, not how much you make or you don't make, just being a veteran qualifies you because you need something you know, for that time, right? Whether it's long term, short term. Is it going to be adequate enough? We're putting out 20 years of war in Afghanistan. We've yet to begin to see the effects of that war on the streets. Now, when that happens, once again, we're not going to be prepared because nobody's thinking about that. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Uh, next is uh, Mr. Diego Garcia.
Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak here today. Um, again, my name is Diego Garcia. I'm a little bit different than uh, most other vets or most other people here in the sense that uh, I'm actually a West Side uh, native. I, I was raised here. I'm from Cork City, went to elementary, middle school there. I graduated from Venice High. I used to operate the rides at Santa Monica Pier right up until I left to the Marine Corps. Uh, believe it or not, on, Septem on, Se on September 11, 2001, when those planes were hitting the towers, I was at MEPS, about uh, just a few miles away from LAX. So I saw those towers hit while I was sitting down at MEPS when I signed my final contract. Um, everyone else went home except for the Marines because the Marines just had a bus ride. We didn't have to hop in the plane, right? The plane got grounded. The Marines just had to hop in the bus. So I stayed back. During the Marines, uh, as, a, as a Marine, as a combat engineer with the Marines, Bush said go and, uh, in March of 2003, and we invaded Iraq. I was six miles away from that border, already dressed in full combat gear, sleeping, trying to sleep in the trench. Uh, so when he said go, we jumped into the back of our trucks and we stormed that border. That whole night lit up with all kinds of freaking missiles, right? I was front row to uh, shock and awe. Fast forward, 2005, I got out, came back home, Marine Del Rey, uh, having issues. Mainly, I couldn't sleep. Mine couldn't shut off, just nonstop. Came here, this is my hospital. Tried to get some help, weren't able to help me out, whatever, went away. Uh, ended up finding a good outpatient clinic that uh, ended up helping me out. Uh, Done a good job as a risk management professional, safety dude. Uh, then I got tired of that job, tried to go into uh, try to the family business as an electrician, went to school for electrical engineering. I uh, was doing great right up until it came to the part where I had the manual stuff. It turns out I, I can't really turn wrenches or whatnot. Uh, two, three minutes after turning some wrenches, my hands lock up. Literally, my fingers lock up. I can't open Came back to the VA and I was like, hey, something weird going on with my fingers. My hands are locking up. I don't know what's going on. I, it's kind of weird, man. I'm 30. I don't think this should happen. And VA doctor's like, I don't see anything wrong. Oh. Weren't able to help me out. Go to my civilian doctors, right? A few years later. Uh, anyway, turns out fibromyalgia, right? I'm right now fully disabled. Can't work because of my fibro, because of my sleep issues. Because uh, pretty much I'm, I'm all messed up, but I did get a, about 20 years in of good risk management work in, and during that risk management work, I, I learned a lot about manufacturing and whatnot. So as my health was on a steady decline, learning about manufacturing something, uh, I started a nonprofit called Semper Utilis. What I do with Semper Utilis is I take in recycling, so all these. Uh, uh, water bottles and whatnot. And for right now, I just cash that stuff in. And, and what I do for proceeds is I help out disabled vets. So I started my nonprofit in 2018. 2020, pandemic hits, right? I start seeing all kinds of articles about Veterans Row. So I'm 50 uh, tents that just popped up alongside San Vicente, you know, all covered in line with freaking American flags. I was like, wow, that is the most beautiful disgusting thing I've ever seen. My brother's out there sleeping on the sidewalk. Dang it, man. Look at those American flags and, and beautiful American flags. And they're out there sweeping and whatnot. And I was like, well, man, I got this little nonprofit. I got a little bit of money. Let me go out there and start helping these guys. So I did. Started going out there in 2020, taking them hygiene kits, clothing. Um, uh, it evolved into pressure washing services, it evolved into, into barbecues. Uh, I still go on to this day. We go over to the Rose Garden and do nice things for these guys. But one thing that baffled me, one thing that really baffled me is in the 2020, when the pandemic hit, I'm working as a risk management consultant for a workers' comp insurance company. So I'm helping my clients, right? Everything's shutting down except for, for uh, 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 critical employees right now, right? So I'm helping all my clients out with their pandemic response plans. I'm auditing their pandemic response plan. I'm writing infection, illness, preparedness plans and whatnot. And I'm showing up, doing all kinds of training and whatnot. And then I show up to this billion dollar 
medical facility and it got completely shut down and my brothers and sisters were kicked out to the street. And I was like, what the heck is going on? I was like, whoever's in charge, Braverman, must either be heartless, incompetent, or just must have like the biggest components to just not give a F about all the disabled veterans. Because I mean, to shut down a billion dollar medical facility in the seventh largest economy of the world, in the world, in the capital of homelessness, to just shut it down and kick all these guys out of the street and ignore them, right? So that's why we started doing what we started doing out there. We're all, all, all services. Long story short, uh, my, uh, my people, um, we, we need a home. We need a place uh, uh, where veterans can come in and help each other out because that's who, that's who kept those guys out there alive, was other veterans showing up, like Dave, like Rob, like Larry, like myself. We kept each other going. The administration turned its back on us. The, 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 the community turned its back on us. Everyone turned its back on us except other veterans. And now we're sitting here talking about do we want to build a community town center for Brentwood? Do we want promenade? Do we want you know public parking spaces for a public train? No. We need a home for veterans where we can come in and 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 and, and heal. Last thing I would I cannot sum it up better than this Vietnam veteran. Just please, it's just a short, quick video. This is doing the cleanup when sorry. This is doing the cleanup when the sheriff was actively uh, uh, with with the bulldozers tearing down the 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 uh, sets. Thank you. Thank you very much for all our comments. We should uh, Next, we'd like to say a presentation from um, the city of Detroit. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jennifer Tuzinski, and I am from Detroit. I'm not sure if we have a slide deck up. I have to tell them this then. Perfect. Thank you so much. So I am Jennifer Tuzinski. I'm the coordinated entry specialist with Detroit. And with me today is also Chantel Jackson, who is the HUD BASH coordinator. Um, at the Detroit VA, and we just want to thank you for the opportunity to be there. Yes, can you hear me? Okay. She's presenting and she can hear you, but I guess you guys can't hear her. No, we haven't heard any yet. Just, uh, just a moment. We're checking our controls here. Jennifer, they're having some, some audio issues from the, the WebEx. So just 
hold on for a second. Okay, I sure will. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Was did you just say that you you should be able to hear her? Yeah, we should be able to hear her now. We have a, a issue. Okay, Jennifer, will yeah. you test it? Sure. How how's this? I'm sorry, Jennifer. Hold on just a second. We we still don't have audio. Okay. Okay. Jennifer, can you hear us, ma'am? I can hear you, yes. Did you guys hear her respond? No. She can hear you, you can't hear her. I'm not sure why I'm the only one who can <laughs> communicate with you guys. Jennifer, if you can hear me, can you accept audio on your computer? Uh, I've got unmute. Let me just check here. Jennifer, I think what happens is they send a request for you to be able to use audio in this setting. Okay. Um, she does I just got. What was that, Jennifer? I just got a notification that came through and I hit unmute me. Okay. Can you guys hear her? No, no. Jennifer, try try one more time. Just okay. test, test. Okay. Test, test. <laughs> did you guys hear her test? We did not. Okay. She got a notification that said unmute me and she clicked it. So she. She should be unmuted. I can still hear her. We show her as unmuted now. Go ahead, Jennifer. Try one more time. Okay. How's this? Any better? <laughs> it looks like all my settings are set to where they sh should be able to hear me. Yeah, Jennifer, your mind slides up as if you're engaged, but we cannot hear you. Uh, you don't, it shows you were on you, so you should, we should be able to hear the uh, other official folks now or are making another run of promise. Can you hear me now? I, I apologize, this is uh, taking so long. We just had to uh, have one of these web access with, uh, with some other folks and it seems to work okay. Try, try again now. They, How's this testing 1, 2, 3. No, I, I still think they can't hear you, Jennifer. Sorry about that. Oh, that's okay. Yeah, I, I've. It looks like. Okay, that looks like, yeah, I just had the notification come through again. Hit unmute. So. Are you guys hearing her yet? Yeah. Okay. She had the notification come through again and she hit accept a second time. I wonder if Chantel, do you want to try and see if they can hear you? Maybe it's something with my system. Oh. And Chantel can hear me. I can hear you, but testing. Who's that testing? So that was Chantel. I think Chantel's mic is working. 
Chantel, say something else. <laughs> Afternoon. Yeah, we got her. Yeah, she's not there. Okay. Box in the upper left. Should she click on that? So, Jennifer and Chantel, I can hear on the WebEx side. Chantel, it sounds like it's coming through to you guys, but Jennifer still is not. Right. Any change? You can go ahead with the presentation. Jennifer, can Chantel do the presentation? How's that? Is this, is this any better? No, they can't hear you. Okay. Uh, I've just changed all the different settings to see, but I'm not sure why it's not working. This is Janelle Wolf. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I can hear you. We can hear what she's saying. Maybe they can't, but I'm going to mute myself anyway. Yeah. I, the, in the room, the board can't hear you. Oh, okay. So I'm, I'm virtual, but in the board room where many, most of the board members are, they can't hear you. So they're asking if Chantel can give the presentation because they can hear her. What do you think, Jennifer? Um, I'm going to see how Chantel feels about that. <laughs> I think mean, we can try. Jennifer has a lot of information in regards to the coordinated entry process, which I'm sure is very detailed, but we can try. Maybe if you get, I get started, and then maybe you can speak. At least the members here can hear, and then I can pick up with the HUD-BASH. General Hopper, how do you want them to handle that? Do you guys want to maybe call Jennifer while Chantel starts and then try to figure out if you can make it work with her? Yes, that's what we'll do. Thanks, Stephanie. Okay. And Go there's ahead, a number Chantel. too, Jennifer. I don't know if that helps if you want to maybe call in that phone. Isn't there a phone number too? And see maybe if the call in number works better. We'll we'll coordinate on the back end, Chantel. Why don't you start? As Jennifer indicated, Jennifer is the coordinating entry specialist um, for the Detroit VA Medical Center. And my name is Chantel Jackson. I'm the supervisor program manager for the HUD Bash program. And I believe you guys have a slide. Thank you. So today's agenda is going to cover the coordinated entry process, providing an overview. Some lessons that we've learned, um, some current challenges, and then go into um, the HUD Bash program, what our team structure looks like, staffing, utilization, veteran engagement, landlord engagement, and sustaining of housing for our veterans. And you can click to the next slide. So the coordinated entry process, which the Jennifer has in great detail, her looks like her lips are moving, I'm not sure. Um, but Jennifer um, works in tangent with, um, with another staff member as well. So Jennifer covers the large bulk of the area for the Detroit VA Medical Center, which is um, Detroit, in addition to um, Highland Park and Hamtramck, which are two smaller cities um, kind of within the city, larger city of um, Detroit. And then we have a second coordinated entry specialist who works the out county areas, um, which are a little smaller settings, but outside of that uh, larger um, urban area that we have. Jennifer, I saw you nodding your head. Are you all set? I think she's on the phone with tech on the oh. ground is oh. what's happening. That's why it looks like her mouth is moving. Okay. Sorry, I didn't want to cut her off. Let me, you know what? Let me, if we could just kind of flip the slides to the HUD Bash program, I'll go through that in detail. And then maybe if Jennifer's ready. And if not, then we'll go back through her slides. Yeah, I think we're going to on the phone here. We're going to try and uh, do that. Hopefully, you can hear it. 
where she's going. So when the head badge pops up, you can come back down. Go ahead, Mr. Zinke. Partners, 
And so one of the first things that uh, we really focused on was building trust between the community providers and the uh, so, uh, meetings, uh, open, really hard discussion sometimes. Uh, we really talking about what was working and what wasn't. Uh, everyone to share their opinions with honesty while still being respectful. How many meetings about were open and uh, open with suggestions and anonymous because not everybody's comfortable uh, just being open about uh, thoughts and opinions about things. So we gave different avenues for them to be able to do that. And this really took a good year to really start making progress. Uh, in moving forward, uh, people started to feel more comfortable discussing how things were going, being more open to making such changes within our system. And this really was critical um, to also do within our VA system. So even within our system, we had some settling. So bringing together high dash or GCE liaisons, HCHB, BCIC, heavy conversations, uh, and all of us coming together and talking about internally what was working. Um, so we did come a long way. Uh, in a, uh, interesting process, but we are definitely in a much better place than we were when we started. Um, just thanks to everybody just being open and flexible. And so really that's the, the biggest thing is starting and building that trust. The other thing was that we had professional coordinated entry systems and the community coordinated entry system. So having okay. two separate systems. Uh, was that not all veterans were accessing the resources that were available to them for them. For various reasons, some didn't think that they were veterans. Um, others, uh, they just didn't think they were eligible for certain things. So there are some things that maybe they have bad experience with the VA or what kind of going to connect. And so what we did in 2020 is we actually combined the two systems into one. Um, community partner, which is CAM, the coordinated vet team, that model, on site at the VA hospital. There's also a caller number that veterans can call if they're not able to come to the VA and act their phone and services. So anywhere at veterans are going to the system, they're screened through CAM and they can access the home of services now. And we have you know, we connected those veterans who previously would not have ever access to resources that are available to them. Um, Another lesson learned was assessment. So we had to work through how the process would flow. Um, as I mentioned, CAM does the initial assessment, um, and then each of us said it was on the housing track. Uh, so as I mentioned, there's some supportive housing, rapid housing, and self resolve. Uh, we do have a progressive engagement policy to shift veterans as needed within our system. So as I mentioned, the accident score is just the initial tool. But if we have a veteran that they initially was referred to SSPF based on that BIC that score, but after working with that veteran, is recognized, you know what, they actually really would benefit from more community case management supports in order to be successful in their housing, then we have a process that the veteran um, uh, referred over to HUD Dash, and there's a form of policy that is existing for that. And while that's fairly common for SSPF, what we also did was that adopt that with our version for doing a contract with the national providers as well. So if a veteran has that one of those sites and um, they might not have ever engaged with SSPF for whatever reason, but the site is recognized that there is a clinical need that that veteran fits the hot dash, they can also submit a progressive engagement referral over uh go to that process to make the veteran connected with hot um, dash. Um, one of the other parts of the assessment is that initially, uh, when a veteran came up presented, came up with the assessment and they get referred to the shelter. And what was happening is some of our veterans were getting lost in the system. And so now what happens, Kim will refer them to the shelter, but before they leave, they do a warm handoff to our HCH and social workers who do that clinical assessment. And what that does is that uh, Pockets of hand that are connected to HUD DASH because we need to have that clinical assessment for HUD DASH and also expedite them getting referred to our GCP or contract residential program as appropriate. So we made some adjustments in the system as we, as we move along. Uh, another lesson learned uh, so our binding. Originally, it was the Excel spreadsheet, and 
Um, the numbers from the pixels that they saw. So, in table last year, it was actually um, put our vinyl link in the HMIS. Uh, and now we're able to run reports, which is better able to provide that analysis. Um, and really looking at uh, how can we make this a good based on that data. And so, still one of the challenges that we're facing is just making sure that the data is constantly updated. And um, we've got pilots in the trade for that we're just monitoring that, which are by the way, more than 30,000 people. Uh, also, that is our improvement team. So we knew there were many projects we wanted to test and issues within our system that we needed to fix. Um, we needed more than one or two people to do this. And so we brought together a working group who actually does the work and test projects. So some of the examples of uh, work on is. Implementing the progressification process for the contract residential sites, uh, better engagement of our case management during the other system. So we do have a case management grant that really has been done individually. Um, just to say with anyone we were trying to figure out so we were able to train them in better, and then also ensuring that our vets start working on updated vital documents as soon as they hit your GP and contract residential. We know with all of our programs. And just being able to get housing. Um, so, I am hoping that we be developing projects. We also have a GPD strategy team. So, as the system is changing, so when initially around five years ago, we had 15 people in homeless veterans on our mining list. Right now, we have about 150. So, we made a significant decrease in those numbers. And what that means is that our GPD utilization rates have gone down over time. And right now we're operating about 30 to 40 percent utilization of the site over the past four years. So we're being part of what's called the last final. So that's working with the solution. Uh, Detroit and DC were identified as last mile communities, which means we're just at that point where uh, we need some additional big resources to help get us to reaching our criteria benchmarks and veteran homelessness, which is really exciting. But what that means is that our numbers are going down and we need to do some right sizing with our GPS and the number of beds that we have. Um, but then also supporting our GPD program so that they can still serve our veterans, but it might just look a little bit different. So we are um, have our GPD strategy meeting that is helping us be able to do that, help for our community. All of our GPD providers are a part of that, um, as well as our different community partners and, of course, the VA as well. Housing uh, first. So this is pretty basic. Uh, the housing first model. Uh, but one of the things that we recognize is that we didn't really ever talk much about it. And so when it came up, there was a lot of misunderstanding of what housing first meant. Um, whether that's you know housing only, not understanding that there also is wraparound services for our veterans to be successful when they're being housed, um, and to sustain housing. And so we. Um, came together as part of our improvement team and uh, walked through some things that we could do to really put at the forefront that Detroit is a housing first community. And so what we are doing, we created a housing first flyer. We have a slide deck for training uh, staff uh, within the community. And we're working in these solutions right now on uh, putting together a housing first video that will be shown to Everyone in the community uh, will be shown to our veterans when they can so that they understand like all the supports that are made available to them. Um, and uh, just so that when that term is used, that we really have a good understanding of what that actually means in our community. Uh, and then also uh, leveraging efforts yet to have dash. So prior to COVID, that was something we did not do well. And we were all in that gap. It actually caused us to have to really try again inside veterans in our EHA hotels that were connected with our dash. But being in a hotel, they provide up the staff. They were now connected with us as well. So there were a lot of meetings between all of the providers in our dash. Uh, and working through like, why does it that make us successful? So, you know, building that trust and communication with our partners. And then also understanding the different requirements that often have, especially regarding their inspections, um, that we needed to then uh, ensure that the staff understood. So now we are in a much better place, and our um, 
much more successful in making that happen, which has been great. And then finally, part of the lesson learned is that we do have consistent ongoing assessment of our system. Uh, every day, I uh, can analyze the campuses to see where we need to make improvements go. Uh, individuals come to me all the time and let me know things are working, and we try something else, or see what we suggest suggestions. And one of the things that we know that change is hard, and it can be really hard on staff who are doing the day to day work with our veterans. It can be hard on our veterans uh, because they thought it was one day, one day, and not going to come to you if it comes up. So, one of the things that we really do is um, to make sure that there is a training to the community providers, to the VA staff, and making sure that approach is great to our veterans. Uh, we actually have something that your point uh, in our VA system that all staff has access to, and that's all our policies and procedures, um, flow charts, any tools that are assisting and helping them to do their job. Um, we also do reminders to staff um, that they can keep at their desk for a conference. And uh, we have a community partner now that has a SharePoint folder that is available to all the veteran communities. So there's access to the training as well, um, different ways we're going to tool and how the person is working the back. So some of our current challenges. Um, right now, we have a community partner of CAM, which is our initial access system, is changing hands. So that means that they're going to go up a bit to be up with another agency. Um, it just was announced a few weeks ago, so we are working through that right now. Uh, they have until August of next week for the change to be actually efficient. We do expect some pickups along the way. Uh, so, in order to make sure the veteran system, the veteran community is uh, represented, uh, I'm participating in all the various meetings and bringing in different VA providers and community providers who serve the veterans throughout the to ensure that uh, you know there's changes that we need to make have happen, uh, and further, and um, just supporting the process as we move through this. But so far, we don't have a person in with VR planning, and that will change some days. Uh, another challenge is our going to stay in our GPA program. I know this is not unusual, this is fairly common across the nation. Our average stay is about 225 days. Our goal, of course, is 90 days, which is everyone's goal. 90 days or less, get our veterans out. Uh, so this is a huge challenge. So we're looking at the meeting, uh, but we're looking at the criteria and benchmarks. So actually today, and then we had a discussion about this and coming up with a policy uh, that will really support our veterans being able to move much more quickly to permanent housing. Uh, we know there are some challenges there. Um, they feel like they share some of the GPD sites if they have challenges because they have, you know, questions they have the sites, so trying to figure out how they was supported. And then also just making sure that our veterans uh, are aware of all the various housing options, but they have done an excellent job and getting connected right away with our veterans, uh, getting them engaged and getting them moved through um, to get housed within the 90 days. So, um, building those relationships with those landlords in our community, uh, and that just becomes an ongoing uh, search for affordable home housing. Uh, also, there is a large portion of our veterans on our binding list who has been through the system multiple times. This is something that we have been aware of for at least the past couple of years. And now that we've got our binding list at HMIS, we're doing some data cleanup up right now. Our goal, once that is completed, is to then take a look at all of the veterans who have been through our system multiple times, um, look at the GPD states, contract residential, uh, that are done, and really try to come up with some test projects to see what our system is testing that is causing our veterans to lose their money because there's something that's not working. And so we don't have that answer, but we're really going to dive in. I'm starting next month of looking at that and, of course, you know, bringing in our veterans, doing a lot of surveys with our veterans, um, you know, having persons with this experience a part of this process. Uh, so that is something that we're 
going to be to be working on. And then finally, affordable uh, low barrier housing, low barrier housing is a need, and this was all our community. Um, and we did have one of our members from GE to uh, work with low barrier, low barrier housing, and that just opened up last month. So we're seeing some veterans who never were able to get housing because they might have had multiple evictions or class background. Um, whatever the case is now being able to move into those women and one of the things that we have done is we're um, partnering for with the city so the city is really being partnering with us and we just found out today that they are now requiring that any developer that decides housing for veterans they have to get to the VA and they have to get approval from the VA and support from the VA in order for the city to even look forward and approve that. So we're really excited about that. Um, Chuck Tuck might be a part of that as well, but her and our um, leadership at the end of the is right. Uh, so we're, we're excited to see what happens with that. And I will now turn it over to Chuck Tuck to discuss our financial work. The Hood Bash program has experienced a number of the same challenges that we've been working together as a coordinated process. So we've been pretty flexible in trying to develop the program into the needs or addressing the needs that we have um, for our veteran and a population in real time. When I initially started with the Hood Bash program, we were literally one program um, under one supervisor, and we just realized that that just wasn't effective for the area that we're covering. This HUVASH program in the Detroit VA covers um, five different counties. And these counties um, in distance could range from 30 minutes to two and a half, three hours, depending on travel, depending on weather, depending on that time of the year, other elements that may impact um, travel and distance. So we right now what we have is a structure where there's a program manager, three separate teams, three separate supervisors, and then three team leads each assigned to those teams. Each team also has two um, dedicated social workers who are what we call our engagement team or engagement workers where they are meeting the veterans where they are. When those veterans are referred to the HUD bash program, they are the ones that are boots on the ground, ensuring that they have the documentation required in order to complete the MISHTA application. We work with the Michigan State Housing Authority, ensuring that the PHA has all documentation in order to move forward with a briefing. Ideally, when a veteran is referred to the HUD bash program, we want to make a decision regarding um, eligibility admission within seven days. Ideally, we have an application set into our housing agent's office within a week, and then that allows the housing agent's office some additional time to review, and we're having briefings twice per month to ensure that a veteran that comes through within two weeks, that veteran is going to have a voucher. Within that process, that engagement social worker is meeting with the veteran, providing them with three to four viable housing options. What we like to see is that by the time a veteran is scheduled for that briefing with our housing agent's office, that they've already selected housing. That way, when they attend the briefing, we're able to complete landlord packet, rafter packet, submit that to landlord housing agent's office and kind of get started with the inspection process and keys in hand. Once a veteran has completely gone through that process to keys in hand, that veteran is then transitioned to another social worker within the team to then connect that veteran with ongoing resources. When a veteran first enters into our program, we know we're, you know, we are dealing with those challenges where a veteran may have medical issues that are unaddressed, may have substance abuse issues that are unaddressed. We are literally connecting them with services at that point, but then once they're housed, those services will continue with the social worker that continues that ongoing case management. What's really great about our team is that we also have one peer support that is assigned to each team, which allows us to still use those empowerment, teaching skills, life skills, those one on one that peer supports can reach that we can't usually reach um, as social workers too, because there's just a, a connection that these veterans have with peer support that sometimes we're just not able to reach across the board that are not necessarily assigned to each team. We also have two psychiatrists. We have an occupational therapist. We have a nurse and we have um, a SUD therapist, social worker that's dedicated 
to providing those services to the veteran. We also have a psychologist and we are in the process of hiring a second psychologist as well. So as this program continues to grow, we continue to, you know, put in place those entities, those programs that will further support the veterans that we're working with. Our structure right now is set up again, covering five different counties, 912 vouchers are provided to our area. Next slide. So I wanted to talk a little bit about voucher utilization. I know this is an ongoing issue, particularly in our vision and what we've seen across the nation is that sometimes we just haven't right sized areas. So the Detroit VA for the last six years probably has been in, a, in, in an area where we haven't probably crossed over more than 83, 84% of utilization of those vouchers. So right now we are in the process to right size. And we are in um, talks right now to do what we would call a recapture. Jennifer spoke a little bit about what our BNLs look like, both with um, in Wayne County and outside of Wayne County, and the numbers just don't match as far as the utilization. Right now, we're at 77% of utilization of our vouchers, which means that we have 407 veterans that we call actively being case managed. Those veterans are being seen either once a week twice a week, I'm sorry, um, twice a month, once a month, once every quarter, and then before they transition to that graduation phase. If a veteran gets to that phase where they've got, um, crossed over into graduation and the aftercare, and they're no longer in need of the ongoing case management services that are provided, then they're allowed to continue to utilize that subsidy. In that portion of that program for us, we have 265 veterans. What we did find is that a veteran who may have um, discharged or you know, met their goals and no longer need a case management a few years ago, that may not be the same for them more recently. So what we experienced um, in Detroit is a number of veterans who were losing their housing, who didn't necessarily um, need the ongoing case management, but may have had issues with paperwork, may have had issues with engaging with their landlord issues with um, completing proper documentation overall for the housing agent's office. And what we never want to see is a veteran who then transitions back into a homeless status because they haven't been able to complete documentation. So what we've done now is assign two staff members per team that focus solely on those engagement cases. So then we're following up with those veterans once every six months. And if it's ever determined that the veteran is in greater need of those services, then we can transition the veteran back into our team and continue that ongoing case management with those veterans. If it has been, you know, a tremendous portion of our program, like I mentioned, we've had a number of veterans speaking to our PHAs. We work with two PHAs, I should state that as well, too, that paperwork is an ongoing issue, recertification. So we're meeting those veterans, whether that's going to be through telehealth, whether or not they're coming on station, whether we're meeting them in the community, ensuring that we can keep those vouchers in their hands and keep that roof over their heads during that process, even if they are in the engagement phase, I'm sorry, graduation phase. Currently and usually we have about 63 veterans with vouchers in hand that are searching for housing. So I just thought that was important too to know just in case there's any questions regarding the utilization and how that works for us. So next slide. Landlord engagement, this is a huge thing for us. We have uh, recently transitioned into the ability like across the nation where shared housing is now an option. That's not something that our PHA supported. We literally are having conversations now to begin that structure and to allow veterans to enter into those type of settings if that's something that they desire. We think this would be great too for our veterans in that aftercare phase who may not necessarily need to come back into ongoing case management, but may need some type of different structure in order to maintain independent living. What we've done is continue to have a virtual landlord fairs once a month where we're inviting um, landlords, potential landlords, anyone who's interested in becoming a partner in collaboration with transitioning veterans from homelessness into housing or permanent supportive housing, where I am having a conversation with those individuals, giving them background information about the program, the benefits of the program, educating them how they can be a partner. As long as we're able to um, ensure that this is a structure that benefits both sides, we found that We've been able to engage in long structured or long um, longevity with some of these landlords who are dedicated to this program. We're also in the process of developing a landlord database 
which is really awesome um, for our catchment area as well. There's been quite um, some separation between like SS SSVF partners, HUD Bash, where certain landlords work with different entities, but not necessarily crossing over. Almost one of those things where you know I'm committed to this type of program, but not necessarily branching out to the other. So what we've been able to do now is have conversations with the community, where we're in the process of building one landlord database that we can all utilize that would be updated in real time. So if we're looking for um, a veteran who may be interested in housing in one particular county, we can now look on that database, determine whether or not that landlord has any immediate availability, and then reach out to that landlord to determine if we can move forward. Next slide. Sustaining housing. I'll talk a little bit about this. Um, our aftercare is a huge thing for us in sustaining housing. They count for a large portion of the program that we have veterans in, so we want to make sure that those veterans maintain that housing. And then I talked a little bit about the recertification process. And in order for us to be able to do that, we're definitely going to have to meet with our PHAs and develop a better collaboration. We're working right now. Um, prior to more recently, what we were doing was having a structure where I would receive documentation and then I would go through and reconcile data. What we're trying to do now is then have a process where we're meeting with the PHA, we're having ongoing conversations, and that's something that we're doing at least once every 12 weeks to ensure that we're reconciling that on a regular basis as opposed to once, maybe twice a year, ensuring that the veterans that are accounted for the information, that data is correct. Next slide. So that's the overview um, for the HUD Bash program coordinated entry process. Are there any questions, concerns, feedback? Hello, thank you so much for taking your time to present to our group. I really appreciate it. Um, just a couple quick questions. First, can you tell us what the FMR uh, percent about, uh, that you allow for HUD Bash vouchers? Yeah, we heard earlier that DC goes up to 175 percent of our market rate for rent. So we've been able to go. The, um, it's been a more recently we went up to 180. Of um, so and that's a huge thing too. That's a really great question because market rate is was a large concern for our area. Just making sure that that not only is the voucher affordable, but it's within market rate for veterans. Thank you. That's extremely helpful. And it's going to, and I'll add this too. It's been really extremely helpful to be able to admit veterans into our program that are 100% service connected, whereas that's something that was not an option before. So we knew we had a number of veterans who met the criteria for case management services, but didn't necessarily meet the income requirement. So we weren't able to provide them with these wraparound services, which is awesome because we're meeting them in the community with these services where they don't necessarily have to come into the hospital. So it was really hard to turn away veterans who we knew could use this support on an ongoing basis, but because they were 100% service connected, that's something that we weren't able to do. So right now, with that increase, that is something that we've been able to engage with veterans. That's great. Thank you. And then the last question is the um, landlord relations staff person. Is that a VA staff person or is that contracted out to an outside agency? I heard the first part of the question, but I didn't hear the entire question. Could you repeat it one more time, please? Sure. I'm sorry. Um, for the landlord engagement functions, mm -hmm. is the person who does that or people who do that, is that a VA staff person or do you contract that function out? So that's a VA staff person. And I will add to what we've done as well, we've added what we call a landlord line too. So it's a direct connection to the VA hospital where landlords who are interested, potential landlords who may not have worked with our program before, can leave a message, inquire about the program, then they're followed up with by a VA staff member and invited to a landlord fair to become better educated, what we call an information session. That landlord line is also used for active landlords. So if a veteran is having, um, or if a landlord is having a concern or needs assistance regarding a tenant issue, a housing issue, they can also leave a message as well and a VA staff member will follow up with them very specific to that veteran that they're renting to. That's great. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks. Oh, I'm sorry. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. Mr. Margano. Hi, Chantel. Uh, I heard you talk about the people 
that we get kind of after care and the support that you need to provide for people who you know, leave the program, who don't sustain the housing. I'm wondering if you have any idea of what percentage of the people you place who are veterans leave the housing. You know, we're actually pulling that data now. That's something, I don't know, Jennifer, do we have the numbers on that yet? That's something that we were actively working on less than 30 days ago. To, so we would um, have a better understanding of what that recidivism number is. Sure. Do, do you just have a general idea, like a rough idea? For example, I was recently in a city where 50% mm -hmm. of the people they placed in housing dropped out of the housing. So is it there or is it less or more? I didn't hear the percentage number that you indicated. You just don't have a number. I didn't hear the number you said, but I would estimate that our number is probably about 8%. 8%. Thank you so much, Chantel. Oh, no problem. Okay. Chantel and Jennifer, thank you very much for your time. We appreciate it. Great information will be very useful for us. Thank you. Okay, I think we are ready for the third presentation and let's start for Mr. Duda. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah, 180%. He did not get here. Okay, it's pretty hot. So, if anyone want to spread, you want to get water. Excuse me, I'm trying to get some speakers there. If you want to get a water one, two, so. Do I need this? Can you hear me without it? They will be able to Oh, crap. Right so, does anyone want to like take two minutes to get yourself water on the street or trash or anything like that? Let's make them do that, John. Even though we'll be so crazy, we can have to all this again. See, it doesn't apply here. The cranky that still applies to the chair. I can't crank you too. So without uh, they can't use it just for my Yeah, what do I mean? That's the case. Okay. Sorry, does this mic can, yeah. and this camera can pick you up? Let's do that this one. Let's do that. I'll move this over here so it's going to be facing you. All right, good. Thank you. Uh, yeah, what right. 
All right, so I'm going to get started. Everybody has a couple minutes to cool off and get some more to do to winter. All right, I'm going to start off by introducing myself because I'm fairly new here. I've been here all a few weeks. Um, I'm, I'm a painter, so I hope that doesn't. I'm hot. All right, so my background is I've been doing this work with, I've been working with the homeless since the late 80s. I was working in a community drop in center place called the Bad Community, um, Columbia Community Services, University of Community Services, which is now something else. And I ran a, a drop in center for almost every old person for three. And many years later, here I am. Well, I think one of the great things that's happened since the late 80s when I started getting involved now is that we actually know what to do now. I mean, we have evidence based interventions. That work. Uh, they've been proved again and again. Uh, we we not implement them, and we know the resources that are required. And incredibly, and I say this incredibly because I've been doing this since the late eighties. We actually have the resources to follow. That's something I think we, anyone I see with gray hair uh, will tell you we never expected to have. But it's a moving target. So what always happens is we figured out how to solve homelessness, it's always in the rear view mirror, it's always changing. So the, we always have to change too. So everything I'm telling you today, and a lot of this is not going to be news to anyone here, um, but it, but we have to be always prepared to evolve. And that has to be based on the data we see. And there's two forms of data. I mean, we're all comfortable with seeing the numbers of right? the dashboard, the barrel, the I mean, those, those are nice, nice, nice eye candy, and it helps us create decisions, but we also have to call the providers. That's what we're really warning. They're the first ones who are going to tell us when something's off or something's working. Because by the time we see the data, the months, years after that. So if we want to be responding to things that are happening in real time, we need to use qualitative data in addition to quantitative data. So that's some of what I want to talk about today and how we frame our response. So the response isn't just what we learned five years ago. And COVID obviously has changed a whole lot. It's changed the market, it's changed the people we serve, and it's traumatized a lot of people. I would suspect people in this room too, uh, but particularly it's traumatized, and you've heard it, I think, in some of the public comments, from people who all of a sudden couldn't get services because of lockdowns, uh, because of all the changes that happened in society, it's probably tremendous stress. Right? So, just go so, oh, and I introduce folks already. So, that end slide. So, the four themes I want to talk about today um, I've been here all three weeks. I am full disclosure, I am no expert on DLS. I'm just repeating to you some of the things I've heard from staff here, from our technical system folks. And also drawing on some of my own knowledge uh, or you know, knowing what the evidence-based practices are and some of the things that, that have been done in the field that worked. So that's sort of a conglomeration of different things. So there are four things I think we need to do to be successful. First, we have to have a clearly articulated mission and priorities. That sounds simple, right? I guarantee you it's not. And a mission is more than just Branding homeless. It, it is a, an understanding by stakeholders that includes our staff, well, external folks. What does it take for us to get there? What are the components of that mission? And what, what is it going to look like when we get there? So everybody has the same understanding because otherwise, everyone's all, I mean, we have staff who work incredibly hard. And, and one of the things I can't stress enough is how many talented people I've seen here. We're working incredibly hard, uh, but but it's like you know the durable we hate and how do we make progress? And then everything has to be in line for it to work. So a big part of that is communication. So we need to be transparent. Everybody has to understand what the mission is, or we are not going to achieve the mission. Um, and and that requires communication, external stakeholders. So we have PHAs, lots of we have our all our funded grantees, everyone understands what we're trying to do because they can't help us if they don't understand what we're trying to do. And our staff can't be successful if they're empowered 
to pursue things that advance the mission. And they only can advance the mission if they have the mission. We need improved capacity. And I, I think sometimes we get hung up. I don't know, I think it's not important. It is important. We get hung up on how many staff actually so from 75% FTU. It's terrible. It's not good. The reality is, though, LA can still be expected to have what we do. We just got offered a uh, uh, homeless program in you know, uh, 10% bond plus salaries last year. They're going to do it again. That's great. That helps. But it's not just staff. Capacity talks about how we integrate services, how we make them more efficient, how we use all our partners, all the folks who run them. Uh, that capacity. It's not simple 75%. Here's the bar chart. And finally, fourth team, I want to talk about staff support. And we can't have them all as staff because they feel like no matter what they do, the children is failed. No matter what they do, can be in mission. We're not making the goal. And they just feel like every day is another crisis. Every day is another, we've got to respond so and so, why we didn't do this and that. And these people are working very hard, 90% of them. And we want to support them. We want them to feel valued. And there are a number of steps we can do to do that. I mean, the same thing is hard, but that's only a small part. Thanks, Okay. Our clearly articulated mission, the very first thing we must do, it's just like coming into an ER. The medical center, when someone comes into the ER, isn't worried necessarily about, you know, some secondary chronic health problem that yes, I contribute. But they're worried about saving your life. You're in the ER, you're having a heart attack. That is the focus. After they work on your heart attack, you know, then maybe you can talk about your bad back. So when we have veterans coming to us, unsheltered veterans, veterans in the street, they're being traumatized every day. Every day we leave them out there with the chance that they will have a serious um, result. You know, comorbid, uh, some morbid results, some uh, potentially they can die. Uh, certainly not good for health, physical or mental. We've got to get people off the street. That's the first priority. So one of the things we've made a commitment on over the past, uh, we've been, of course, seek our, a great example about it. We are working now on something where we can have an on-demand system for every day. So we can pick up the phone, and it's not just known to handle Outreach workers. We phone throughout the community. The phone number is blazing on our website where you can call because you know all the veterans who need help and we can get them access same day shelters. Doesn't mean same day CTRS. I think people get confused sometimes that your CTRS, that's our emergency health program. If they can call me, we can't get hung up on programs. We have to think about service. Program is just a component. What we need to see her as a component of our emergency housing. We have a much bigger emergency housing. We have multiple empty, uh, half built, uh, Korean programs, half built other shelters, and we have community resources. And then when we have to, we can use those housing outcomes. So we, as a CS, this is the place of money for the last 10 years before I got here, we put 40,000 people in hotels and motels, and I guarantee you. Almost none of the SFDF providers before we started doing it had any relationship with those houses right now. They figured it out. We didn't figure it out. Washington, they figured it out. So we have to empower people to do the right thing, give them the resources, let them know what they can do, and let them off and run. So we're going to get this done. I hope uh, for the promise. But I don't know how busy it takes. Next slide. So, you get that first step down. And, it, and this is all concurrent. This is, I'm giving you sequentially, like this is, this is all concurrent, and I'm getting get to more confident. The second thing is we have to remember, of course, urban housing is a goal. Now, sometimes I think we get hung up on services, and I'm not about finding service, services, we got to have services. But I'm not on the guy. Maybe not full. I guess it depends on the perspective. I'm saying, I can tell you when before 1980, the only like, people lying down the street, yeah, you thought one people like fall down in the street and sleep at all. But there were no homeless. Because he said, right? But 
people want to go home with us before they were leaving. We're old enough to remember it. Two, three years ago. No, it didn't exist. Do we get rights to them before the 1980s? Did that little bit exist? People say, well, of course. Of course, all those things exist. But to say now that's the cause of homelessness, it, it lies in big reality. So we have to look at the evidence. The evidence is homelessness is a housing crisis. It's a affordable housing crisis. It's not a crisis of mental illness, substance abuse, and racism. All those things contribute. All those things create vulnerability that we have to address. But that is not what caused homelessness. So knowing that, what's the root cause? What do we need to focus on in our mission? Continue with that. John Stafford, or um, to continue with the theme, you can't have emergency rooms full of people forever. So that's why you get some permanent support out of it. Why? I think Ryan answered this question, just a question that was put out there. You can have people in the CRS program now for whatever, a year, in some tiny houses. Why haven't all of those people been housed by now? It's, I just, it continues to blow my mind. We know who they are, you know where they're sleeping, so where they want to live, they want to get out of those tiny boxes. Why haven't they? And I know you only have three weeks. Just a rhetorical question. It, it, it's a conundrum, and it's a conundrum for a couple of reasons. First, uh, a lot of those folks are holding out for the U.S. The ones that can't, they do not, a lot of them do not want to move. They've been offered that. So they that not been on that, you know, that. They don't want to go to some of these other programs knowing they have what they perceive as their preferred. Like, I'm offering you a place in Malibu on the beach. If you wait three months, you can live in a beach house in Malibu, and I will wait. With pool, five bedrooms, or you can go right now. I have a studio in Western. What are you going to do? That's what it is. All right. So, that part is that compressed. Now, I will be talking about that in a minute, and we have to, we're going to have to challenge them. It's not going to be easy. So, housing first. What's housing first? Housing first is Abraham Madison. It talks about we can't. So, I'm after just telling you that all those other mental health and other things don't cause homelessness, they sure are important. They keep people homeless. But we can only start addressing them, and if all of you know your math flow, when you start addressing the basic needs first, right? It's to the folks who didn't have. Opportunity to sleep last night, or you hadn't had coffee, or four years ago, you start rattling on. Yeah, they can't do this. Well, work, your brain won't let you. Your brain physically will not let you do any of those higher order things. The way our brains work, right? It's got the cerebral more specifically than the cerebellum, animal brain, right? Our old lizard brain wants to be sure we're fit. Our old lizard brain wants to be sure we sleep. So all those things require people in housing. And then we can start thinking about all the other stuff. Substance use disorder, the mental health issues. We're much more effective at, at addressing when those lower order needs are first met. Because that's exactly the way we're built. Thanks a lot. All right. Well, Maggie will be talking a lot about this. And we Heard about it earlier today. Buy name list. Buy name list. This is tough. Oh my goodness. It's tough in LA. It's tough in LA because LA is not really like one city. It's like ten. Right. I'm thinking of a ten spot, but it's a massive piece of territory. You have terrible public transit, and it's incredibly expensive. You know, I, I can't think of a a, a better synergy of uh, elements to make this crisis worse. Maybe better synergy, not the, the right term. Right. Yeah, for no. So we have this really complex system. So we have to break it down. We can't think of LA one city. We have to think of it from, and then have the bottom and in terms of the spot, but it still has to be unified. It has to be a unified plan with enough local variability. That each spot can do what's appropriate for that local area to tie together to a bigger plan. Again, Maggie, we talked about before, but the BNL will be, and we're talking about this now, it's not just accumulating the number of veterans uh, and figuring out who's getting assigned services and who isn't. 
but we need to use a help help framework to be confident. Um, one of the speakers, I, I don't remember which one we heard on the audio, was talking about aggressive engagement. So there are a lot of things we don't know when we initially find someone to online, right? It's just usually just simple screening. Someone gets assigned. Guess what? A month later, you find out a whole lot more. The person is in better shape, worse shape, who knows? But you find out a lot more over time. And that evaluation that needs to evolve, the assessment evolves. And at that point, you may use that writing list to change the way your case conference and serve that better. Uh, and then we have a responsibility to make sure we're regularly reviewing these findings. But it can't just be two people in a room. And I know Maggie just works her heart out on this, along with Wasa. You know, it's two people in a room filling out lists and lists and sticking them on. I don't know, what's up on Excel? I don't even know. But filling out lists of lots of things. This needs to be a gigantic process. We need to have lots of eyes on it. That way, when you can't conference it, you have a number of people who know the people on this by name list and can manage it and make it just a dynamic process. Next one. So first, I have to tip my head, Pat T, who was set up the visual dance segment with his genius um, and provided a real list at a critical time for GLA. So Dems was a, a huge boost, but it, it's a short term. It's like an emergency, and that, that's exactly what that says. Of course, for emergency, we need something that's sustainable. So what's sustainable? Uh, yeah, I find Dems. Oh, yeah, I find Dems is important. We'll let Keith talk about that. Yeah. Is there an emergency management personnel system that I get right? Medical personnel system. <laughs> I don't, um, I think I talked a little about it at the very beginning. Clinicians are all around the country are, are on a list that they will be deployed as typically done in this response to hurricanes, other kinds of natural disasters. In this case, use the emergency, homeless emergency in the state of California uh, to do this. And I think you're, you're making the point, but importantly, in that office, the one thing it's not supposed to do is be a pure fill in for vacant staff. It's not supposed to be that it's really, it's really meant to respond to the emergency, which is how it was framed here. And the local staff deserve all the credit for how that's actually played out and worked. So, we have to build capacity. I talked about that a little bit. Uh, you know, we're getting more money to make Seattle. There's a salary survey going on right now, trying to make salaries more competitive. But the, the resources are not infinite. I mean, we can do some things to try to. Our team staff, I think there's also a more aggressive use of trying to be here. Uh, we know veterans, how they run with lived experience to connect with other veterans. Have success sometimes where we for caring for veterans can't. So using a real mix of staff, we think creatively have to increase capacity. Uh, a staffing is all important. Um, and also now, I think more of, and again, you heard one speaker talk about it. Thinking of SSDF and us back as a single service. So traditionally, we've had these two sort of stove type programs um, that honestly, when we had SSDF, I can tell you, we didn't, you know, there, there was not a great uh, brotherhood between SSDF and that. I frequently heard us uh, back disparage SSDF. I frequently heard SSDF arrive and disparage us back. But that can't happen. It doesn't work. Um, to, to have these kinds of artificial barriers. And we need these services to collaborate, part because their, their resources are so complementary. Right now, SSDF has strength in housing out data. We have all sorts of incentives and also landlords and consumers. And those consumer incentives, I think, are well, probably the least understood part of what SSDF can now offer and maybe one of the most important things you can do. Because if you're a vet, and you at least have a community if you're a parent, the community and have maybe something to do. What if I offer you an apartment, which you can say is great, but you're moving into an apartment that's a bed, a kitchen utensil, and that's it. I don't know. When I come home at night, I like to plug TV. Um, or uh, maybe you turn on the stereo, right? And that's part of what coming home means. 
So a consumer incentive allows all veterans who are moving into the housing to be able to put on a TV because we're going to buy a class screen TV for the great people. Or they can buy a stereo because the grantee will make sure that, and it's not what the grantee decides, the tenant says, this is what I want that's going to make my house more home. I'll give you a little no part, but you know, beyond the law the restrictions, um, we want to create a, a better living experience for our tenants. So that's an important question. What SSBS is not good at, or not as good at, is that, that HUD-Vanish is better at. It's hud is a lot of trained clinical social workers, it's nurses, and also SSBS cannot, by statute, provide direct clinical services. There's some case management kind of blurred boundary, but that's why that partnership is so valuable. So more and more, we are working and co-rolling people here at DLA, developing a plan so that way there's that when we talk about case conferencing, it's not just the eight foot we're talking about, it's not just SSBS people, it's together. Uh, and, and also understanding that not all home effects need intensive services. We focus a lot on like the US, where people are probably going to get the most intensive services. We're talking about how to expand the my eligibility. So people with the highest needs are in the medical system. But most homeless veterans don't need it. Most homeless veterans are frankly just poor. Remember 1980? There were no less, there's no less bed loneliness, there's no less racism, there was no less uh, substance use disorder, but people paid the rent. So that's why we have to stay focused on it, helping them to pay the rent. And that also means inflow. Because we worked so hard with place and place and place and place, and we never gained any ground. You know, it was a gerbil on the wheel, because very form of place is another one entering the system. So we have to have new strategies that close the affordability gap to child subsidies, one of them. So if we have someone at the imminent risk, let's not let them, let them get homeless. Let's make sure that they have that rental subsidy they need to stay at. We can pay half the rent. We do it for two years, and they need another two years to do it another. Four of them, so. Next one. I talked about this. Next slide. These are just, I'm not going to read these numbers. It just shows you the impact of stamps. Um, you know, this piece, it has a meaningful impact. It allows us to do a bunch of things uh, that are really time consuming that take clinical staff offline. So brings them back online and allows them to be more focused in their work. And frankly, providing direct support to people who are trying to have. So, all right, so how do we build capacity? So we talk a lot about these the U.S. These buildings are going to be great, but how, how many units is it? 170 close in January. 170 items. Or the pit count in Los Angeles BOT. Was it 170 something? A little more? Yeah, so that's 35. So this is a teeny part of the solution. Even once all 1,200 units are built, that 3,500 is a snapshot. And that's just the LA BOT. And that's in one day. Typically, we know that a pit count, you can triple it to get a real sense of homelessness in this particular area. So, well, thank you, homelessness veterans last year was probably closer to 10,000. We're talking about, and that's one year, that's not within close in subsequent years, but we're talking about over a year developing 1,200. We have to be honest here in that this is not going to solve the problem. People will contribute, it'll be a big help. But we have to think more expansively when we think about capacity. Capacity is PPDs, sure, and it's the recruiting the private landlords. Ultimately, that's how we call it. We have to get private landlords. We need to do incentives. We need to think about how we reassure them, them as customers. We're not going to build our way out of this only by what we do on this campus. And then we have to have the hard conversations. And, and this is where it, it's tougher. We have to see like bad documents. Yeah, we would love to give you that apartment in the US. We would love to. But there's only 170 apartments, and you're, you don't, 
You don't fit the criteria. Whatever reason, we have to come up with the criteria. Full disclosure, it's not settled yet. And part of it's not settled because we're trying to work out some AMI issues. Uh, as if he's eligible to be on people with a high key to have that eligibility. But for others, and that's the most of them, the hard conversation is we have housing groups. That's great news. It may not be your first choice, but this is what we have. And that's the offer. Um, if we offer more than one thing, terrific. But we have to be honest. Your ability to live in an apartment that we can offer you, that is great. It needs to have a lot of CPRS. CPRS, you're living in a shed. That is not a place people should stay. It is better than a tent. It is better than a street, for sure. But we need to be able to have a hard conversation and say, we don't want you to stay in a shed or a tent. We want you to be in an apartment. Here's what we can offer. We can make that apartment nice. And maybe it's not your forever. Well, we can do that. But we have to have a hard conversation. And we have to be honest with stakeholders. Because the EUL is not the answer. There are other options we're going to be looking and I talk about some of these steps. Next slide, please. We have to build staff support, and I talk my first slide about morale. How do we do that? Money, yeah. Training. What can we do to help train? Can we send staff? If you know, we purchase a couple of programs today, but maybe we identify some terrific programs and we pay to send staff out there for a week and see what those terrific programs are doing. And bring that in, bring that service back. Maybe there are other things we can do to, to help. We're doing now work groups that you'll talk about one of the work groups. We have a emergency housing work group, but empower staff. They have great knowledge, great expertise. Empower them to set up some kind of drive a discussion about how we can improve services. I do not have all the answers. Guarantee you, not even close. Have some general ideas. Have you know your general ideas? I'm going to have some general ideas. And all of us have things we can trip. But it's like this. It's just so much. And then, of course, celebrate success. I would love this group. Dr. Raymond just had a little bit of a great summary in the new thing. We had all these supervisors being about what staff did. And you would see how much that worked, how powerful that was, that you recognize. We need to do that too. I would love this group to do that. His staff, and you heard about it, and you think, how? And then the rest, you know, if never happened, I think that's important. You know, and if, if I could kill Dr. Braverman's novel, like that would be a way to do it through virtual. And, and that would work so well. Uh, these are a few of the work groups that we've been forming. So I mentioned this one. This is um, the emerging housing group that we commenced. I hope by Thanksgiving we'll have some results. Again, not just the CTRS thing. Uh, you know, really think about systemic barriers to permanent housing. Talk about the BNL. The outreach piece. At, uh, can I put just a spot right now? Ask me to talk about the access point thing a little bit and, and, and so we're playing around that. Sure. So, you know, I was concerned, strongly concerned about our hearing, sorry, hearing, sorry, about our access point throughout the area. Yeah, very kind of yourself. Every part of it. We have long standing concerns about our access points throughout our Kansas area. It is very difficult. It is the only time that our CRRC, the Self Reference Parole Center here, see veterans traveling to us from as far away as even Bakersfield. We need to set up areas where veterans can come into their own neighborhood and get access to all of our homeless service services. Um, and so, with this work group, we're finally at a place where we're identifying, literally identifying locations. We have community partners who are going to be working with us. Our MSC as rentees, um, uh, even offered space to us, will be utilizing those locations so that veterans walk in and get access to our coordinated entry system. And you'll hear more of that with Maggie. Um, and also having an HVAC provider there on site, some of the critical assessment to make sure that our veterans have access to same things or the independent housing and also our adapt resources. Uh, 
And then the, a third, or there's actually two others, Maggie, we talked about the, the other four, um, is HUD match coordination. I've talked about that some already, but we we started them out a few weeks ago. Um, that was actually one of the first pieces I, I stepped in on. Our TA folks have been working on that um, even before I got here. With that, but yes, we had wanted to expand how we navigated the HUD match team. And the reason why was that SSPF was good at this stuff. And we were, SSPF is really a part of the community in a way that, that HUD back is more part of them. And so it made sense to have that partnership. And that's the bill that we see. But, but you can hear it, you can hear it from other speakers as well. SSPF and HUD back are working to relate to it, a way that has not happened in the past. Um, and it probably began with COVID when all of a sudden, we start seeing people come in to SSPS with much higher needs, and I'll talk about that in the next slide. Yes. John Bamberger for the record. So, um, first of all, I think we can all on the board say, wow, has this been a huge shift in the sort of attitude, can do desire, bringing best practices. John, thank you so much. Very gratifying. You've been doing it for two years now. So, but the durable one do. Thank you. The one thing I would add, if you don't have in your model, is that different veterans need different services. And what we found in San Francisco, oh, I'm, I'm going to get there. I'll catch the magnet. What we found in San Francisco is about 9% of the people across the entire population need to have integrated nursing services to be able to maintain their housing expenses. Being on this campus, a great opportunity to have medical services integrated into housing. So far, we haven't seen any plans that have talked about integrating medical services into the housing, giving people medication at the bedside. So that's for people who have chronic medical problems, you know, heart failure. Yeah, it's something that well, it's a great idea. So, you know, people who don't take their medication at the heart failure will end up coming across the campus into the hospital unnecessarily them out of the hospital if there's nurses or um, that school don't send with their medication. And then the other part of the medical problem is the psychiatric condition we heard from DC is having at level service available to people on campus where you can have those 15 patients and people veterans to one full time staff person at the right ratio within a team of a psychiatrist, a social worker. Psychiatric nurse practitioner, all working on a team, each caring for 15 person mode, like that's been done all over. They borrow you, one of our workers. Yeah. What's that? I mean, and, those, and those are the models around intensity of services that we added to the what you're talking about. It's really going to just why this campus is an opportunity to do that kind of thing in the crucible of innovation. You've all heard about the housing sort of units, not diversity of services, so that all the needs across the First population of veterans in their homes where they can be in their daily time. And that's what I've always heard from hearing using this incredible understanding space as an opportunity for diversity of services so that we can provide the right treatment for the people. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Maggie Lowe, and I'm a coordinator entry specialist here with GLA. And I'm going to give you guys a background of what CES looks like here in LA County and an overview of sort of the CES design work that we're working on. So um, in 2013, the Housing and Urban Development, HUD, required that all communities develop a living system, uh, which would include all homeless individuals, including our veterans. And, um, which the CS system will allow us to prioritize the most vulnerable individuals with the limited resources we have in our community. So prior to the creation of the supporting entry system, individuals who have the best case managers, the best advocates, those are the ones that got things to housing resources most uh, quickly and most efficiently. And so with the supporting entry system, the idea was that we would effectively meet all the needs of our vulnerable uh, homeless uh, individuals in our community uh, while uh, as quickly as possible with the resources that best match um, what they're uh, So, our permanent entry system uses HMIS, the Homeless Management Information System. And so, all homeless service providers use HMIS 
uh, they, uh, and so all of the uh, information in the reporting and entry system utilizes the HMIS as a database of all of our information for our participants. And that's going to be important uh, because they're about being able to derive from HMIS data. Next slide, please. So, OSTA is our continual care. Uh, we eat here in Los Angeles County, and so they also lead and manage the reporting and entry system for Los Angeles County. And where GLADA participates in is by uh, participating in our case conference meetings, uh, helping with uh, my meaningless updates, as well as data sharing between uh, VA data and HMIS. And so LASA develops and manages the binding list. The binding list comes from HMIS. And so our part here at VA we support the binding list with updates on our veterans. And so we go into our binding list in conference meeting, we're providing those status updates where our veterans are with the housing company. Uh, so for the veterans in Los Angeles County, we have eight service planning areas, uh, what we call fall. So every single fall meets twice a month. So there's 16 total uh, in conference meetings for um, LACDS. And then our uh, Los Angeles CES is divided into three systems, adult, family, and transitional age youth. So what you can really think of is a veteran population and a special population that falls within our adult CES system. We do have some families that act as uh, family CES, but the majority of our veterans here in LA are in our adult system. Next slide, please. So our greater Los Angeles catchment area is not just LA, as we know, and we stretch all the way out to these other uh, counties here. And so we actually have uh, my colleague Ray, who's uh, not here today, but he manages all of our outlying uh, area uh, CES system. So we have Kern County here, San Luis Obispo, Santa Barbara County, and Ventura County. Uh, and really, the main takeaway I think for all of our outlying areas is very similarly to all of your local zero communities, they're the ones who develop and manage their values. So currently, this is how we are able to connect veterans to resources in LA County. Uh, veteran service providers who have HMIS access are all invited to join our My Name List meeting. So we're talking about the standards. We're really working with the veterans at the shelter, uh, our own transitional housing site, or even our case management programs. They're all invited to attend. Uh, and then we also share out our uh, project based bash vacancies weekly with our community partners, with, as well as any information we have weeks of events or um, buildings. Uh, we also receive our high bash bed based referrals, uh, yeah, which can be done by our VA staff at this point. All of our transitional housing programs receive our referrals, and we also have lots of services available at the local center here on campus, also known as CRRC, as well as any of our eight houses. We also developed a uh, VA homeless outreach email that anyone will be able to email us and let us know if there's anyone needing uh, street outreach from our outreach team. Next slide, please. So here we're going to really take a look at our guiding principles for our new CES design. We're really trying to refine our current CES system. So what we hope for for our new CES is a high-functioning veteran homeless response system uh, where we consider racial equity in all the aspects of design and implementation. We want to increase the utilization of the pet trash, maximize all of our veteran housing resources, and of course we also want to make sure that we're adapting to and our future goals for our veteran coordinated entry system is to build a network of access points through all of our partners, which I mentioned already, like our VTAN partners or SSTN grantee partners. And the hope is that uh, where we can and where there are things available, we co locate with some of our own VA outreach staff. So that anyone, anywhere, can any of us log, could log in and receive service. Um, we're also increasing our capacity for HMIS, and we're looking into having more VA staff trained in uh, HMIS so that they can access that database that our current uh, CES system needs. We're also going to have our five aimless 
as a centralized tool for outreaching and accessing our veteran housing resources. Right now, our bilingualism is sort of existing in parallel to our current system, but in the future, we really want to see front and center of our uh, new foreign entry. So this would mean uh, part of that plan too, of making the bilingual centralized tool, uh, we also want to hire leading matchers who be dedicated to matching veterans to appropriate housing resources, like our project-based building, or maybe in the future, our conditional housing center. Uh, we've also decided as a collective group for this new CDS design that we want to prioritize veterans who are 55 and older, households with minor children, uh, anyone experiencing domestic violence, and then also case transfers from SSCS. So those case transfers from SSCS are veterans who might already be enrolled in the SSCS services, and now we're finding out that they might be uh, more critical case management that SSCS provides. So we want to ensure that we uh, take those transfers from our SSDS partners in a timely fashion and be able to provide those support. We are also uh, in the process with the CD support of creating a simplified benefit tool for referrals. So you may have heard from our Detroit CDS that they were mentioning that they were using the FBI for that tool, and some of our other communities are sort of uh, exploring under our work with the tool. So that's where we are at here in LA. We uh, are not using the VI for that anymore for a lot of reasons that I won't go into right now. We want to look at a better uh, session tool for our veterans and that's getting to Bala uh, with support, with uh, TAs, as well as looking at all that. So yeah, so we're moving away from the VI for that here for our uh, LA. Thank you so much. I had a question. Is there any part of your goal to remove UCLA or Brentwood school off the VA? And is there also any part of the goal to stop charging uh, homeless and disabled veterans market value rent to live in one bedroom, what I would call a slum and the private developers or step up on second pays the same to rent the whole building as their landlord? Is there any goal to get off any private interest off the VA and to stop charging homeless and disabled veterans rent on the 900 plus acres that was deeded to them to be their home in 1888? Is that part of your goal by chance? Hi, is that part of your goal by chance? Hello, is that part of your goal by chance? Okay. If anyone could acknowledge, could anyone hear what I just said? I'm, I just, I'm wondering if there's a goal to stop charging veterans rent on land deeded to be land deeded to be, shouldn't have rent. I'm wondering if that's part of your to stop charging rent on land donated to be their home. I've never heard of someone charging rent. The land was donated because of their service they sacrificed. It's not even supposed to be a handout. It's supposed to be already given to them for the service they've made for the, the signature and the, the that they made to this country. The, the Thank you. 
the rates are just not as competitive as the private market. I think we all have come to realize that. And I think that you VA should think about you know how it can be used um, how it it's leverage people's patriotism to participate in the program in in a way that is you know more than just funding. You know, and, and what I think about is for example the DOD CSGR program where they physically award a company for being a great employer to a guard or reserve um, guard and reservists each year like the they, they, they get an award the eagle is like literally this big and the ceo can go put it on his i love me wall think yeah. i'm such a great american right and, and i think i think va needs to adopt that model to recruit landlords and and because money is just not enough even if we are successful in increasing the SMR, it's still not enough in LA. And so we need to, to use another tactic. Um, ESGR, every year they have an award ceremony and they award small businesses, they award large corporations. Um, there's a website for it, DOD has a website for it. And, and you know, ultimately, what 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 does that look like? For example, the president has a State of the Union speech, and you know, every he goes to everyone and says, "Hey, look at this person; they're so great." And then he says, "You know, hey, this landlord has helped house seven veterans in Los Angeles. What a great American! All you landlords out there, go to va.gov backslash landlord." And, and I mean. So I just wanted to throw it out there because we were talking about recognition. Um, it doesn't cost anything. I mean, a piece of metal maybe costs, you know, fifty dollars, but the, the value is great. And then, and what's the end goal? He tells, or she, for that matter, tells their landlord buddies, uh, "Look how great I am, because I help better." And that'll get around. I, I, I think. I don't know. You know, Jim. I, I would. Maybe. Maybe your I love me wall is too full. Well, I've got about. Can you hear me? Yes, I do. I've got about four or five awards, but it doesn't help if if um, veterans are acting up and they're um, putting. Obviously, we also have a responsibility to every resident, and if the the veterans are screwing it up for everybody else. So yeah, I I I don't I, you know a, a frustration I had last week that may be unfair, but a friend of mine who's in the business said, "Hey, how can I want to do some dash? Uh, maybe want to do some dash in LA." So I went to the VA website, looked up L LA like, all the phone number. On the BA website, and it was somebody from Walmart trying to sell me a gift certificate. And so then I went to the hack the website, and I looked for half an hour to try to find any landlord information on how a landlord could sign up, and there was nothing I could find. So I I emailed, and I heard ten days later. So if we want to sell. We want to engage landlords, we should make it easy for them to. Yeah, and, and, and um, um, this, um, never mind, I lost, I lost my train of thought, but, but um, the other thing I, I would say is there's a lack of trust in government within LA because of how Los Angeles Housing Department has treated owners. It's getting better. But I'd like you guys to guess if you miss a, a payment, the city of Los Angeles, if you pay late, how much they guess what the penalty is? What percentage is? Okay. Anybody want to guess? 200 percent. Even if they lose the mail. And if you want something else from the city, like to raise an ass and pay them down, they, we had them come back for a 20 year old invoice. They said we owed, and we never had. Um, any notification of it, and that was about 500% penalty. So, you know, you just, it wears you down. 
So one of the things I noticed in the Detroit and uh, DC presentations, I saw a lot of cooperation between owners, DA, the city. We don't have that here. Um, and and how, how do you do better? And but I ran into something with HUD six months ago that cost us a whole bunch of money because they sat on my application while the interface went out and they wouldn't tell us what they needed. And, and so we don't have the here, we don't have the sort of cooperation, the teamwork, you know, with government. Yeah, we can build it with DA. And and HUD hasn't always been like this. And this is not, if we never would have gotten this, I didn't have a contact under Pine Science office, and we'd have been dead in the water. So that, that, that gets tiring when you're, it's hard enough to do the stuff uh, if you're fighting everybody. So, um, and we're going to run into that here. You're going to run into owners who are sick of working with the city. And so, uh, and that's probably one of the problems. And there is a prevailing, at, at LA, at the LA Housing Department, they used to, to look at the collection agency. Let's, and they would laugh. I thought, hey, okay, this nonprofit owns this 10,000, and we've got 350,000 of them. I thought it was a big joke. And what they're doing is they're taking money out of the system, they're taking hope. Away from the nonprofits and trying to make a difference, and they just, after a while, they just think, yeah, it, the, the joke around here is friends don't let friends do affordable housing in Los Angeles. So um, it's, it's real. Is it solvable? Yeah, but you're going to have some resistance. And, and, uh, uh, and what I see in Detroit and in, in DC. A lot of cooperation. There's a respect for owner, and uh, you know, it's not it's not here. Well, I, I mention that because you know when was the last time you went to a landlord fair? There, are, I, um, I mean, we did them five or six years ago. I went to one that was on the beach. Yeah, the one I did. Yes, <laughs> right. Been up there. Yeah, yeah. Everybody shows up, and, and then we called with Section Eight, uh, for example. Um, you know, Hackle and Mokola, they have a published list of landlords that participate in Section 8. I call them. And I haven't had a unit in seven years. Who are you? Right? I mean, the, these mechanisms that we're using to attract landlords are not working. And I just I want to put it out there that I think we need to recognize landlords more as a way to bring in new landlords. Because to John's point, the project based Vectors alone isn't going to solve the entire problem. Well, yeah, I mean, and 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 you know, we we've got to do better. But if you go on the website, you can't figure out how to get a hold of them. That's not a good start. Um, so that uh, backslash landmark. That's a landmark. It doesn't exist. I'm just throwing it out there. Okay, but again, the phone number was Walmart. So. You know, it's like after a while, you just give up and the hell with it. You know, they're not going to make it easy for why should I bother? I think it's an issue. Philip Mangano, just to the point that are being made, uh, you don't have to go to the county to east of here, San Bernardino County, to see an effective strategy in terms of housing homeless veterans. We started out with the same number in that first presentation from Let's see. Oh, uh, BC, yeah, BC. Uh, started up at 441. It had the entire community together, led by the CEO of the county, with all the county offices in the same room. And those 441 were housed within five months because the whole idea of that effort was what are the impediments to housing homeless veterans? And they knocked out the impediments because all of the resources of the county were there. We engage landlords, and actually, one of the things we did, to your point, Anthony, when Secretary McDonald was then Secretary of VA, we had him come to San Bernardino. We thought that the civic kind of will to house veterans would be enormous. So we had the county folk round up 
so you can manipulate on more time. What they told us was there were about 200,000 units represented in the room among the people who were there. So we thought, oh, if we get 1%, we're going to wipe out veterans homelessness. So everybody, so the presentations were made. Secretary McDonald made a very compelling uh, presentation. The CEO of the county made a compelling. Every single person in that room among the left, they were nodding. They were ready to go. They wanted to do it. The hard reality was, the big landlords, they could say yes, but as soon as the applications went to their normal processes, to the screening, our guys could never get through the screening process. So we got zero units from the big landlords, but we did get a few units from the smaller landlords. Getting a few units from the smaller landlords and housing search and all of the inducements that is not going to scale the units that are necessary to get this job done. It's the scaling of units that will make the difference. And one of the things that you brought up, Andy, about talking about the county, I would say, let's see, where's the greatest action in the country on scaling units? Oh, that would be in California, the state of California, driving a home key initiative, which is eager to partner. There'll be another opportunity to partner with the state of California tomorrow. And I would say, given the modest goal actually that's set here for Los Angeles, that I think the, the opportunity to partner with the state in its home key initiatives going forward, that's the kind of scaling device that we need that will actually get the job done for veterans here. So I would say there's Here's the possibility of the external stakeholder. There's a state that considers itself a stakeholder in that to get that job done. And I just want to ask a quick question. On, you have one of your goals. I know this is an evolving process. This, the whole day has been the context that it's evolved. So you mentioned the goal of increasing the utilization of HUD dash. What is the specific plan to do that? Because that is an, that's something that we've talked to uh, VA about. I think they have a huge impetus to want to do that. Talk to HUD about it. They have a huge impetus to do about it. Talk to community. They want to do that. And yet, what we've heard today, once again, you know, on the order of 2,700 vouchers sit in a draw. So what is the plan? It's one thing to do a laundry list, a laundry wish list. It's another thing to actually have a plan to accomplish that. So it's not fair to ask you, but I'm just saying you, you have to have a plan to get that done. And that that's not simple. People have been wondering about that for a long time. I think there's something like 5,500 HUD vouchers in the state of California. I think over 20,000, 22,000, I think, in the entire country. And people are wondering about that. The state is willing to partner on that eager to partner its home key initiative, creating thousands and thousands, at least tens of thousands of units soon with HUD dash to just give a big push to what the secretary wants to accomplish. So we'll have another opportunity tomorrow and I hope, I really hope that we can do that because it'll make your work a lot easier, John. It will make your work a lot easier, COS. And it'll make the secretary happy. <laughs> We don't want to do that. We actually want to do that. Thank you. Uh, let me just check, Dr. Ben, whether you're okay. Um, Mr. Perver, did you have another comment? I just want, yeah, I wanted to address, Bill, one of the practical problems of um, an owner had when he was having to ask you, you have to have the same uh, standards for um, residents between your veterans and non veterans. And there's a risk of violating fair housing law. You make a uh, choice outside of your normal standards. So that is an issue. I'm going to do that. Well, I, I, I have to say we've worked with a lot of owners. It's the first time I've ever heard that. Well, it's just, it's, I mean, but I mean, there are thousands of veterans who have been out of San Bernardino County, actually. Is that initiative to remedy the 411 
as soon as we had that down, the VA said, oh, there's another list. They brought us a list of 206. We did that within several months, and mm -hmm. guess what? There were more and more. But they have their list down to about 63 now, but it's almost like, it's like welfare. You can never get to zero. Right. But they did get to 63, which was an impressive number. But lots of landlords have responded, usually in a scattering site mode, because we didn't have home heat. But there are some home heat projects we be moving in San Bernardino County, and that will help increase that number. But I'd love to hear more from you, maybe not right yeah, now. Yeah, I'll, 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 yeah. I'll, I'll, it is an issue. Okay, did we throw you off enough? Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> well, okay, great. Uh, thank you all for the feedback and the discussion that we've had. So I just want to touch upon briefly the two workers that John had mentioned earlier. So some of the workers that were developed um, for this new CES design. But one of them is our CES process and procedures design worker that's actually staff with frontline staff. And we're getting feedback from the frontline staff on what we think the new proposed changes would be and um, just getting their feedback. I think it's really important that uh, we are talking to frontline staff. I wanted to highlight that. We are also, actually before we want to see a process and procedure design work group, we drafted a um, veteran CES policy that codifies sort of all the decisions that we've come together as a group and we've made. We will be presenting it to our larger CES of LASA to ensure that uh, they're aware of it and that we're in alignment because it's important and to highlight here that we're not, we don't want to create a separate veteran oriented system from the loss of CES system. We just want to ensure that there's a better response to our veteran population. So there also is a by name list uh, work group to um, improve upon status quality and make sure the case compensating meetings are um, efficient. And so that work group is actually uh, starting in about two weeks. So we're going to start meeting and kick that off. I want to talk about that for our work group. And the next slide, please. Um, just real briefly, I wanted to talk about how we're going to make referrals to the building on campus, 205, 207, and 208. Sorry, can you hear me? Okay. So the building agencies are going to be tracked through what's called a resource management system, RMS. RMS is what our coordinate entry system uses. And all of our current type match project-based buildings are housed within the RMS system now. Hmm. Uh, so all the potential referrals will come from the my name list, and those referrals will then be sent to the um, building on-site case, like on building case manager, uh, which aligns with our new veteran CS design because uh, we're prioritizing essentially using this by name list as a referral source. So that's what we're moving towards in the future, and that's what we want to start doing now with our building on campus. And then uh, afterwards, the building case manager would then work with any of the eligible veterans to submit an application to the property manager. The property manager will review the application and complete the background check. And if the veteran meets the background check, then they would then start working on that uh, application to the housing authority. We also created an email um, for any of the future vacancies. The property managers would be able to submit that email and they'd be able to notify um, the VACS if they're almost going there. Thank you. Next slide, please. Just sort of a flow chart of essentially what I just already described. So as you see here, uh, when you start from the left hand side, little oval there, those are potential referrals. They move over to the case manager, and then the little box after that is veterans who meet the building criteria, and so on and so forth. And so uh, that's just to really kind of simplify an uh, overview of my flow of referrals. Oh, oh, what my question is is uh, are there signs are there signs associated with uh, moving from step to step? Um, there is. We did build that out. I don't have the details in here, but we do have that in our plan. The uh, time frame for getting referrals over to the Office of Case Manager is about three business day turnaround time. Uh, to funnel sort of like go through and filter out by name list for any potential eligible uh, veterans. After the uh, case manager receives the list, I think they have about a week or five days. I'm not entirely sure to review and see who would be eligible moving on. 
Um, afterwards, the property manager reviews the application and really can't, um, I mean, we would like them to review the application as soon as possible, but I believe they do in their contract have up to 120 days to review. 120 days. So if that's true, you must be working on building the list already for buildings, right? That's correct. So has some of this already happened? Are there already veterans who have been cleared and then somehow you're keeping track of those veterans? That are, are they living in a specific place so that they can access the permanent housing? We haven't gotten so far quite yet. Where we're at right now, the buildings have started submitting their um, their units to the RMN system. We know generally what the criteria is for the veterans. We're looking at that. When they're, all the units are actually in our RMN system, then they'll be ready uh, to start receiving referrals. That's when we'll start doing that. Um, actually sending them names, but I believe, and I can't speak for the building, but they also need to have their on-site case manager ready to receive like onboarding, ready to receive yeah. referrals. So if it's a hundred, when are we anticipating these buildings being the end of December? So, uh, so 120 days, that's 30 and 100, that's four months. So we're in October, November, December, January to complete that. So that would be a concern, right? That we won't have sufficient, we know this is coming online, but we won't have sufficient veterans to populate, which you know is already an issue in Los Angeles. The housing authorities complain, they have vacancies, no referral. Providers have units available for veterans, the referrals aren't there. So I think there is a legitimate concern about the process in filling those units and, and, and even potentially alienating others who have been waiting for a referral. Suddenly they'll see those buildings filled and they'll still be the vacant unit losing money in them. So I just think anyone that you could expedite that would be, I think, a very good thing. Dr. Sandler, for the record. Um, Maggie, so I think it's really important that the criteria as to who's getting prioritized, prioritized to housing you know, on the campus be clear and transparent. Um, so you haven't mentioned that yet. You haven't said what the individual characteristics of people who will be selected from the pool of all the people looking to house who are going to be prioritized. I, I realize, I, I assume you haven't said that because you don't have that handed to you yet. Um, and I think that's really important. Uh, that you have that soon and that you make everyone in the community know what that is. So then there isn't the thought that somebody knows somebody is getting a, a big special or a big Secondly, I, I ran a program of 1,500 units and I would be able to select from a group of many people who needed housing who I would put into the Windsor or who I put into the Hamburg or who I put in. I could make that selection without violating fair housing rules. But then the landlord had to take whoever on the agent. So that's where fair housing happens. But the selection as to who gets prioritized in different buildings can be done on the medical side of things. And I think deciding who you think would best benefit the system from living in these new 1200 units or in the first 125 would be really important. Again, making that clear, transparent, and getting community input from that, I think would be a really important part of the process. And I look forward to you tell us, John. Or thank you, you know, we might have that criteria available to us that we can observe it and give you feedback on it. At a certain point, we're going to have to pull the trigger. What we're hoping on, I know Keith has been working on this as well, is that we can get some clarity on the AMI. Right now, there are a group of unspent service kind of veterans who would love to get into that EUL that won't qualify. So we don't want to announce criteria that would exclude them, um, but we might depend on the forces that would, because we can't wait, as Phil pointed out, the clock is ticking. We can't wait much longer. So we're going to give us a little bit more time and see if we can work it out. If not, we're going to have some un unhappy folks, understandably, and justify what we have to do. So I just, um, I, I know this is a tough question for Keith, but a lot of this is predicated on a CPS specifically for veterans, and we heard about that. Is there any sense of a timeline for that being developed? 
right? Uh, he's there tonight. He's actually a good person to ask that. What we know is it won't be developed in time to determine entry into the first three buildings. And that, that isn't going to be made outside of the CES that people said. So more than four months? Yes. But not the month later? No. No, we have to, we have to develop different approaches to populate the first three buildings. But I think this is really a top tier issue, 100% every deal. You know, for the DCOIB, we are uh, a community engagement board. We really need, we are responsible to the community to be able to bring this criteria to the community. That's up. We have to do that. And we can't uh, put, we can't let like, go on the accelerator to you. So it's a little bit of a uh, conversational, but we need to get, we need to get this. Yeah. Uh, John, you make me plan to speak to this, but I will just say there's, there's, Active discussion underway between all the different parties here, the planning office, the operators of all three buildings, OEM and the EUL office, third communication. Everybody is in the midst of this discussion, right? And I also want to first before we move on, I, I, I mean, you get to see what right, a terrible job Maggie's done with them, essentially almost by herself. Uh, one of the things that Evan Hayes is coming and walking the doors. You know, we, we have to support Maggie and support staff. And as wonderful as she is, this should not be a one man show, LA. This is way too complicated. And part of what we're having to look at is restructuring. Uh, Deborah's going to be working on that business. Look at how we have staffed out and assigned staff. Or we think of a chart five great years ago. Might be great five years ago, but is, is it responsive now? When CES was not be much of an idea at all, now it's seven. What we do, the seven what we do, we one person. Out of 450, does that make any sense? No, makes no sense at all. So we have to, we have to get that more. We are so lucky to have that, uh, but we have to get that perfect place. Um, and I also want to address John, John you know, before you've already bothered, is there a consideration given to getting an outside resource to help you do this? I mean, who's out? I mean, we actually contract, and we're actually, um, Alan is helping us with the contract he has to get Maggie initially some additional help. And we have to, we also have to have people have access to the records and then we need the exact thing. So we're going to do a combination. We have to be like contract as far as what we can. And, and we might be able to use some that. Well, um, I know it's like, so we're here right on too. Uh, I have a long time. When, when do you want the. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's, let's move quickly now. Um, I mean, this talks about, you know, well, individual planning, right? So, uh, it's a, you know, we talk about the homeless like it's some work a lot, but of course, it's an individual fact. You always have to keep that in mind. Next slide, please. Talk about it. Next slide. Uh, it takes too long to have people. We know that. Next slide. Talk about it. Next slide. Next slide. See how fast I can go? <laughs> All right. <laughs> so I do want to talk about child subsidies for a sec because this is thing that is, I think, least understood and and not well utilized yet. But it's picking up. We have to stop the influx. I talked about this before. We need to socialize this group to help us that when we have folks who are at risk, it's a great effort screener, evidence based, that's very best shit involved in helping us develop the thing. And, and it helps us fully understand who's not just going to be a victim, very different, but who's at risk of homelessness. And these shell subsidies to keep people in housing. And what we're particularly worried about is as we see the population of that contagion, and we have people who are seniors who are in fixed income, who are maybe just hanging on, they don't need a lot of social services. They need help with the rent. And this population can get huge advantage from something like the child subsidy, which all of a sudden your rent's cut back. And this is not based on the FMR, it's based on your actual rent. So there's no, none of this nonsense worrying about the FMR being high enough. What's your rent? Well, they have. You know, what's this rent reasonable? That's something ridiculous you might have to have, but this is a real resource that we have to raise this point. And also, what SSDS has done is that now we can go up 80% of the area to be So there's no issues about certain tenants being eligible. 80% of the AMI is going to cover. Next slide. 
talked about, someone else talked about this earlier in the veterans. Next slide. John, you have another 40 minutes. So. Oh, well, I thought we were going to push it. So I have to push it through that. So, so those are. Oh, I thought we were going to wrap up quickly. I thought we were going to wrap up quickly. I thought we were going to wrap up quickly. Oh, okay. Sorry. I thought we were going to wrap up quickly. We want to get through quickly. All right. So, well, we're almost at the end now. <laughs> so, one of the things I did want to highlight here is this is what, this is FY19. FY20, pre COVID, COVID. And this is what happened, not just for the death of EF data, but this is a nationwide phenomenon. And what we see is that people coming into services, and I talked about the trauma earlier of COVID, and here it is 50% of the people prior to COVID came into SSBN with cardiovascular disease. A year later, it was 61%. Major depressive disorder was 35. A year later, 56. Substance use disorder, 46. A year later, 59. Shockingly, PTSD didn't change. But it shows you the impact that COVID had. And a couple of reasons. One, the obvious dislocation. But a byproduct of us opening up hotels and motels to veterans was that we had people coming in from encampments. People would never want to serve it because as the border call program, the GBD or HCHB contract with the care is, if you like your privacy, you want to drink, you don't want to go to those programs. I would rather stay in the street and drink, and that's a choice, or my bed and mini, or my car, or whatever. Or I just don't want all those people around me who are going to make drastic comments, or steal from me, or whatever the issues are. So the trauma of taking an abandoned minion or living in your car or on the street is less traumatic and coming to them because one of these programs. But now all of a sudden, we're saying we're going to give you a hotel room in privacy, TV, to lock the door. That sounds pretty good. And we have 40,000 people nationwide coming to these hotels and motels. That just says, yes, I don't even know what the numbers are like in Atlanta, of course. Yes. We need God, other resources of uh, medical centers had to. So that's just part of it. So we've seen that there are people, if we provide the right resource, we can engage. That was the right resource. And that goes back to your question. So why can't we get people in? And this is, I don't have any answer. I'm holding this forward, like, why can't we get people to PVD? So we have, I had a call with uh, a couple of weeks ago. We have a PUD called West. What's oh uh, project based assets? Sorry, the acronym. Um, so project based assets. Uh, the current buildings for veterans. It's like it's six units. Something like that. So it's about sixty units, and we build I think forty after a year. Twenty open units and affordable housing. We can't fill it. Why? Well, each set of comes with referrals. We still can't vote. Why? Our veterans don't want to go. They say it's too much drug use in the community. It's near um, big room. And they don't want to go in. I mean, we'll keep sending them and we'll we'll try to just settle it and say, yes, we recognize this is not your number one choice. And this is a hard message. It's not your number one choice. But it's better to be in the street. It's safe. It's services. But this is a challenge. And we have to, something we really have to work on. Um, and and Deborah's leading it up right now. We want to fill that building because exactly what he says, Phil, is exactly what's happening. So Hacker says, you can't fill this building. Our other financers want to pull out. So we have other PPDs, other project based assets and programs. They're, they're wanting out. They want to be released from their veteran commitment because they can't afford it. They're going to go pro. It's a real, and I don't know what I don't know how things get solved. I'm hoping we're trying to push it, get this thing to build it last year, but there's going to be a domino effect if we don't. Uh, and it comes to build this thing. Congrats, you're good. So I think that going back, and first of all, thank you. 
Uh, I think that's why it's so important to go back to your point what is the criteria. Because if everybody's waiting, ACR is still to be they're not going to. They think some, some will make it. But those that don't, I think having the criteria could potentially help you with those that are in CTRF saying, hey guys, guess what? Dirt, 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 dirt below, whatever the line is. So really, you need to seriously look at the other options because I think everyone is hoping that they're going to be in and that there's that, you know, one for the months that are going to be there. Not necessarily the racking and stacking you can look at them. So I, I think being able to articulate the criteria in some form or fashion if you're ready might actually help break the lockdown that has been created for CRF. Now there are some of the CRF really not who like the lower barrier, they can go do what they want to do outside and have a place to stay when they're back inside. So we, we have that that's gonna be it for you. But I do think for those that are interested in some of the housing that being able to articulate whatever some of it for those. Yeah, that's a terrific point. Great for waiting. So we have to um, our last tip on down that's just about 450 people in the strip shelter, but no doubt supposedly none of them are very successful. And all of them are many of them are not being. So what we have done in strategies across the country is we offer people three different apartment options. And we tell them that they have to choose one of those three. And if they don't, then they go into the bottom of the list and never but if they don't take this now, they're not going to be able to get Some people still won't take it, but they, we, I think it's quite fair to give people the three decent options and know what the consequences of those choices are, and then move along. And, and that's part of what we're going to have to do in the again at this moment. We're going to have to start delivering some unpopular truths, and we're going to get a few of the on the, you know, the open turnout. We are going to get some pushback. We're going to tell people you can't stay in CPRF anymore. This is not permanent housing. This is temporary housing. We want to have a, an idea that this is, excuse me, I would like to think 60 days, maybe more than that if we have that individual language. But should, someone shouldn't be living in a shed for 60 days when we have permanent housing. And if that's their choice, well, then maybe we need to look at another housing option other than a shed that may go into a congregate or another environment um, where we can open up that resource for somebody else. So we have to have a second. And it's as simple as I can make it. Um, otherwise, we're accepting that people can tell us that you're just staying in CCRS and live in a shed for I, I do want to talk to that issue because I think there are some things that I think thinking about. But I did want to tell you, and I think this may be happening, that on your shallow subsidy, there's no one who's the king of shallow subsidy more than the first time it's about many Now I know you've worked with them. There's no thing here in Los Angeles. You should be at the Schwarzenegger Institute um, starting, I think, tomorrow. You'll be here for six or seven weeks. And as you know, he's not only the king of shallow subsidy, but all of this recent work has been on homeless adults in our region, and I know you just alluded to that. So I do think there's some interaction that could happen with Dennis on these issues. He's been thinking about it, but interacting with lots of communities, including Los Angeles. So I think there, you know, the, the troop, maybe a troop has arrived to help you in that regard. Then on the choice issue, What's interesting is we've been incredibly creative on landlords, with landlords, offering them many incentives to take homeless people. So it may be the time to get incredibly creative with homeless people. What would take them going to a unit that maybe the, maybe the package in the unit could be that, or maybe there's something that they could be given to with that. So maybe it's a bigger television, maybe it's some oh, other kind of a future that's more. why we have to remember we recognize you know vendors don't want to go into apartments that's barren 
who would I would want to build a building? So the consumer sense is meant. So that way, if you when you if we're offering a Western, which we recognize is not your first choice now, we appreciate that. But it's going to be better than living in a shed, and we'll make sure you have something like a big screen TV with some cable. So that way you can watch some shows, you get home, you can relax, feel good that <laughs> Is it your first choice? No, but we don't want to be living in a shed. My point is simply, we do a good job in sending the landlord. And we offer them all kinds of things. Triple the, the security deposit, all manner of things. That same creativity, that same entrepreneurial needs to be directed at the customer, the consumer, to get the customer to respond. And we know that by offering and offering and offering and finally coming to a threshold where we make that big enough class of veterans because there are some veterans, a cohort of veterans, were accepting it. So the point is just being, instead of just even what Josh said, you, know, you get three choices. You can choose one of these, or you're at the bottom of the line, as opposed to here are some incentives for you to go. This is what your apartment's going to look like. This is the additional thing that I'll, I'll make clear. We are doing that. FSBS can offer up this for a single individual to $2,800 of goods when you move in. Um, so you can have the box on the essential, but the tenant gets to pick up to $1,000 to whatever they want. It won't just be legal and not a fire um, <laughs> To make that a place of home. Right. And all the more reason to do what you're doing in terms of linking cut down SFDF so that those inform one another and offer veterans a deeper incentive to go in. Landlords are already doing all right. We need to help homeless veterans be incentivized into going into housing. So if we spend a little bit more there, it's, a, it's well worth it. Yeah. I, I think we've done both, but yeah. yeah. And that additional money can go to the paper spilling costs. And for example, if they get that, um, they have better ways to get it. Yeah. Okay. So no, we, 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 you use high speed internet. You want to buy, you want to join the local gym? We'll do that too. Um, there's all sorts of things. Like, yeah, I just, I mean, I think the headline is when the offer is to work with Keith Heron about his fantasy football. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Are all those things currently advertised to Denver? They're advertised. I don't think they're well spoken about, but they're fairly new. So that SSPS Nova came out in June, yeah. and we made the awards I mean, literally like this a couple months ago. Months ago. They, they just came out, and we're rolling out the now national Nova, which should be published hopefully later this month. I just think you, you've got such a great opportunity to experiment on incenting the customer. And I think you should just go for it and see what happens. Oh, which, I mean, that's the yeah. asshole about it. It's one long experiment. <laughs> It's evolving. Yeah. It's evolving. Well, I, I think you're making this clear. This is unique to FSBS funding. It is not something that's sort of across the home permit budget to be done, but that's what's so important about FSBS is the flexibility. Uh, next. Uh, Jeff, 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 Jeff. So, you know, we, we talk about clinical services. Lot, but there's a lot of very concrete things we do, and this is also why it's important that blended service structure with SSPS because SSPS does a lot of these things. Um, HUDAS does too, but certain things, certain programs would be better, and we want to make sure all these things I'm not going to read them out are, are available. One of the neat things too about the UL and why we want higher risk folks to be able to be at the UL is that you would have on site staff, PVDs as well. But the DUL will have staff on site to run groups and the certain kinds of support activities that will be very valuable and easy residents out. And we want that, right? That's the whole goal. We don't want to see people coming back into our program and want to stay with us. And these support services are going to be important that the DUL offer. Thanks, Paul. I think this is my last slide. So I, I talked about. Um, <laughs> I know. It's a long day. It's a long day. <laughs> I love the sound of my own voice. <laughs> um, so we talk about prevention service, and I mentioned that child subsidy support prevention service. There's another thing we want to do. 
we're not ready quite yet for a land use. Frankly, there's so many initiatives going on. Uh, I'm hoping maybe by January we can start rolling this out. But there's also an evidence based practice that was pioneered by um, the Cleveland Mediation Center. And SSPF rolled it out a couple of years ago pre pandemic. We want to make it bigger to the ASAP as well, and other providers. We call it draft resolution. It's a when I tell Congress it's family reunification, that sounds funny, but it's more than that. It's a diversion project so people who are about to enter the homeless system, like literally that day going to be homeless. And it's also rapid exit, so for people who are just in the system. The idea is we have veterans, I mean, they all, everybody comes from somewhere, right? No one is hatched from an egg. They have family, they have friends, they might have burned their bridges, and they might be embarrassed. Right? If you were drugging or you got thrown out of grandma's because of certain behaviors, it's not hard to go back to grandma and say, can I live with you? And the grandma may not want to. But if you have a trained professional reaching out to grandma and working with the veteran to overcome some of that shame, then our veterans are supposed to make that right. right? They, they don't want to say, I did this thing, this thing happened, and I stole from these grandmas. You don't want to admit that. But if we train the vessels, work with the best, help them get to that point, and then promise, you know what? This is about what would you have done if someone, if a friend of yours was desperate and needed help? And I kind of tell them, of course I want to do this. To help them understand this is about, yes, we have all of our history, we all have our shames, but it doesn't mean we can't move forward. And we want to be able to help that veteran reconnect grandma in this scenario. And we can help grandma financially. Because grandma might be poor too. We can provide them with services once the veteran moves in with grandma. Guess what? Grandma's part of the household. So we can help grandma get Medicaid if she needs that. We can help her get SSP if she needs that. So the idea is try to create housing through family members or friends, right? The military partners. And we want to be able to train staff to always think that way first. Not every veteran needs a TBD or a DUL or smaller set of uh, acronyms here. Not every veteran needs to engage the homeless system to get specialized apartment. Most of us, if we ran into trouble, we would go to family. But our veterans the same thing. They just maybe have a little trouble history with them that we need help with. And do that mediation work, maybe provide some financial incentives, but also know there's a whole range of new housing resources that we have been blind to. And the only way we do that is we have trained staff to be sensitized, not to go through checklists. <laughs> we do now. Do you have anywhere else to go? No. Yeah. It can't be a checklist. It has to be part of an engagement. But it works. It works. And even if we only divert 10%, that's a huge impact. You have 10,000 homeless. In Los Angeles, and thousand now go back to family. That would be a huge impact. And that's it. No, it's not a challenge. We have this. Oh, here. right. Forgot about this. Yes, CPRS. So, CPRS, obviously, um, that fire was really scary. Right? Miracle no one got there. Miracle. Um, we're very fortunate. And, and part of it was quick action of some of the residents down there, it wasn't the quick action of some of the residents who would have taken so Thank goodness it all worked out. But we cannot allow the situation there to make things because it's, it puts too many lives at risk. So you can't read this, I apologize. But it's a, it's a memo essentially that was distributed to all. Can we, uh, I'll read something. We have it in our deck. We have, oh, you have the guy, good, because I can't even read it. <laughs> um, so in your slide, that went out to all residents, I think it was like two weeks ago. And on November 1st, um, we're going to have residents, have, they're going to have to throw stuff out. If their personal belongings are going to go into the cold bins, which take a lot. And the excess is going to go in the garbage. That's hard to reduce the clutter. We don't want, not only is it a fire hazard, we don't want to burn in there. Um, we want to keep the place so emergency vehicles can get in. That, Police can respond to the visitors. So that's something that's happening November 1st. I can tell you um, the likelihood is that we're going to have at least 
One is not more we might hope that something happens, but it very well might more of you can apply and we'll say, you know, we want you to stay, we want you to apply, but I think you can't put others' lives in jeopardy, right? We can't create situations where other people put at risk. If you feel like you have to do it this way, we'll we'll try to find another resource for you, another emergency housing resource. But if you can't stay in TCRS, you're going So that's the one. We've already, and I, I thank Alan for his incredibly fast action. Um, we have fencing already for bikes, which bike bikes for the reason we had the fire to begin with. So those are stored now. We're building, and again, Alan, thank you. Um, uh, resources and lock bikes in the charging station so veterans can access the device, charge them, but it's away from the residents. Away from the, so the fire hazard is removed from where people live. So that's all happening right now. When uh, you can see some of those changes, um, I hope we create an environment there that's safe. But ultimately, it has to be safe. We have to have rules there. Uh, we can't have, you know, I've heard veterans complaining about harassment and fear. Well, you know, that's no good. We cannot have residents being harassed by any. Um, by any period, stop. And there are going to be rules that are enforced. And when those rules are enforced, it may mean we have to ask residents to leave. I can't have somebody there who preys on other people. If someone preys on other people, they have to leave. We will offer them other shelter, but we're doing it to protect the community. Just like in your community, you want to feel safe too, right? That's why we have society. So if people can't obey the base rules of CTRS, we are going to have some people who are going to have to ask to leave. And we won't just throw them into the street, although you might hear that. They will be offered alternatives which they may or may not select to take. But there are going to be rules and they're going to be enforced and I'm going to be sure. That starts to talk about that's our number one. We're starting that. So Okay, it looks like we got some questions. And, but before we get to the questions, uh, John, there's one other uh, agenda item that I don't know if you all have sent to cover uh, debriefing and Abbott Associates study. The, the app, the app. Oh, yeah. so the app, so, so the TAC, um, the technical assistance folks, some of the stuff I talked about at the beginning was okay. I brought that in, plus my own analysis. I think it's been incorporated. Yeah. Okay, very good. Uh, so I don't know who was first, but I know who I'm going to the mic to. Can you hear me? Everything is present. Um, I have Secretary McDonough's voice in my head ringing. But before you do this, you have to tell the Hill. You have to tell the media. You need to have a calm rollout on what this is and why you are doing it. Otherwise, you'll be in reaction mode and it's off of social media and it will be, I'll say it's online, it will be a, a blank show. So I do know that we have a complete, so we need to have a complete rollout of what we are doing and why we are doing it. And you know, we have a, a, a very scary, and I completely agree with you. When I heard about the fire, I was just so what, quite frankly, that, and, and thank goodness for the body suffered down there and our and the response of our staff, and no one died. So we got lucky, and we'll kind of be like, there's going to be another thing. So people, I think we'll understand the why, but we cannot just think, well, we did a memo on August, October 5th, and that's it. We do have to communicate, 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 communicate. Right Thank you. This is uh, Sean Gay, I was uh, I go there. One, uh, could you agree more with Brad's comments about the comms rollout? I think there's, I think there's an opportunity also to, to maybe modify it a little bit into what it was like on a ship, right? Or what it was like when we were in the service. You had to get your attention cord checked and there are two outlets in 2022 probably isn't going to be enough. 
what were these folks who may have a laptop and a cell phone and another device? Um, so it may be worthwhile. You know, right. We're also again maybe getting a storage protector in there. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, okay. we, but we have to make sure of it. I'm not the safety crew who I need to take. Yeah. So I think you know that that would be really important. It's communicating it to everybody in the guidance counter before they do it. I mean, we've seen a lot of a lot of avoidable uh, avoidable headaches because of lack of communication. Um, and then the other thing is you, you mentioned that some of the residents help. Were those guys recognized by anything? Did they could be like thank them or give them a certificate of appreciation or some way of of highlighting them? I don't know if it was um, if it actually happened as far as or by and I don't even know the exact residence how I just heard it. They heard it. So yeah, it doesn't wait to do that. It's a great right thank you. So Anthony, are you following up on that issue or just <laughs> Because if you're following up on that issue, I'll defer to you. If you're not, I'll do so with my Please, go ahead. So, and, uh, I was just really interested in the uh, prevention and the rapid resolution and getting the person back with their grandma. Is there a rental subsidy involved in that? And the reason I ask is you may know in Europe and in several cities in the United States, one of the things that's being done is people are being offered $800 and they can take that $800 and it's $800 a month to get housing, which you can't get housing with just the $800. But the theory is, and it's working, is that if you go to a friend who maybe would take you in, but if it's $800 a month, they would take you in. Or you go to grandma, $800 could make that difference. So I know that that's one of the initiatives that's making an impact things like New York and Seattle and then in several places in Europe. So I'm just wondering if that's a part of this. So yes, money can be part of it. Although what Cleveland the agent found actually was that the money was secondary. It was more the engagement comp the agent that made the difference. Um, the, the money would help, particularly if again grandma was poor or if there are issues in the area. So it has to be an assessment job. They certainly have flexibility in the then, then I would say, apart from that, this is an idea for other circumstances. It's an $800 subsidy that you can then take to people who you're related to, friends, family, and get some housing. And it's just working. And again, Dennis would be happy to tell you all about it. If you have the, the article on the site, let's see. Say it again. Do you have like the study or you then to their. Dennis will have all. I had a kind of Philip mentioned it on the fire issue. Oh, um, Anthony Allman for the record. Um, the gentleman Abe Bradshaw and discussed his concerns regarding fire and partnering with LA County Fire. And, um, yeah, I think he had brought this to our attention previous to the CPRS fire. I mean, some an NGLA reach out. And Maybe do a service. Well, we have, a, we're, we have a fire inspection. I know, you know, it just is scheduled again. <laughs> so yeah. we do have a fire inspection uh, plan for the CPRS. It's not going to be, you know, obviously I am not the skilled person sure. to go and do the inspection. So we're going to get expert advice from our fire and safety people. And based on the recommendations, I'm sure there'll be further action. Right. We want to make sure that place is safe. Uh, but, but also, that veterans, if you can do the extension cord for the, uh, the Surge protector, if you do think that they get appropriate place to stand while wow. well, you mentioned you, you said, Well, I'm not the expert, that's what reminded me about uh, Mr. Brad's about the comments. Yeah, so, I'm just fired. Yeah, that was a yeah. that sounds like a great share. Uh, but the, the real the, the reason why I raised my name tag is you know, when you were talking about TDBs and EULs, and there's another acronym that came in my head, and I don't, it has never been discussed before. And in my mind, with respect to VA, but ADUs, accessory dwelling units, granny flats, you know, that's become a more popular thing here in California. Well, where are they? Right. And um, I've got a proposal I made for the same time. Well, uh, yeah, I'm curious because maybe there's an interesting marriage of programs, and this is not a GLA issue. I would, I would, I would have come this to, to the national folks, but um, you know, there's a VA home loan program, which is an amazing program, 
and has a lot of a lot of veterans to pick up phone numbers. And what if there was an incentive to build ABUs? There was an outlier. <laughs> because you can't put them like retail to the point of the ABU is that yeah, yeah. 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 accessory yeah. double. Well, well, that doesn't come down. We can talk that way. There's been something to Yeah. Well, I, I mentioned this because, you know, why not, right? I mean, it, it, has this been explored nationally? I mean, you seem to know I don't think more with the state of California. The state of California has unique tools. Sure. Right. I, I still don't uh, know. So, when you, if you're a homeowner, right. you can build a small unit in your backyard and rent. You can set the gray out and he doesn't have to agree on the zoning number. And if you can incentivize um, uh, owners to do that by assuring them that you're going to have a fine. Okay, great. Well, sir, have to get six states to cover capital costs. We get an SSPF coming in here from the so the, the reason why I mentioned the state of California has been offering a lot of incentives, especially for low-income individuals who build ADUs, so we'll pay thirty, forty thousand dollars, right? But if, if we have a pool of veteran homeowners through the VA home loan program, could they be incentivized to develop an accessory dwelling unit uh, and rent it to a homeowner? That, that so, somehow that doesn't follow to me. They have a low income person, they have acreage under the plot. So they, they, could, they could have inherited the home. You know, they, no, of course. Yeah, so they have a high income home loan. That's really a memory of the size. So I love the way on this AD. I, I think what you're saying is the opportunity of administrative change to allow. Whether a lot of additional homeowners or veterans who are homeowners to develop ADUs to have their brothers to that uh, So, obviously, you would have to deal with localities. Sure. But what, what I would say is that I think the VA could incentivize the veteran homeowner to come through those hoops. Yeah, I mean, or just allow for a second VA, right? Is that what the VA needs? Yeah, I mean, so you have an un sometimes you have an unused benefit, yeah. right? Where you have a VA home loan, but you haven't used your uh, your full entitlement, right? So there's money left over. Or even extending the VA home loan to not just single family homes, but allowing veterans the asset opportunity to become a VA. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's exactly what I'm talking about. So it's not just about Correct. Yeah, I was just referencing a state of California program that I get emails for uh, because I belong to this you know, state of California uh, housing one uh, newsletter. And so I get these emails about, you know, hey, we have incentives for low income homeowners to create these accessory dwelling units. It's all designed to increase the supply. Yeah, I think I think what you're describing in terms of here is a broad vision, right? It's that it's not just uh, it's not just veterans, it's everybody in California is that's a housing emergency and so are other places. And if there's a way to so look at this issue from a broader standpoint, I mean we're in the crisis of all the things that we feel that housing health care, health care, child care and this is the way to help veterans that Florida at this point to help them be a part of the solution, even if they're you know, 80 years old and have been under the for a while and they're well off and they're they're with the credit program being come back. Yes. So didn't we just say earlier today that there's plenty of housing out there? I mean this may be a good idea, but there is not plenty of housing out there. Yeah, there's not enough housing. There's more than a million units that need to be built in California. A million? A million units in LA alone. Like, over that. But Anthony is trying to have California supporting the development of AB units, and it does come down to 
Los Angeles taking their rates around this and other counties doing that. But it's being incentivized and you can get money actually to do that. Um, we want to think about the family caregiver program. Is that another way to get people linked back up to their families? There's a, isn't there a VA program? Family yes, there are. caregiver program? Is that? Yeah, but they're already connected because that's actually, they're taking care of their family. Okay, we're at the point of the agenda, which it says wrap it up for today. Yep. Um, start time tomorrow, uh, eight thirty for the check-in. Nine a.m. we will get started, um, and um, we'll probably pick right up with the. Uh, with Beverly School Language. She was out on the story business to see the grass. So uh, it's been a good day. Uh, we've had some really great presentations. We've had some excellent discussions. Uh, frankly, you can feel uh, the energy uh, that was uh, present. And, uh, I'm sort of filled with optimism that we're on a, on a good track here. And we need to understand that uh, that it's it's going to take a little more time, and that this first tranche of buildings delivered, uh, as the chief said, uh, we need to understand where we'll be when that happens, uh, and, and make sure that we are transparent that everybody knows what's going to happen, why it happened, criteria were, were are, uh, all of those things, and, and again that it's being further refined as as we go along. And, and that won't be an easy task to uh, try to get that done, but it, it absolutely has to be. Uh, and we'll have discussions later uh, this afternoon, and I think we're excellent as well. So, uh, after a good start today, we'll look forward to more of the same tomorrow, uh, with a little more of the emphasis on building and delivery from it. And then we'll welcome the folks uh, from the West LA Collective uh, to do that. So I'll call the mic uh, to the chief to see as she has come to the on Thank you so much, Albert. This has been a really good day. Um, very informative. I am so appreciative of um, the great conversation and to see the the, the progress um, and just the education a lot of was just really super helpful. Um, the math problem that we have before us, I, I, I crystallized today in a way that I was not fully aware. And so, um, you know, I think as we look at not just the master plan, but how we're also going to help all those that are, that are, that we're dealing with, it's just massive. And so I, I'm just really appreciative and even the clarity in the pit count, so we tried the framework as much that I can doing the pick out here in particular. Um, so just thank you. I'm looking forward to tomorrow. I'm looking forward to my number CTRS. And I just appreciate everyone's attention and focus and uh, just solid day. So thank you so much. Um, 
Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, ma'am. I want to echo, but also thank the uh, public comment participants. It's always incredibly uh, important for us to hear the voice of the voice of the veteran and their family. The concerns we hear you. The recommendations we hear you, and the compliments you know on the care that you're receiving here at GLA. We also hear you. So thank you, and we'll look forward to more public comment uh, next quarter in the next quarter. Dr. Harris, Pete Harris, the only thing I'll add is it, it, it's obvious that being in the room, but I'm so pleased with, with John and Stephen, with Deborah, that you're bringing to coordinate the energy. The, the leadership in the energy right now is, is really exciting. It's exactly what we gave you. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. I certainly concur with the Chief and with the General that today's discussions were substantive, but I think really create a trajectory for the work that we have to do. I think there's still more work that we have to do in terms of rooting all of this in the, con the customer and the consumer. But I think we are on our way to that. And certainly the resources that the customer and consumer needs to end their homelessness, uh, that's certainly the center of our attention. And certainly appreciate the energy. We appreciate, first, I think Dr. Braverman creating a very stable environment here at the medical center to allow all of these additional conversations to take place, but thank you. And then John, was so, it's so refreshing um, to have your energy and your knowledge, and uh, we just look forward to working with you in the upcoming days. Okay, thanks very much. And, and I will piggyback on your comments to John Braverman. Uh, I know he didn't have any comments on the record. One error on my part is I didn't mention Alan. And apologize for that. But he has been a heavy lifter in particularly moving this project forward, but also more in the tactical level. Frank Sprouse is able to be here. Thanks to the audio visual folks. Let's see what, what happened today. We had folks that could talk, got back. Uh, other than that, uh, it was pretty it was it was pretty good. But I, I appreciate what you go through trying to make all of these things come together and get you on WebEx. Same time we go live and then bring in different WebEx players and feed each other stuff. So that's not an easy task either. So thanks very much for your for your effort. And uh, we are adjourned. Thank you. Where's the school? Yankees, uh, Yankees Astros, zero to zero. <laughs> We already won this one. I thought you were advocating I think it's a Awesome. Yeah, I mean, well, the acronyms are coming out of Thank you.